Ladies and gentlemen, once again, we ask you to please take your seats. Once again, I remind you to place your cell phones on silent. And we would appreciate it if you remain seated until the arrival of the president of Barbados. Thank you so much for your cooperation.
basically awaiting the arrival of the president so mm -hmm. he, everybody can be seated at this point. So people are standing up. Please be seated. We are awaiting the arrival of the president of Barbados. Thank you very much for your cooperation. Ladies and gentlemen, we announce the arrival of the President of Barbados, Her Excellency, the Most Honorable Dame Sandra Mason. Please remain standing for the National Anthem of Barbados. Thank you very much. You may be seated. 
I now turn your attention to the screen for a short welcome video. So welcome, Her Excellency, the Most Honorable Dame Sandra Prunella Mason, President of Barbados, His Excellency Mr. Chandrika Prasad Santoki, President of the Republic of Suriname, the Honorable Mia Amor Motley, Prime Minister of Barbados, the Honorable Roosevelt Skerritt, Prime Minister of the Commonwealth of Dominica, Dr. the Honorable Terence Drew, Prime Minister of the Federation of St. Christopher and Nevis, the Honorable Sir Patterson Cheltenham, Chief Justice of Barbados, His Excellency Dr. Mahamudu Bahumia, Vice President of the Republic of Ghana, Dr. the Honorable Natalia Wheatley, Premier of the British Virgin Islands, Professor Benedict O.K. Orama, President and Chairman of the Board of Directors of the African Export-Import Bank, Dr. Carla Barnett, Secretary General of the Caribbean Community, His Excellency Mr. Albert Muchanga, African Union Commissioner, His Excellency Mr. Wamkele Mene, Secretary General of the African Continental Free Trade Area, the Honorable Santia Bradshaw, Deputy Prime Minister of Barbados, the Honorable E. J. Saunders, Deputy Premier of Turks and Caicos, the Honorable Dale Marshall, Attorney General of Barbados, Senior Ministers and other Honorable Members of the Cabinet of Barbados, the Right Excellent Sir Garfield Sobers, National Hero of Barbados, Honorable Ministers of Visiting States and Heads of Delegation of Antigua and Barbuda, Cuba, Egypt, Guinea, Jamaica, Kenya, Martinique, Nigeria, Rwanda, St. Lucia, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Senegal, South Africa, Tanzania, Togo, Trinidad and Tobago, the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, and the International Trade Center. His Honor, Senator Reginald Farley, President of the Senate. His Honor, Arthur Holder, Speaker of the House of Assembly. Members of the Privy Council. Ambassadors and senior diplomatic representatives of Barbados, Her Excellency Dame Billy Miller, His Excellency Dr. Clyde Masco, His Excellency Mr. Alexander MacDonald, High Commissioner of Barbados to Kenya, 
His Excellency Mr. Chad Blackman, Ambassador of Barbados to the World Trade Organization. His Excellency Mr. David Comijon, Ambassador of Barbados to the Caribbean Community. Mrs. Juliet Bab Riley, Chargé d'Affaires of Barbados to Ghana. Parliamentary Secretaries, Deputy President of the Senate, Deputy Speaker of the House of Assembly, Members of the Senate, Members of the House of Assembly, Mr. Dennis Denya, Executive Vice President, Finance and Banking Services of the African Export Import Bank, Mrs. Kaneo Awani, Executive Vice President, Intra African Trade of the African Export Import Bank, Mr. Anthony Edordu and Mr. Jean Louis Ekra, former presidents of the African Export Import Bank. Board of Directors and Staff of the African Import Export Bank, Mr. John Williams, Chairman of Invest Barbados, Mr. Adrian Padmore. Mr. Padmore is the Chairman of Export Barbados. Ms. Kay Greenwich, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Invest Barbados. Mr. Mark Hill, Chief Executive Officer of Export Barbados. Head of the Public Service of Barbados, Permanent Secretaries and Senior Government Officials. Specially invited guest, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> From the salutations, you will note that we have a very distinguished audience here this morning. I'm Sharon Marshall, and I wish you good morning on behalf of the government and people of Barbados. Welcome to the first ever Africa-Caribbean Trade and Investment Forum. To our overseas delegates, let me add, welcome to Barbados. The African Export-Import Bank, Invest Barbados, and Export Barbados are the coordinating agencies for this historic meeting, which is being held under the theme, One People, One Destiny, Uniting and Reimagining Our Future. We are going to start the proceedings with a poem by the celebrated Nigerian spoken word and performance poetry artist and award-winning author, Mr. D.K. Chukwumarije. D.K., the stage is yours. I come to you this morning to speak of our shared history. It is the history of five million people taken from Africa to the Caribbean in chains, but you see, you can bind the hands and feet of men and women, but you cannot bind their hearts. You cannot bind the memories of a people, their memories of those African songs their mothers once comforted them with. The memories of those foods of yam, of okra, that once nourished their bodies. Memories of words, of those native African words by which they once mobilized themselves. Like kai so, that rallying cry to follow, to come along, to stay together. Kai so, thrown overboard into the black Atlantic, it refused to perish. Kai so, choosing instead to reincarnate here in the Caribbean as Calypso. Like this, the candle of defiance was never snuffed out in the soul of the African slave, and so you fought with song, you fought with dance, you fought with bamboo sticks, you fought with a steel pan, you fought with cambole, you fought with carnival. It was not just Wilberforce, no, it was Haiti breaking out in revolution. It was Busa troubling Barbados. It was that rebellion at Demerara. These were the things that demonstrated to empire that slavery was not sustainable, that the African would not be kept on her knees. It was the Caribbean bent but on bow that inspired the poetry of resistance for Claude Mackay said, we will not die like hogs. And Sam Sharp said, I will rather die on the gallows than spend my life in slavery. And Antonio Macio said, this revolution has no color. And Marcos Gavi said, emancipate yourselves from mental slavery. Yes, it was that Trinidadian, Henry Sylvester Williams, it was he who called that first Pan-African Congress. 
It was Caribbeans like Edward Blyden and George Padmore and Claudia Jones that helped raise that consciousness that lingers till this day. That if the racial inequalities upon which this modern world was built was ever to be truly dismantled, then Africans and those of African descent must come together to understand that the bonds that connect us all to that continent can never be broken. That we are one people, scarred by one trauma, nailed to one cross, followed by one stigma, and our voices will not be heard until we project them together. To know that the cultural distance between Bridgetown and Lagos is not as vast as the ocean that stands between us. That underneath the differences between Pidgin and Patois, between Anglophone and Francophone, between Yoruba and Creole, we share a past. A past in which a young girl sits crying in the night because on that day her brother went into the forest and did not come back. And when she followed his footprints through jungle and valley, when she followed his footprints, they ended at the West African coast. They ended at the edge of the Atlantic Ocean. I am her descendant. I need not need a visa to come find you. You are his descendant. You should not need a visa to come home. So imagine. Imagine a world where there are direct flights between Dominica and Dakar, where there are exchange programs so students from the University of the West Indies can come and study at the University of Onsoka. And students from Onsoka can experience what it was for those Africans like Jaja, like Behanzen that were captured by the colonials and exiled to the Caribbean. Imagine a world where this history is alive where the sacrifice of Cuba in Angola is immortalized in memory, never forgotten in storytelling. Imagine a world where Africa's biggest export to the Caribbean is no longer slaves. A world where we trade, where we talk, where the Nigerian Naira shakes hands with the Bayesian dollar, and a Trinidadian poet can fly into Accra for a gig on Friday evening and be back home by Sunday. Imagine a world where we understand that Deo, Deo, daylight come and me one go home. Imagine a world where we understand that this call and response is Calypsonian, that Calypsonian is African, that the polyrhythmic heart of modern black culture beats to the African drum. Imagine a world where we know that this is one culture, that we are one people cut from one cloth, seen in one light. Imagine a world where we know this. Ah. Well, my brothers and sisters, today I saw a mysterious thing, a thing that vexed me to my very soul. I saw the black man dressed as a king, but crouching in the shadows with a begging bowl. His children were starving in fields of cassava, Dying of diseases the Palm Canal can cure. Homeless in a land of rock and timber. Why are you here? He said, I am poor. Today I saw a mysterious thing. A wonder so great I cannot tell it. I saw the black man dressed as a king but lying in the dust crying at my feet. His legs were sturdy like the palm tree. His oceans were rich and teeming with game. His muscles, they rippled like the proud Zambezi. I told him, get up. But he said, I am lame. Today, I saw a mysterious thing. So shocking, I have no words to say. I saw the black man dressed as a king, but standing like the lost by the highway. He huddled in a cage that had no gates. He could see where the keys to his chains were kept. He stood in clamps, but they had no weight. Why are you here? He said, I am trapped. Today, I saw a mysterious thing. Uh, how can I tell such a horrible story? I saw the black man dressed as a king, but sharing a sleeping mat with poverty. His poverty was a fat man with a bulging stomach lying on his back beside a pot full of treasure. This awareness was all that he lacked. 
that he could get up and reimagine his own future. Thank you. D.K. Chuck Maruje, who is emphasizing the theme of the conference, One People, One Destiny. I now turn the proceedings over to His Excellency Ambassador Chad Blackman, who is Barbados's permanent representative to the United Nations at Geneva and to the World Trade Organization. Ambassador Blackman. Protocol having already been established, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, viewers from around the world, good morning from Bridgetown, Barbados, and welcome to the opening ceremony of this historic Afri-Caribbean Trade and Investment Forum 2022, initiated by the government of Barbados and the afri Exim Bank, under the theme, One People, One Destiny. My name is Chad Blackman, Barbados' ambassador to the World Trade Organization, the UN at Geneva, Vienna, and Rome, and it is my honor to be your chair for this morning's opening session. This forum certainly comes at a very critical time in the history of both Africa and the Caribbean regions and the wider global community, and therefore to set further context to this morning's proceedings and event, we will be honored with welcome remarks and a keynote from a number of distinguished dignitaries from around the world. To commence this aspect of our proceedings, it, is, it therefore gives me the honor to welcome Mr. John Williams, who is the chair of Invest Barbados, who will deliver welcome remarks. Mr. Williams, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Master of Ceremonies. Your Excellency, the Most Honorable Dame Sandra Mason, President of Barbados. Your Excellency, Mr. Shandrika Prasad Santoki, President of the Republic of Suriname. The Honorable Mia Amor Motley, Prime Minister of Barbados. The Honorable Roosevelt Skerek, Prime Minister of the Commonwealth of Dominica. Dr. The Honorable Terence Jew, Drew, Prime Minister of the Federation of St. Christopher and Nevis. The Honorable Sir Patterson Cheltenham, Chief Justice of Barbados. His Excellency, Dr. Mahamamudu Baumia, Vice President of the Republic of Ghana. Dr. The Honorable Natalia Wheatley, President of the Virgin Premier of the Virgin, British Virgin Islands. Professor Benedict Orama, President and Chairman of the Board of Directors of the African Export Import Bank. Dr. Carla Burnett, Secretary General of the Caribbean Community. His Excellency, Mr. Albert Muchanga, African Union Commissioner. His Excellency, Mr. Wamkeli Mene, Secretary General of the African Continental Free Trade Area. Honorable Santia Bradshaw, Deputy Prime Minister of Barbados. The Honorable E.J. Saunders, Deputy Premier of the Turks and Caicos. Other Excellencies already acknowledged. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I wish you a warm good morning and a welcome to Barbados. A welcome to the inaugural Afro-Caribbean Trade and Investment Forum 2022, which we in Barbados are most honored and proud to host. It is not hyperbole to suggest that today should rank among the most important days in the post-colonial 
and post-independence history of our regions. The significance of this active 2022 forum and three, the three days of planned events and engagements under the theme, One People, One Destiny, uniting and reimagining our future is not lost on us. The nations of Africa, many of which are participating in this groundbreaking forum, as well as the countries of the Caribbean, share rich yet difficult history that has, that has both been scarred and shaped by centuries of slavery, separation, and colonialism. However, this event is part of a new era, a new approach. For us at Invest Barbados, it is evidence of a relationship that our government, led by our Prime Minister, the Honorable Mia Moore Motley, has deliberately and strategically nurtured, not only because it is economically beneficial, but because it simply is in the best interests of all of our peoples. The team at Invest Barbados and our energetic CEO, Kay Greenwich, has been working diligently with our sister agency, Export Barbados, led by CEO Mr. Mark Hill, together with Pro Professor Orama, the President and Chair of the African Export Import Bank, along with the bank's exports, to make this event a reality. Professor Orama, we acknowledge your commitment to this forum by assigning it the highest priority for your team. Our cross-border collaboration to make today a reality is a shining example of the possibilities that exist. This inaugural forum provides us with an opportunity to work collectively and cooperatively to address the huge issues that we all face. We are living in a period of global economic uncertainty and geopolitical upheaval. The result is that peoples of the South, including Africa and the Caribbean, are often caught in the middle with real life negative consequences. In the financial world, there are efforts by larger countries to determine global tax policy for the entire world. And we are also confronted with critical matters relating to de-risking and the lack of financial inclusion. In agriculture and trade, Africa and the Caribbean face similar challenges in ensuring food security in the wake of the war in Ukraine. It can seem daunting, the responsibility that we carry to improve the lives of our citizens and promote the development of our economies. We are confident, however, that the goals we set for ourselves can be achieved through working together. Indeed, our collective capacity is much more powerful than our individual forces. We have seen this in action during the COVID-19 pandemic when Barbados and the Caribbean community successfully coordinated with the African Medical Supplies Platform to access much needed COVID-19 vaccines. This was at a time when industrialized nations were hoarding supplies for their own populations, while less endowed nations struggled to access drugs and medical supplies. Of note, it was Afrexim Bank that raised its US $3 billion to help finance this extensive vaccine and medical supplies initiative, from which we as a region benefit. Professor Rama, we thank you on behalf of many. Today, your presence here in Barbados is an indication of your willingness and desire to begin shifting the balance of power more in our favor through strategic alliances in trade and investment, agribusiness, finance, logistics, tourism, the cultural and creative industries, and business facilitation. These are the kind of partnerships that we in Barbados and the Caribbean wish to foster. Here in Barbados, Invest Barbados and Export Barbados are eager and available conduits in pursuit of these goals. Among our objectives over the coming days are to enhance our interbanking relationships 
encourage increased trade and investment between the Caribbean and Africa by creating that enabling space for market identification for the building of partnerships and alliances and the sharing of trade and market information upon which to advance our mutual causes. Through Active 2022, we also want to explore and enable a possible Afro-Caribbean free trade area, develop creative and cultural industry partnerships, and importantly, to propagate products and initiatives of the Africa Export-Import Bank that support trade between Africa, Africans, and the diaspora, while also reducing the counterpart risk perception, and I emphasize perception, among African and Caribbean businesses will do business among themselves. We do not see these goals as a Barbados only endeavor. These are objectives that we desire for the entire Caribbean. To this end, we have with us the very top tier of government officials, including leaders of several CARICOM states and the Secretary General of CARICOM with us today. So what are some of the practical and realistic options available to achieve these objectives? By way of example, here in Barbados, we have built an investment platform in international business that is buoyed by an extensive bilateral tax and investment treaty network. Over the past four decades, more than 40 such arrangements have been ratified with jurisdictions around the world. We are happy to inform you that we are, our treaty negotiation team are at various stages of discussions to establish similar treaties with several African and Latin American nations. There is absolutely no reason why a multinational corporation in Ghana, in Kenya, Nigeria, or indeed any other country represented here today cannot afford themselves the advantages that North American and European corporates enjoy from investment in Barbados. For instance, corporations and entities around the world are seeking to establish captive insurance companies as part of their risk management strategies, and Barbados is among the top 10 domiciles for such special insurance products. Similarly, the expansion of our diplomatic footprint on the continent is also representative of our desire to change the narrative and seek to correct some misperceptions about how our relationships with countries on the African continent ought to evolve. To this end, we have partnered with CARICOM to share diplomatic offices in Nairobi, Kenya, headed by Ambassador Alex McDonnell, who is with us this morning. In addition, Barbados now has in place a charge and commercial attaché in Accra, Ghana. We wish to therefore use this event as an opportunity to fashion a future that showcases our mutual strengths and capacity to do great things together. A new and exciting future is unfolding and we must be prepared to position ourselves to follow through. Earlier this month, Barbados introduced visa waivers for 24 African countries in a move to enhance business investment opportunities and to facilitate the ease of travel for visitors and tourists. This is a tangible example of our desire to facilitate the exploration of the possibilities that exist and to help remove the literal barriers to entry. Additionally, many of you attending the forum today were spared the excessively long flight by Europe or the USA by connecting via direct charter to the island. This is another opportunity for growth in travel and tourism. In closing, we wish to thank our partner institutions in Barbados, the Caribbean, and Africa for sharing in the vision, as well as our platinum, gold, and silver sponsors, as well as our exhibitors, who have demonstrated confidence in what we're seeking to accomplish here. We wish you all a pr productive and enjoyable period of engagement, discussion, and appreciation of everything that, the Bar that Barbados and the Caribbean has to offer. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Chairman Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to acknowledge the presence of Mrs. Nados Bakele Thomas, the CEO of the African Union Development Agency. Now, at this time, I'd like to introduce you, ladies and gentlemen, to the Professor Benedict Omara, President and Chairman of the Board of Directors of the African Export Import Bank. Professor, you have the floor. Our host, the Right Honorable Sandra Mason, President of Barbados, the Honorable Prime Minister of Barbados, Maya Motley, and her government, Excellencies, the heads of state, heads of government here present the Vice President of the Republic of Ghana, Baumia, Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, with your permission, I will stand on the protocol that had already been established. One of the indelible lessons I learned early in my career as an export-import banker was that trade could be a source for good and evil. Almost 500 years ago, Africa was depopulated and dehumanized by the evil machinations of those who traded in, on his people and took them away in chains against their will to faraway lands. Most ended up in the Americas and the Caribbean to produce calories at no pay so that others could survive and prosper. The transatlantic slave trade made our people raw materials rather than laborers in the production of goods that others needed. Bob Marley captured this aptly when he sang his famous track, Night Shift, that for the sweat of my brow, you eat your bread. Today, we are gathered here to cause reverse, to turn the atrocity committed over 400 years ago into an asset for our people. We will be stupid not to recognize that Africa's borders have been extended to the Caribbean. We will have ourselves to blame if we fail to realize that we are the same people and therefore can constitute one integrated market. It is a remarkable entrepreneurial drive that made Europeans to take enormous risks to travel thousands of miles in boats to find new lands and produce on them. We need a similar entrepreneurial zeal deployed more positively for us to profitably walk the same lands and build transatlantic bridges for our common good as Africans. I believe that the people of Abedos, our hosts, are beginning to make the effort in so many positive ways. In November last year, Barbados became a republic, a mark of true independence. I would like to once again congratulate the government and the people of Barbados for taking this difficult stride. Mm -hmm. 
I also congratulate Her Excellency, the Honorable Sandra Mason, for becoming the first elected president of the Republic. Congratulations. The monumental milestone is a testament to the strong determination and firm commitment of the people of Barbados to take their destiny into their hands and assert the freedom to engage with their African roots. We know that it is in the roots, not the branches, that the tree, that the tree's greatest strength lies. I'm of the view that while this new direction is one that is uncharted. It offers hope and tremendous opportunities for your people, and thus, all people. Permit me also to take the opportunity to express our sincere gratitude to the Prime Minister of Barbados, our sister, the Honorable Maya Motley, her government, and the people of Barbados for the warm welcome and the most generous hospitality extended to us since we all arrived here. It is in the spirit of warm embrace that we assemble here today. With a strong sense of belonging, we all feel at home. Our shared identity has not been lost on us. That is why over 1,000 leaders, about 1,000 leaders, policymakers, development institutions, and captains of industry from Africa and the Caribbean have gathered here today to revive the spirit of family and Pan-Africanism. We begin a journey that is long overdue, yet uncharted and potentially filled with pitfalls. From the audacious call by Marcus Garvey for Pan-Africanism in the 1920s, through Bob Marley and Fela Kuti's cries for African unity in the 1970s and 1980s, to the African Union's declaration of the Caribbean as the sixth region of Africa. We have collectively always longed for a reunion of our brothers and sisters, separated against their will, and now left afield. And today, we have finally arrived to plot an economic future underpinned by trade in goods and services. The journey might have tarried but we have now taken the most momentous first steps. We have begun the process of knocking down the artificial barriers that have for centuries programmed us as different people. And we must be proud that this is a reunion arising out of a felt need, a reunion underpinned by a solid economic, cultural, and historical rationale. A present bank is is proud to be playing a key role in this monumental effort. In 2017, when we launched our fifth strategic plan, we incorporated the diaspora strategy, redefining inter African trade as trade amongst Africans, regardless of the geographic location. We emphasized the N in the inter African and did not just focus on the geographic Africa. We hope to support Africans wherever they might be in their economic endeavors. We strongly believe that Africans all over the world constitute a rich pool of resources and wealth. It is by promoting increased trade and investments amongst ourselves that we can hope to leverage the assets for our collective prosperity. It has been tested and proven by the Jews, the Indians, and the Irish. It will work for Africans, too. It is, it is in that spirit that our present bank, at the prompting of the African Union, integrated the Caribbean into its food procurement initiative for essential COVID-19 medical supplies implemented with the African Medical Supplies Platform. Pursuing this initiative at the most challenging time of heightened nationalism and protectionism was a commendable proof of the value of collective self-reliance. The process of present bank facilitated ensured the least cost and timely access to life-saving test kits, 
personal protective equipment and other medical supplies for our people, our brothers and sisters in the Caribbean, as he did for Africans in Africa. Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, when the COVID-19 vaccines arrived and access became a matter of the survival of the fittest, the African Union again called on our Flexing Bank to include the Caribbean in the pooled procurement and distribution under the African Vaccine Acquisition Task Team Initiative. This intervention allowed the procurement of 3 million doses of the COVID-19 vaccines for CARICOM countries. A present bank guaranteed the supply of these vaccines. A present bank implemented these interventions convinced that it is through collective self-reliance that our people can thrive and build a prosperous future for themselves and the generations to come. It is naive to expect others to give us prosperity. We have to work for it. The legendary Marcos Gavi was right when he said, and I quote, a race that is solely dependent upon another for economic excellence sooner or later dies. As we have in the past been living up on the messes shown by others and by the chances obtainable and have suffered therefrom, so we will in the future if an effort is not made now to adjust our affairs, unquote. So we stand at the cusp of history to open a well of opportunities for Africa and the Caribbean and to leverage our individual and collective strengths towards the attainment of our shared prosperity. We will run our race by ourselves and look less to others to give us oxygen. Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, the vision is clear. However, we must be focused we are recognizing that there are so many hurdles to cross. It is estimated that thousands of Africans visit the Caribbean on vacation annually. Yet, the arrangements for hotel accommodation, transportation, and tourism services are made indirectly through agencies neither domiciled in Africa nor the Caribbean. It is no wonder that we receive very little of the financial benefits. While the Caribbean is awash with fish, Africa imports over $4.5 billion of fish and crustaceans for the global markets annually. The Caribbean accounts for less than 1% of these imports. These data provide glimpses of what is possible if we dare. Your Excellencies, we have come here as a family to assess what we can do together with one another to restore dignity to our people and our regions. We hope that when we live here, our two regions will have forged an unbreakable bond that opens direct links, enabling the Caribbean to receive a fair share of tourism receipts from African tourists, for example. We will want to live here with actionable proposals on how to open air and sea links between the Caribbean and Africa. We would like to live here with concrete plans to open banking and payment trails, to see joint ventures for industrial projects, to deepen our commercial collaboration in the creative and cultural space, including how to collectively protect our intellectual properties, to share knowledge and jointly invest in climate adaptation projects, and to create institutional arrangements that will enable capacity building and greater daily engagements amongst ourselves, including more Africa-Caribbean marriages so that the links we are rebuilding will be unbreakable. <laughs> we want to leave here clear in our minds regarding ways to catalyze manufacturing investments in the Caribbean to take advantage of the 27 trillion US dollar North and Latin American markets. 
we must collaborate in the healthcare space so that shortages of qualified healthcare professionals can be overcome. We hope to live here with Africa Zimbabwe not only serving as the Zimbabwe Bank for Africa, but also for the Caribbean. <clears throat> Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, all these will require funding, investment, courage, boldness, and careful planning. That is why we are most pleased to have made tremendous progress in accelerating the membership of the CARICOM nations in Africa Bank. A signature of a participation agreement will enable Africa Bank to operate in the CARICOM region and deliver concretely on the new vision. Once these arrangements are concluded, our present bank will also open an office here in the Caribbean. And if we do agree, the bank will work with the governments of the CARICOM to set up a Caribbean Exim Bank as an Africa Bank subsidiary or affiliate. <clears throat> Africa Bank envisages committing an investment of $700 million in the Caribbean as soon as a regional office is opened building on the $250 million we already have established to support trade between the Caribbean and Africa. We will be pleased to advance our discussions with the Caribbean Development Bank to scale up trade enabling infrastructure investments in the region, as well as investments in integration of CARICOM countries to the emerging value chains within geographic Africa being made possible by the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. We are happy to have begun the implementation of internship programs whereby Caribbean students pursue attachment programs in Africa in Bank. Mrs. Uh, I think Mrs. Brittany Romeo and uh, Adele, Adele Lewis from the University of West Indies represent the first in the group of students from the Caribbean that will join our Zimmer internship program annually. And I think the two of them are here. I think we came with them. <clears throat> we plan to expand such opportunities and incorporate Caribbean students into our Zimmer Bank entrepreneurship program that will qualify them for attachments in leading African banks and corporations. We eagerly look forward to supporting airlines that can begin regular flights between Africa and the Caribbean. <clears throat> and as soon as the partnership agreement is signed, we will work to foster joint ventures for the establishment of industrial parks in the Caribbean. We will aim to support African investments in the Caribbean tourism sector, help promote local content in Guyana and elsewhere, where the oil and gas sectors are emerging, support agro-processing projects, support the project on intra-Caribbean and Africa-Caribbean payment trails, and help with climate change adaptation projects, amongst others. We hope that in no distant future, we can point to this beautiful day and say that we have become serious about reuniting with our brothers and sisters, separated from Africa centuries ago. We hope that we can point to this day and say this is the day the Africa-Caribbean Free Trade Agreement was vetted. <clears throat> Your Excellencies, allow me to thank our dear host, her Excellency Sandra Mason, President of Barbados, and Honorable Maya Motley, Prime Minister of Barbados, the government and the people of Barbados for treating us, your brothers and sisters, from the continent of Africa to such legendary African hospitality. I came here a year ago on a mission buoyed by a shared vision. I'm pleased that we are keeping the promises we made to ourselves to drive this agenda. Thank you, Maya. We also extend our appreciation to Your Excellencies, uh, Mr. Santoki, 
and Dr. Didacious Jews, as well as the leadership of the CARICOM and the Organization of uh, Eastern Caribbean Countries for your steadfast support of this initiative and for joining us as we commence this journey today. Special thanks to His Excellency President of Senegal and the Chairman of the African Union, Makisa, for supporting this effort. When history books are written, they will say it was under your leadership that the remarkable journey began. We also take the opportunity to thank the heads of states and governments from Africa and the Caribbean here present and their representatives for identifying with this project that introduces economic and commercial urgency to the Afro-Caribbean political engagement. We count on your continued support. Our thanks also go to His Excellency Musa Faki Mohammed, Chairperson of the African Union Commission, represented by Ambassador Muchanga, as well as the AU Commission for their strong support for this initiative. The African Union agencies, the African Union Development Agency, the FCFTA Secretariat, the African Business Council, and all of the African Union agencies that are here have been very supportive. I would like to express our gratitude. We also extend our appreciation to the business community as, well, community, as well as speakers, panelists, sponsors, moderators, and participants without whom this event would not have been possible. It would be remiss of me if I don't recognize the work done by the organizing committee from Africa and Barbados, especially Invest Barbados, Expo Barbados, uh, to deliver a successful gathering. It was a great teamwork comprising the African Union Commission, the AFCFTA Secretariat, the AU Development Agency, the International Trade Center, a Flexin Bank from the African side, and on the Caribbean side, the Caribbean Community, the CARICOM uh, uh, Secretariat, the Caribbean Export Development Agency, of course, the Barbados agencies I already have mentioned. Thanks for the great teamwork and all the effort over the last year that made it possible for us to gather here today. I must also thank my colleagues, led by Executive Vice President Kana Yawani, who spearheaded this effort on our side. As I end, I would like to again leave us with the wisdom of Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. He advised us of the enormity of the task ahead when he said, and I quote, the task ahead is great indeed, and heavy is the responsibility, and yet it is a noble and glorious challenge, a challenge which calls for the courage to dream, the courage to believe, the courage to dare, the courage to do, the courage to envision, the courage to fight, the courage to work, the courage to achieve, to achieve the highest excellencies and the fullest greatness of man. There we ask for more in life. I thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Professor, for those very inspiring words and also for your call for two regions to deepen our integration further. I think given the fact that our region boasts of many jurisdictions which are rated as the best wedding destinations, I think we can all agree with you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, to bring us opening remarks from both the Caribbean community and African community respectively. I have the honor to invite Her Excellency Dr. Carla Barnett, Secretary General of CARICOM, who will be followed immediately by His Excellency Albert Muchanga, the Commissioner for Economic Development, Trade, Tourism, Industry and Minerals of the African Union, on behalf of His Excellency Musa Faki Fahmat, Chairperson of the African Union Commission. Secretary General.
Thank you very much, Ambassador. Her Excellency, President Sandra Mason, Honorable Mia Moore Motley, Prime Minister of Barbados, forgive me all other protocols having been observed. Ladies and gentlemen, the first CARICOM Africa Summit held on September the 7th, 2021, opened a new chapter in the deep-rooted and long-standing relations between Caribbean countries and Africa. It set in motion various initiatives to further deepen and strengthen relations between the African continent and the Caribbean community. In particular, the leaders at that time underscored the need to foster increased trade, investment, air travel, and maritime shipping links with a view to realizing greater economic integration and enhanced people-to-people -people contact between Africa and the Caribbean. Here we are, one year later, at the first Afro-Caribbean Trade and Investment Forum, Active 2022, in beautiful Barbados. I wish to congratulate Honorable Prime Minister Motley and the team in Invest Barbados and Export Barbados for leading this effort in collaboration with the Frixim Bank and partners, including, of course, ourselves at the CARICOM Secretariat. I wish to extend, in particular, appreciation to the government and people of Barbados for the warm hospitality extended to everyone and the excellent arrangements that have been made for this event. We really do welcome all of it. Much of what defines our region has roots in Africa, which is the ancestral home for many of us, for many Caribbean nationals indeed. Nations in Africa, nations in the Caribbean have cooperated at the political levels through the struggles of decolonization and independence and through the anti-apartheid struggle. Our political cooperation has laid a foundation on which we can and must build a new trade and economic partnership that promotes mutual development and prosperity. The task is not an easy one. CARICOM and Africa's trade and investment relations are slowly emerging from the patterns that were embedded in our colonial arrangements which have carried over into our post-colonial economic realities. We must reset these systems and foster real South-South cooperation. This Afro-Caribbean Trade and Investment Forum is an important first step. It will build bilateral cooperation and promote trade, investment, technology transfer, innovation, tourism, culture, and other services. The potential to do business together is tremendous. The market represented by the African Continental Free Trade Arrangement is set to reach 6.7 trillion US dollars in value by 2035. Merchandise trade within the CARICOM single market stood at 2.2 billion. US in 2018, and with decisive steps taken recently to reduce non-tariff barriers, especially in agriculture, we expect further growth in the period ahead. We are working to strengthen productivity and overall trade performance with a push to transform our agriculture and industrial sectors. Our 25 by 2025 agricultural initiative already is gaining momentum. We are promoting investment in agriculture, including through two excellent agri-investment fora and expos that have been held so far. And we are backing this up with decisive actions to address trade barriers and promote productivity across the region. Work has started on an industrial policy that will complement the positive steps already underway in agriculture. In the area of services, the region is a strong performer, especially in, sector, in sectors such as travel, tourism, and financial services. There are real opportunities for investment and trade across all those sectors. Consider that in 2018, total CARICOM exports to the rest of the world amounted to 18.6 billion US, with total exports to Africa of only 815 million US. CARICOM exports to Africa represented, therefore, 4.4% of its exports totally. In that same year, CARICOM imports from the world stood at 33 billion US, 
with imports from Africa of only 603 million US. Africa therefore accounted for approximately only 2% of our total trade. This trade that was in 2018, since then COVID caused a sharp decline. Trading is beginning to trend back up, but it still remained in 2021 at only 538 million US dollars. The top exports to Africa include anhydrous ammonia, alumina, oil drilling, tubing materials, sauces and condiments, frozen orange juice concentrate, with the main markets being Morocco, Ghana, and South Africa. The top 10 imports from Africa, LNG, vehicles, barium sulfate, bitumen, and coriander, with the main sources being Nigeria, South Africa, and Morocco. Clearly, there is tremendous opportunity for expansion, deepening of the trading relations. But to grow trade and investment flows between our region, or regions, we need to strengthen and streamline the infrastructure to support CARICOM Africa trade. This includes air and maritime distribution and transportation channels. We need to move to establish a multilateral air services agreement between African countries and the community. Using this forum and other mechanisms, such as our mutual membership in the Organization of African, Caribbean, and Pacific States, we can continue to promote and forge business-to-business -business contacts through networks of private sector organizations, business development support organizations such as our Caribbean export, and the regional trade, which is our regional trade and investment promotion agency. We at CARICOM look forward to concluding the memorandum of understanding between the secretariats of CARICOM and the African Union to strengthen collaboration to support this process. In addition to the opportunities provided by the CARICOM single market, CARICOM offers a gateway to partner markets. Our preferential trade agreements with several Latin American and Caribbean neighbors, as well as others, provide significant market access opportunities for ex investors producing within CARICOM for those markets that represent a combined 11 trillion US dollars in imports of goods and services at this time. With the African Continental Free Trade Area and the CSME presenting solid platforms for trade and economic cooperation between our two regions, I am anticipating that this first, and I say first because there will have to be a second and a third to continue the activity, this first Afro-Caribbean Trade and Investment Forum will be a success. We at CARICOM are determined to advance our single market and extend our trade and investment arrangements to drive trade and economic growth and look forward to further deepening of our partnerships with our friends, neighbors, brothers and sisters in Africa. Thank you very much. I thank you very much, uh, the director of ceremony. I'm going to strictly observe the very, very comprehensive salutations made by the earlier director of ceremony. And all I can say, all protocol duly observed. Thank you very much. I begin my very brief statement by expressing our deep appreciation to the people and government of the Bedos for the very warm welcome and hospitality accorded to all of us since we arrived in this beautiful country and city. 
I also would like to congratulate the organizers of this forum, which has attracted participation from a broad range of stakeholders, including the youth. I bring warm greetings from His Excellency Dr. Musa Fak Muhammad, the chairperson of the African Union Commission, who has sent me to represent him at the open ceremony of the inaugural edition of the Africa Caribbean Trade and Investment Forum. He could not be with us today due to prior commitments. However, he conveys his best wishes for this forum and looks forward to reading the outcome document. The African Union was invited to be a strategic partner in this forum. It was not possible for us to be very substantive and tangible partners because the notification came a little bit too late for us to enable us to consult with member states. In our system, when it comes to partnership, we have to involve the member states right from the beginning. However, after this event, we are going to prepare a very comprehensive report to the African Union member states with a very strong recommendation that in the future, the African Union becomes a very active partner in these editions. And let me indicate that uh, when you see the African Export Import Bank working anywhere in the world, including the Caribbean, you should always be fully convinced that uh, the African Union is not very far off. Why do I say so? My brother and good friend, Dr. Orama, last year approached me to say he wanted the African Export Import Bank to be a specialized agent of the African Union. And I assured him that I was going to fully support the bid. And that has been considered by the ministers responsible for finance. And we are in the final stages of that consideration. And I'm very confident that in February next year, when the matter is put before the heads of state and government, there should be agreement, broad-based agreement that the African Export Import Bank is a specialized agent of the African Union on matters, among others, of trade finance. So we are right next to the African uh, Export Import Bank in the organization of this forum. And this forum is a noble undertaking. The shifting geoeconomics demands that countries and regions broaden and deepen linkages with other countries in order to create stronger platforms for inclusive economic growth and sustainable development, as well as resilience. This becomes more paramount as economies around the world face multiple threats of recessions, Unsustainable debt burdens, reduced flows of finance for sustainable development, climate change, and among several others, global supply chain disruptions. Africa and the Caribbean have a long history of collaboration. And the latest, which came up in the statement of the President of the African Export Import Bank, is cooperation through the Africa Medical Supplies Platform. With this forum, 
we are now focusing on moving to the next and higher level of deepening trade and different uh, investment exchanges between the two regions. And the opportunities are very vast. For the sake of brevity, I want to touch on six. To begin with, let me say we have a very strong, a young, large, and growing population offering a huge consumer base of currently 1.2 billion people. And by 2050, the African population will be 25% of the world's population. We also have entrepreneurs, including the youth, involved in startup operations, who are willing to take risks and invest in the productive transformation of our two regions. And now, work is already underway to create the African Caribbean Business Council. And I've accepted it to be at the signing ceremony, which will be done hopefully before we end this meeting. We also have universities awaiting to be transformed into research universities so that they can contribute to research and development. Vital to boosting innovation, diversification, and productivity in our production processes. Furthermore, climate change demands localization of production. In this respect, our two regions have the opportunity to develop inter-regional value chains. Already, there's focus on cassava, which is a crop very vital in this age of the green transition. And six, but not the least, this forum also offers the opportunity to enhance relations between the African Union Commission and the CARICOM Secretariat. Before the end of, of this meeting, I intend to have a bilateral meeting with the Excellence, the Secretary General of CARICOM, so that we have a clear roadmap on finalization of a memorandum of understanding between the two secretariats. A day should come when the African Union has an office in Georgetown, Guyana, the headquarters of CARICOM. A day should also come when CARICOM should have offices in Atababa, the headquarters of the African Union. And that will be signals towards deeper relations. Against this background, I've come to this meeting with a wide range of experts, including the chief executive of Auda Nepad, the president of the Africa, uh, African Business Council, as well as from the Secretariat of the Commission, experts on diaspora affairs, trade and investment, as well as the youth. And all of us are committed to actively participate in the deliberations that will take place during the next two days. I'll end here, and thank you for your kind attention. Thank you to both Secretary General and Commissioner. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now be invited to receive special remarks from His Excellency Chandrika Santoki, President of the Republic of Suriname and Chairman of CARICOM, who will be immediately followed by the Honorable Amadou Hot, Minister of Economy, Planning and International Cooperation of Senegal, on behalf of His Excellency Maki Sal, President of the Republic of Senegal and Chairman of the African Union. President Santoki. Thank you very much, Master of Ceremony. Good morning, all of you. President of the Republic of Barbados, Bay Mason, 
the Prime Minister of the Republic of Barbados, Mia Motley, and other honorable colleague heads of government, heads of delegation, heads of international missions, heads of the Caribbean community, I respectfully all other protocols observe. Allow me at the onset to express my most sincere gratitude to the Honorable Prime Minister Mia Motley for being the driving force behind this cooperation and her effort to make this first ever Afri Caribbean Trade and Investment Forum a reality. And Indeed, a timely and unique opportunity to insert new forms of inter-regional cooperation in an era where so many countries are challenged and affected by global developments beyond their doing. The genesis of this cooperation started 7 September 2001 with the historical first Africa-Caribbean Heads of Government meeting. Therefore, 7th of September is now recognized as the CARICOM African Day. And I'm delighted. And I'm delighted that many African and Caribbean nations are represented here at this investment conference. This is promising for the intended deepening and widening of ties between our two regions. Governments should strive to promote sustainable economic integration and cooperation for the benefit of the peoples of both regions. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, today is a joyous and historical day that both regions have come together to give further substance to our historical ties, the long-standing friendship and cooperation. This cooperation has been limited mostly to our engagement in multilateral arenas, political consultation, and diplomatic initiatives. While these have at times proven to be meaningful and useful, now it is time to go beyond solidarity and kinship. The Caribbean and African continent have an interlinked history of more than 400 years. However, this relationship has never been extensively exploited. And I'm pleased to see that some Caribbean companies and banks have ventured in the African continent. We need more of that. We also need African countries to invest in the Caribbean and force a partnership with Caribbean companies. On multilateral level, we have jointly negotiated trade agreements with the European Union in the past, such as the Cotonou Agreement, but never on regulating relations between the Caribbean countries and the African continent. The focus has always been on trade with the European Union and other developed, developed countries and less on strengthening ties between CARICOM and African countries. But it's about time to shape the South-South relationship between the two regions. Since we are all at almost the same level of development, it is of paramount importance that we join forces and start working together on each other's development. It is important that we do not see each other as competitors, but as development and business partners. So with this in mind and taking into account the global developments in ge and geopolitics, I firmly believe that our horizon of cooperation must expand now. Structurally and with an agenda to areas of marketing expansion, joint investment, strategic economic collaboration, 
in the areas of food and water security, climate financing, energy, ICT, connectivity by air and sea, and there's so many other areas. I invite investors around Africa and the Caribbean to trade and make use of the opportunities at hand. Crisis, ladies and gentlemen, brings also opportunities. Let us become strategic partners and see to direct financial and business flows to our respective territories. Much remains to be done to encourage trade and investment between the CARICOM and African countries, including addressing issues such as air and maritime transport, visa requirements, promoting greater cooperation in education and cultural exchanges, facilitating trade, services, and tourism. There are several financial institutions present here today that are willing to support and guide you, so make good use of them. We need to create effective and functional joint investment and trade frameworks to facilitate and direct this process. And I'm convinced that together and by joining hands, a new force can be created in the global trading system. Africa has enormous growth potential and with the right frameworks and governance, it can become a trading force. The Caribbean offers a great and profitable areas of economic cooperation. The existing and expected oil and gas industry holds promising investment opportunities for African countries too. Equally so in the tourism and food security and agriculture industry. My country, Suriname, with a strong heritage and cultural ties with Africa, has eliminated visa requirements for all countries in the world. So we are welcoming you all to Suriname. Come and take a look what Suriname has to offer. Apart from political cooperation and doing business, we must also strengthen the people-to-people -people ties, which will form the foundation for our valuable cooperation. Honorable heads of government and delegations, ladies and gentlemen, the world is in turmoil. The world is changing. We face existential challenges. We struggle with providing a stable and sustainable living and future to our people. That is the reality of today. So we cannot sit still and hope for the best. We cannot wait for others to come to our rescue. We have seen what global solidarity means in crisis. We have witnessed the failing of international system just recently. And I strongly believe in everything that happens for a reason. And therefore, colleagues ahead, ladies and gentlemen, members of CARICOM and the African nations, I appeal to you, it is now time for action. And Honorable Prime Minister Mia Motley, you said this several times, and now one of these actions has been taken with the result, this Afro-Caribbean Trade and Investment Forum 2022. So we must take our destiny in our hands. Indiv individually, we will not be able to achieve that long-standing goal of peace, security, and prosperity. But jointly, we can. Yes, collectively, we can. So at this forum, let us set aside national and regional sentiments, especially when it comes to developing of international cooperation as a tool for progress. Unity must drive us to success. The cooperation, the cooperation which we are aiming to achieve through this initiative must grow in unity and friendship from strength to strength. So let us start today to change the realities of tomorrow and commit 
to a better future through the Afri-Caribbean Trade and Investment Forum 2022. And I thank you very much. I wish you all the successes, what you want to achieve, and also wish you fruitful meetings during this conference. May God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you very much, President Santoki. At this time, you will now have Minister Hot on behalf of the President of the Republic of Senegal. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'll be speaking on behalf of His Excellency, President Macky Sall, Chairman of the African Union, who could not make it to Bridgetown for this event this time. Her Excellency, the Most Honorable Sandra Mason, President of Barbados. His Excellency, Shandrik Apesad Santoki, President of the Republic of Suriname and Chairman of the Caribbean Community. Her Excellency, Mia Amor Motley, Prime Minister of Barbados. Dear Prime Ministers, Heads of Government, the Vice President of Ghana, dear Ministers, Secretary Generals, other Excellencies, Professor Benedict Orama, President of the Afri Exim Bank, Albert Mushanga, Afri Union Commissioner. Honorable guests, dear CEOs, heads of companies, ladies and gentlemen. It is an honor for me to represent the President of the Republic of Senegal, His Excellency Macky Sall. It is a pleasure to be in this beautiful city of Bridgetown, which is full of history, with a unique blend of African, American and British heritage. Let me start by thanking Her Excellency, Mia Amor Motley, the Prime Minister, who has been kind enough to invite Senegal to this forum, and therefore offer me the opportunity to discover this country with its clear, crystal, crystal clear waters, white sand beaches. I welcome this excellent initiative that is intended to foster strategic partnerships between Africa and the Caribbean community with a view to boosting trade and investment flow in our countries. This impulse of economic rapprochement must be a shared characteristic of our two communities which are yoked together by history, despite the geographical distance separating them. Indeed, Africa and the Caribbean have deep ties founded in a common origin, history, culture, identity, and values. We have a common heritage that stems from our shared difficult past, and our people's share the same hopes, aspirations, and determinations to achieve development in a world replete with multiple and diverse challenges. All of this constitutes a solid foundation for building a viable partnership model for our two communities, which have learned to work together within the organization of African, Caribbean, and Pacific states through the various ACP EU agreements that have enabled us to pilot our common destiny in order to better defend our interest. Ladies and gentlemen, the time has now come for Africa and the Caribbean to use our strong historical ties as a means to deepen our socio-economic relationship by co-creating new strategic partnerships 
to address our shared challenges, such as the COVID-19 pandemic, climate change, food security, energy transition, digital transformation, and industrialization. We have the economic potential to achieve this. We can also count on our valiant human resources. Moreover, the global trend of creating large groups to cooperate in trade and investment imposes this reality upon us. Speaking of economic potential, I have been seduced by the richness of the Caribbean tourism, which has been developed as part of a diversification strategy geared towards adapting to the changes and economic realities of the islands, which have become a service economy, while remaining cognizant of the need for industrialization. The geographical location of the Caribbean, which is at the crossroad of Europe, Africa, and North and South America, is also a major asset that should be leveraged. Meanwhile, Africa is a region that offers the highest return on investment, an affordable, skilled workforce, attractive economic prospects, and abundant natural resources. Africa and the Caribbean, united under the African continental free trade area and the Caribbean community, will constitute the world's largest market by 2050 with over 2.5 billion consumers. Our leaders are well aware of these challenges and opportunities having set important milestones at the September 2021 summit, which brought together 69 countries. Ladies and gentlemen, given the aforementioned advantages, all we need to do now is to leverage the value and expertise of our respective human resources to develop innovative instruments that can boost our investments with a view to producing more tradable goods and services. May I seize this opportunity to pay a heartfelt tribute to Professor William Arthur Lewis, a gifted student, brilliant development economist, Nobel Prize winner in economics, and the first president of the Caribbean Development Bank. From his final resting place here in Bridgetown, may his thoughts continue to inspire our actions in a common goal of establishing a win-win partnership model for both regions. In the march towards this goal, I would like to share some proposals. In particular, the establishment of an alliance for entrepreneurship in Africa in the Caribbean to promote the development of SMEs and young entrepreneurs in promising sectors such as agriculture, agribusiness, digital technology, and tourism. I also deem it important to establish perhaps a private equity fund to support investments and public and build champions in both regions. The same applies to a fund dedicated to exports with the support of our Afri Exim Bank, our main export-import financial institutions. In relation to all these instruments, Senegal is available to experiment a test phase with a country like the Republic of Barbados. We have been experiencing in Senegal, thank you very much, Thank you. A growth, thank you. We've been experiencing in Senegal a growth trend since 2014, thanks to the vision and leadership of His Excellency President Macky Sall. We will become an oil and gas producing nation from next year. And we intend to use these new resources 
as levers to diversify our economy. We also intend to become a net exporter of petrochemical product, including fertilizers. We have initiated several reforms, particularly in the area of public-private partnerships. Finally, in the view of our respective potential in the areas of tourism and culture, our country is willing to join yours in paving the way forward by exploring partnership options in these areas. You can come to Senegal definitely without a visa. Definitely. And to many African countries as well, who have a no visa policy these days. To this end, I believe it is urgent to physically bring together our two communities, which are already very close in terms of values and history. That is why I'm pleased to propose the opening of direct air corridors between West Africa, for example, and the Caribbean. <laughs> Having missed our connection in New York uh, yesterday, the total journey time has become 28 hours from Dakar to Barbados. And it should be only six hours or five if we had a direct flight. So I think we need urgently to work on that. <laughs> Dear heads of states and government, may this gathering that will help us build bridges, economic and trade ties, lead us one day to merge the African Union and CARICOM to create the Afri-Caribbean Union or the Afri-Caribbean Reunion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister Hort, for those words and encouragement to us all. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great honor to invite you to listen to someone who will deliver the keynote address. No stranger to none of us here. I invite you, ladies and gentlemen, I invite you to the stage. The Prime Minister of Barbados, the host Prime Minister of this forum, the Honorable Mia Amor Mortley, Prime Minister of Barbados and lead head of government with carry with responsibility for the CSME. Prime Minister. Good morning, all. The most honorable Dame Sandra Mason, President of Barbados, President Santoki, my colleague, Prime Ministers, brothers, um, Prime Ministers, one day I'll be able to say, and sister Prime Minister. <laughs> the distinguished Vice President of Ghana, distinguished ministers from Africa and the Caribbean, all distinguished guests, all. How did we get here? And where are we? Today on the 1st of September, we gather for this historic moment to focus on that which others focused on about us for centuries. Trade, investment, making money, and keeping people out of poverty. We stand today, one day after the United Nations declares that August 31st shall be celebrated as the day of the people of African descent. We stand today, six days from the Africa CARICOM Day of the 7th of September, when last year we gathered for the first time, bringing together the leaders of Africa and the Caribbean 
community to forge our destiny as firm craftsmen of our faith. What is little known is that it is in this very building in August of 2019 on the visit of President Uhuru Kenyatta and myself that we first put forward to the predecessor of the current Secretary General of CARICOM that we forge this union by having the CARICOM Africa Union Summit. So this building is equally as important as the dates to which I refer. But what is less known is that this building is in the shadow, yes, of that statue that you saw as you arrived here, many of you, of the great General Bassa, right excellent General Bassa, national hero of Barbados, for leading that rebellion inspired by the Haitian rebellion, but leading one here in 1816 to keep the spirit of resistance alive and to ensure that we could remember that we were not ever supposed to be bonded in chains. Similarly, what you don't know is that the official residence of the Prime Minister next door is known as Elara Court, named after the state of Elara in Nigeria because we were both the subject of common rule and dominion by one Sir Robert Carter and Lady Carter who served both in Nigeria and here and after in Barbados, ensuring that the dominion of rule of the British was carried out expeditiously. And what you little really do not know, and I hope that my friend Herbert Rigway has joined us, is that when King Jaja of Opobo was tricked and put onto a boat for what was supposed to have been a meeting to discuss the improvement of relations between the people of Abobo and the British, that the next time he saw land was in Bridgetown. And he came to live within the shadows of this very building. Regrettably, only to be remembered by those who were not schooled in the majesty of his rule. In a folk song, King Jaja will let back alone. That is the past, but today is about the future. And we have come here cognizant that even though our peoples have worked together for more than a century, in the various Pan-African Congresses that, as you heard earlier, the political union, though essential, the political cooperation, though essential, is not sufficient for the journey that must be made to reverse the underdevelopment of Africa and the underdevelopment of the Caribbean. And we, the children of independence, have determined that we shall not allow another generation to pass without bringing together that which should never have been torn asunder. We face common battles from the climate crisis to the COVID pandemic and now to the third aspect of it, <clears throat> with respect to inflation and debt that threaten to tear too many of our countries apart and threaten to put back into poverty too many of our people. In Africa, one in every two people in rural communities and one in every ten in urban communities are recorded as being poor. In the Caribbean, Recent statistics show that numbers have gone from one in six and one in five 
to as high in some countries as one in three because of the food insecurity and because of the disruption of the last few years. To travel dependent economies, whether in Africa and the Caribbean, have literally been thrown on their backs. <clears throat> and we seek to fight this battle of bridging and reclaiming our Atlantic destiny on both sides at the very time when the travel and tourism industry is facing its greatest challenge in decades. In particular, the travel industry that still is reeling from the impact of sick leave and COVID. But we can choose to record that that is but another major, major battle. Or we can say, as my country has done, even in the midst of an IMF program, that if we do not seize our destiny now, we shall never seize it. We have within our capacity to remove, as I reflected last year on the 7th of September as I closed my statement at the African Union, to remove the middleman, to remove the middle leg, and forever to remove the scars of the middle passage. And how do we do it? Our governments, as I said, will cooperate on the great issues that we face today with the triple crises that I mentioned earlier. And we've been doing it. The African ministers of finance invited me as the lead head for CARICOM Single Market and Economy to participate in two of their meetings in the last 18 months. Our dear friend Vera Songwe, who is now departing yesterday, from the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa has continued to work with us shoulder to shoulder as I chaired the development committee of the World Bank and the IMF. And as we seek to reverse the inequities that would see Ghana and Greece facing the international markets with the same credit rating but paying significantly different interest rates simply because the European Union has acceptable safe assets that we in Africa and the Caribbean have not yet developed. But I don't come here to complain. I come here today to ask us to seize the moment. You heard President Arama, our distinguished sponsor, and whose courage and commitment has brought us to this place today, I say unashamedly, you heard him refer to the distinguished words of the most excellent Marcus Messiah Garvey. To recognize that our future can never be determined by someone else. And if that is what we want to make life easier day by day by day, then those who continue to remain in poverty in our nation shall not easily leave that state of affairs. It is within our grasp. We have the collective brain power, the collective creativity, the innate discipline and resilience, and above all else, yes, the capital between Africa and the Caribbean to make that defining difference now. We have begun, we've begun to understand that when we know each other, business becomes that much easier. My visit to Dakar earlier this year to speak at the opening of the African Basketball League and the opening of sports in Africa that that can present and the opportunities for bridging the Atlantic destiny of our people, not just for political actors, not just for bankers, but for ordinary people. It allowed me to understand fully that it, it can only be a mindset that stops a plane from traveling 
2,000 kilometers less between Bridgetown and Dakar than between Bridgetown and London. Two hours less, 2,000 kilometers less. But yet, you have a 28 hour delay through New York. We do it in spite of the fact that ordinary citizens of ours do not have the luxury of presenting as diplomats for official visas where those exist. Not to our countries because we have all removed them. But if the only way to get here is through North America and Europe, then how will you get the transit visa to move people here if we don't build the bridge across the Atlantic through air bridges? I have spoken to enough people in the last three years to know that this is now an act of political will and individual will. And going where no one has gone before is never easy. And that's the first thing we must tell ourselves. It's not easy. But you can't have Burner Boy bring out 20,000 people in Barbados. Command what he commands in Nigeria and Africa. Our own dear, the right excellent Rihanna, the same. And not believe that we can't open up the appetite of our people to travel to each other's <laughs> countries. And by the presence of the Africa Export-Import Bank, we hope, in the Caribbean. And Mr. President, I've spoken to you and indicated that like the Caribbean Development Bank, you will be accorded the same privileges and immunities in Bridgetown once you decide to set up in this region. You said you wanted marriages this morning. <laughs> and unashamedly, as a modern 21st century woman, I now propose to you the marriage between Barbados and the Africa Exit Bank. <laughs> but seriously, our brothers and sisters in Trinidad have led the way with the establishment of the Republic Bank in Ghana, and the Vice President, who is a distinguished central banker, Vice President of Ghana, who is here, can tell you that Republic Bank has made a name for itself in Ghana. <clears throat> I am aware that Access Bank and others who dominate the continent of Africa are also willing to come into this region at the very time when, regrettably, we are seeing the shrinking of the footprint of Canadian banks that have been with us for decades and in some instance a century from our region. We have it within our capacity. And we've seen it in the post-independence era in each of our countries, where the credit union movement and the multitudes that have come to the fore of economic prosperity through the appropriate policies have been able to rise and to allow for the creation of wealth among many of our people, but not yet sufficient of our people. I ask us today to spend the next few days really getting to know each other, because it is in knowing each other that those bonds will truly become marriages of lasting time. The ability for us to be able to have a Caribbean Export-Import Bank with our partners in the Africa Export-Import Bank is too critical a possibility for us in this region and for unlocking further the benefits of the Caribbean single market and single economy for us to ignore at this stage. Similarly, the ability to share data, to let us know what we all want and what we all need from each other. What are people like? The notion that Africa imports 4.5 billion US dollars in fish 
and CARICOM only supplies 1% when in the words of Norman Washington Manley, the Caribbean Sea is our patrimony. When Suriname exports as much fish as it does to Europe every year, over 40,000 tons, we have business to do. And that is why as chair of the Caribbean community two years ago as the COVID outbreak took us by the scruff of the neck and when we didn't know where we would turn, my brother Uhuru and Dr. Tedros from the WHO called and asked if I would speak to my brother leaders and see whether they would be interested in coming together in the Africa Medical Supplies Platform and thereafter put us in contact with Strive Masiwa who did the excellent work that allowed the African Exim Bank under the leadership of President Orama to be able to assist Caribbean people with a supply of over three million US dollars worth of vaccines. <laughs> that we had to turn to Africa and that Africa had to work with us reminded us that the world, in spite of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, regrettably, is still very much cast in the global imperial order. It must not escape us that we come to cooperate today, a hundred years in particular, after that decade that had the greatest amount of Pan-African Congresses. 19 20s, first being 1919, and there were four more in the 1920s. And when independence came, they waned and waned and waned. The last one being in 2014. The fact that in the post-independence era, over 80 years, that we've only had three or four should speak volumes about our lack of consciousness, our lack of focus, and our lack of determination to bridge history, the history that separated us. I hope we are now turning this corner for the very, very last time. And that reuniting of our people that will create opportunities, more opportunities for our tourism providers in the Caribbean, <clears throat> who continue to price product between winter and summer as if we see snow. <laughs> and who forget that our only market is not the North Atlantic countries who see snow. But our market only requires us to look across at each other, not to look up. If we can, through our partnership, remove from the Caribbean that awful period of summer tourism, where our average daily rates are a fraction of what we can achieve during the winter, then our bond of friendships and trade will have gone and worked for us. If we can equally allow our people to return to the continent of Africa, not just West Africa, but to East Africa, to the cradle of civilization, to be able to build on the partnerships that we have done in recent times with Kenya and Rwanda. And let us be real, there are only three United Nations global headquarters. We know the first two well, perhaps too well, New York and Geneva. But we have not embraced the one of the South as much as we have, should have, the one in Nairobi. And it is for that reason that my government took the decision to establish a mission in Nairobi just over a year ago. It happens and it helps that it is also the home of the United Nations Environmental Program at the time that we fight the greatest existential crisis for our countries, which is related to climate. My friends, I believe that our ability to work with each other is based and premised on knowing each other. 
And not only do we want, as we have started to see, banks, but we need insurance companies. We need tour and travel companies. We need heritage destinations. My own government made a determination, and we announced just after the turning of a republic last year, a passion project that I hope we will be able to work on to allow us to reclaim our Atlantic destiny, and that is why it is called road. At Newton Plantation, over the last 40 years, archaeological work has shown 570 slaves who were buried. The skeletal remains have been unearthed. And we have determined, as a government and as a people, that that site shall be the location for us to leverage one other piece of activity that we have. Barbados is that country that has the second largest transatlantic slave records for the British Atlantic slave trade. Of course, the one that has the most is the one that perhaps is not justified in retaining the integrity of it, and that is the United Kingdom. We have a responsibility to tell our story because we were chosen to be that place from which modern racism in the Americas would be forged. We became that place where the first synagogue of the Americas was established, and where the oldest theological missionary of the Americas was established, and where, regrettably, the most iniquitous laws to oppress people of African descent were equally established. And you ask today why we come to this moment with such passion. Because in leading the parliament that passed the 1661 slave code that came to be reproduced in exact form in many states of the United States of America and to spawn similar ones in other states, we feel as a people and as a parliament that we have a duty to literally forge a new destiny that does not allow our children only to reflect on those negatives, but that can speak about the glory and majesty of a people who have claimed themselves and their destiny in spite of all that has been thrown upon them century after century. And if we can leave Bridgetown with concrete relationships, and if those of you who have capacity but not yet inclination, and I look at my brother who guided me through university in London and who became my bridge to Africa, to Nifalawio, for over three decades. If we in this period of our lives, not our children's, can make real that which has only been the dreams and aspirations of hundreds of millions of people, then the confidence that was placed in us to take responsibility for our future and to forge it in a way that sees people, hears people, and feels people in a way that they were not seen, felt, or heard for centuries, then we will have done our part on this relay journey. It is not anticipated that we can reverse centuries in a few years, but it is anticipated that there are some who must claim the courage to jump off the ship and make it happen. And I hope that the indignity that has been foisted on our people of, to require in transit visas or to pay prices that bear no relationship to what the real costs of production are simply because that middle leg and middle man has literally loomed large. If we don't deal with these things, then we will perpetuate ourselves to another generation of simply being someone else's pawn. And the faces that I see in this room don't reflect that desire at all. I want to thank my CARICOM colleagues for being here today and for sending the signal, many of them, 
of the willingness to sign the partnership agreement with the Africa Exim Bank. In that, we literally unlock the potential for far more funding from the continent of Africa than has been made available to us as a region from many other better endowed regions of the world. And I believe that that commitment that President Orama has made of seeding at least 700 million US dollars in projects in this region is born not only of the sentiment that is natural for families that have reunited, but it is born from the hard coal reality that we must make money from our own development and not others. So my friends, we end today therefore confident that it is now ours not just to walk, but to run this race and to run it with passion and to bring along those who might make the journey easier. In Barbados, I say all the time that many hands make light work. And if we have to create legs across North America, the Caribbean, West Africa, and East Africa to make the flights viable, and if we have to create the direct logistics links between our ports of entry so that we can export directly and not go north to come back down south to make our products uncompetitive, then let us make those bonds and those relationships today that can unlock that to remove one in five, one in three, one in two, one in ten from a life of poverty. And let us do so conscious in the lyrics of that great Caribbean Calypsonian whose country celebrated its diamond jubilee yesterday the people of Trinidad and Tobago, we congratulate them on 60 years as we do the people of Jamaica, on 60 years of independence. But that independence also signaled from us the breaking of unity. And that unity we were reminded of in that seminal calypso, seminal calypso, Kaiso Dike of Black Stalin, that we came on the same ship, that we are one race, that we are one people, and that we must now forge a common intention. He said to make a better life for we women and we children in our region. I say to make a better life for our people. In the words of President Orama, of the Africans, where the N is the most important. Because the N is not the END, but the N is the UNITY of Africa and the Caribbean. May you enjoy my country, and those who have come as visitors, may you leave conscious that you are really carrying back now the bonds of family and friendship that have been rekindled for, as I told the people of Ghana when I addressed the Parliament of Ghana in 2019, Barbados was an Akan-speaking nation in the 17th century. And we have not forgotten the yam, the okra, the plantain. We have not forgotten the winners and the unners. And above all else, as some may say, and we are still blinging on both sides of the Atlantic. God bless us all. Thank you. Thank you, Prime Minister Motley, for your inspiring keynote address. However, your work is not yet over, so I'm going to ask you to return to the stage. And uh, I'll ask the President or Orama of Afrexim Bank to join you on stage. 
Since we will now have the signing ceremony for the partnership agreement between Afrexin Bank and a number of Caribbean countries. This is an agreement which is aimed at promoting and financing South South trade and investment between Africa and the Caribbean. The first country to sign will be Barbados, represented by the Honorable Mia Amor Motley, QC MP, Prime Minister. Thank you, Prime Minister Motley. Next on stage, the Republic of Suriname, represented by the President, His Excellency Mr. Chandrik Santoki. Next is the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis, represented by the Honorable Dr. Terence Drew, Prime Minister. The Commonwealth of Dominica, represented by Prime Minister, the Honorable Roosevelt Skerritt. St. Lucia, 
represented by the Honorable Emma Hippolyte, Minister of Commerce. Antigua and Barbuda, represented by the Honorable Darrell Matthew, Minister of Education, Sport, and Creative Arts. Then we move on to St. Vincent and the Grenadines, represented by the Honorable Kizal Peters, Minister of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Just to alert all the signatories, we will need to have you take a group photograph during the break. Thank you, President Orama. We began this program with poetry, and we end with poetry. little glitch in the program there, but as I was saying, we began the program with poetry and we end with poetry. It is the turn of award-winning Barbadian poet Cindy Celeste, who will perform a piece entitled Sankofa. Please welcome her.
There is no shame in going back to reclaim the things that we have forgotten. Things stolen from us and things that have gotten lost in time and tumult. This is a difficult task. If our unity is submarine, then the ask is that we wade through the waters and deep dive into our pasts, go back and unmask our history. If we hope to advance healthily, in hindsight, we find that our paths have always been intertwined. We find our destinies have always been aligned, but sometimes there are blind spots. Memories forced into a box, locked to keep us boxed into boxes of toxic thoughts to stop us from singing our songs of freedom, to make us forget the spirit of revolution that we come from. But we remember. We remember that our ancestors existed far before these systems tried to contain them. From the continent to the islands, even across the ocean, we are not tied to the terrestrial notion of fixity. There has always been more to us than slave ship and plantation, so we are joined together by the tidal motions in which we triangulate our shared identities, looking with hope to the fluctuating currents to co-create our cultural consciousness by translating the water's movements. We may not speak the same tongues anymore, but we have never forgotten the sentiment. Know well the power of speaking ourselves into existence, so the word diaspora would never worry about distance, would not align itself with the likes of difference, and disparity will always mean reclaiming relations and cultivating community. So when we meet, it is less a cultural exchange and more a reunion of the family. Sounds more like, okay, now, brother, long time no see. We are adjacent branches on the same family tree. And though the seasons have changed, we remain evergreen. And though we maintain the roots that ground and sustain us, we nourish the need to sprout new leaves so that we can all reach beyond the cumulus cloud with our collective contribution. Because if we hope to water a good tree enough that it will reach the heavens, the only limit is our imagination. So what will our vision of the future look like? When we actively strive to unify and uplift, shift focus from our differences and towards our sameness, reclaim that community-oriented spirit. Because we share both trial and triumph and we know that we can overcome and we know that Africa and the Caribbean region have suckled at the same bosom. We are a people of many nations and a nationhood made up of many factions, not fractured apart by geographical restrictions or bound by boundaries, but a single heart beating towards a common destiny. We are staring and steering into the unknown. But on this road that we travel, we don't go alone because love does not lose its way back home. And hope is enough to keep us afloat, to keep our eyes fixed on the horizon and there is pride in returning for what was forgotten. There is honor in reclamation as one people moving towards a single destiny of self-actualization. Thank you. Cindy Celeste, ladies and gentlemen, Sankofa. And that brings us to the end of the opening ceremony. Ladies and gentlemen, please stand for the departure of Her Excellency, the President of Barbados.
As Dame Sandra makes her exit, I'll ask the representatives who signed the partnership agreement to come on stage for a group photograph. For everyone else, it's time for a tea break. You can also tour the exhibition, but please return for the next session. Thank you very much. Could have been, could have been easier. panel and this particular panel is going to be focusing on leveraging the shared history we've heard so much about uh, this morning uh, the culture and also the identity to exploiting the opportunities that this agreement uh, will offer does history and culture and a shared identity actually matter and how does that translate into economic development? That is going to be one of my main questions to our esteemed panel today. It's also hoped that we're going to outline some of these specific areas such as tourism, uh, the blue economy, manufacturing, financial services, healthcare and the creative economy. The creatives often complain that they're only remembered when a, when a country is branding itself. So, culture, creativity, identity is spoken a lot, has been spoken about a lot today, but just how important is it for those of you in the audience today and also for those that are sitting uh, on the stage. So as we begin, I would like to introduce our panel guests today. First off, we have the Honourable Dr. Natalia Wheatley, the Premier of the British Virgin Islands. Thank you for joining us. Also, the Honourable Dr. Terence Drew, Prime Minister of St. Kitts and Nevis. Very busy, he finally joined us on the stage and congratulations. Um, on the appointment uh, as Prime Minister. Thank you. His Excellency Dr. Mohamedou Bawamia, Vice President of the Republic of Ghana. Thank you for joining us. And representing His Excellency Dr. Mr. Serge Lechemy, we have 
Minister Alexander Ventador, who is the Minister of Economic Development for Martinique. Thank you. His Excellency, Mr. Rodrigo Diaz, is the Minister of Trade and Investment for the Republic of Cuba. Okay. I guess, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, we are joined from Rwanda by Professor the Honourable Manasen Shuti, the Minister of State from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is your panel today. So I would like to begin um, by asking our panel We've heard a lot, haven't we, about marriage today, and that drew a lot of laughs and reaction um, from the audience, and obviously this is important. Marriage is an institution, though. Um, we, heard the, sorry, we heard about the championing of marriages between the continent of Africa and also the Caribbean. It's a game of compromise. It's a long game. So, I would like to start, please, that by asking you, how long is this vision going to take to be realized and become a true institution with firm foundations? And I wonder if I could start that first question, please, with our Premier from the British Virgin Islands, Dr. Wheatley. Uh, thank you so much. And let me just say uh, to the government of Barbados, uh, thank you for your kind hospitality. And certainly thank you for allowing me the opportunity uh, to share on this panel. Uh, how long? Uh, I think the most important question is how long it will take us to take steps. We must do things in steps. And a journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. And we've taken a critical step today. But the, the, the key to getting to any destination is to keep making steps after steps. So of course, the present global economy that we have has been established over a period of 500 years. And certainly you don't expect to make 500 years of progress all at one time. But the most important um, point that we must remember is that the, the chains that no longer necessarily bind your hands and your legs may still imprison the mind. And so it's extremely important for us to do as Bob Marley has said and as Marcus Gavi has said, which we were reminded of earlier, to emancipate ourselves from mental slavery and begin the work of building the institutions. And building the institutions most certainly takes time, but it'll take forever if you don't begin. Um, I wonder then, um, Dr. Terence Drew, yes. you're new in your role. Yes. Um, you're getting to grips with those institutions. What are the the details that many citizens, ordinary people, will not know about because there is a lot of negotiation that takes place in the background, really important negotiations. Is the environment ripe? Are the institutions in good shape? Are they fit for purpose for something as epic as an agreement like this? Right, I too, thank you very much for your question, but I too want to thank the Prime Minister of Barbados and the people of Barbados and also the bank for really forging this type of initiative. I think that it is, it is timely. For many years, we would have had some sort of link with Africa, even though it was not that tight. Through the Rastafarian movement, we know that they would have continued to remind us of our shared culture and the very fact that we are really descendants of the African peoples and from the African continent. And so today really is that a real tangible journey in making sure that we as a people come together, not only culturally, but it gives us the opportunity to build a real economic foundation. In my own country, we have 
medical schools that we call offshore schools, and we have had the opportunity to have many Africans in St. Kitts studying medicine. And so in a real sense, that has contributed directly <coughs> to our economic development in St. Kitts and Nevis, and as a result, also cultural exchanges. And I think that there are some real marriages in St. Kitts between Africans and the local people. And that initiative of having those schools and bringing Africans to St. Kitts and Nevis to study has really um, set this um, path forward. So this is not anything new to us. We are looking at this now as a next step in the journey. And I think our people who have had and continue to build tangible and real relationships with African people, this would be easily digestible by our people. And I think our institutions now will definitely come on board. So this for us in St. Kitts and Nevis is not anything that we would not expect. And yes, we know that there are hurdles, as was mentioned before, but I think because of already having those cultural links, already having real marriages, and having Nigerians and other Africans becoming citizens of St. Kitts and Nevis, I think that something like this is really going to take off in our country. So our institutions are ready, our philosophy is ready, our cultural links, um, those are also ready. And so, from my perspective in St. Kitts and Nevis, this is the right thing to do. And even though I have been there for such a short time, this is in keeping with our agenda, our political agenda, which is to forge a relationship with Africa and the African people, as we would have seen that Africa offers a market of over one billion people. We are naturally linked by our ancestry and, our, and other commonalities. And therefore, we should also make sure that that relationship works in having economic growth. Just to wrap up, just recently I had the opportunity to speak to our robotics team, and I had the opportunity to speak to a number of young people who were going off to study. And I said to them that our country is small, but our, the possibility of having a much wider base of people to cater to might be in the billions. And I said to them then that I had attended a Zoom meeting with respect to what we are dealing with today. And so when they educate themselves, do not limit their minds to just the confines of their country or the Caribbean, but they must also expand their minds to their ancestral continent of Africa. So I'm pleased to say that we are ready to welcome this. Thank you very much. Well, Mr. Drew, thank you very much indeed. And uh, before I, I join you uh, with the seats, I'd just like to uh, apologise. We had um, a gentleman join us uh, just at the last minute and I wanted to confirm the details. So my apologies and to introduce him and introduce you uh, to our audience, we have with us also from the Commonwealth of Dominica, the Honourable Kenneth Daru, who is the Minister of Foreign Affairs for International Business and Diaspora Relations. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. So on to our third question, and I already said in our introduction that culture is coming up as a common theme time and time and time again, and this sense of common identity. Um, in, in researching the history of the ACP and trade relations um, with the Caribbean and, and Africa, I came across some interesting comments, and some of those were, without culture there is no future. So when we talk about a shared culture, how do you flip culture and monetize it? What role does culture have in generating economic development? Because after all, this is what this is all about. <coughs> it's about show me the money. <laughs> that is what we're talking about. Um, and I would like to aptly put that, please, uh, to His, uh, His Excellency uh, Dr. Bawamia from the Republic of Ghana. Thank you very much. Uh, I would also like to join in thanking the government and people of Barbados and the African Bank for uh, hosting this particular forum. I think we should not really lose sight of the fact that what has happened here this morning is truly historic. Um, the idea for this conference is just about a year old and it has been actualized. And I think part of 
the, the reason why we, we've had this happen. Of course, it's leadership, but culture also plays a major role um, in, in doing this. I think the people of the Caribbean and the people of Africa pretty much are the same people. We've been separated by 400 years of slavery and colonialism and all of that. But I think that because we are children of the same mother, we share common culture, common heritage. And when you're about to do business with somebody else, uh, understanding them and understanding people sometimes share old school ties, you know, for example, and that is a basis for doing business. For us, we are children of the same mother, you know, practically, and therefore that understanding, that commonality brings us together and it's therefore easier to do business. Uh, it, it, you know, with one another. If you look at, for example, Turkey within the EU, they've been knocking at the door, but I think the EU generally feels that culturally they are a bit different from the rest of them. And so they've shut that door because, they, you know, they, that, that, that is the whole lack of harmony in terms of culture. So culture has been the basis, for example, of the EU coming together, and that is, of course, a basis for the money that, that they make in that context. So when you look at us within the African and the Caribbean context, um, we share that heritage. We've been really, um, I mean, of course, if you listen to our music, watch our foods and everything, we are pretty much the same thing, the same people. You know, but we, of course we've suffered colonialism, we've suffered slavery, we've, we've, we've suffered the implications of that, and a lot of that has been on the mindset. Uh, a lot of the time, if you look at the way we have been conditioned to think, we've been conditioned to think in the context of an impossibility mindset. So whenever you set out to do something, there's someone who says that is not possible. We are now in a whole new age where the new leadership amongst our different countries are thinking in the realm of possibilities, making things happen. And that is what the difference is today. I mean, Kwame Nkrumah, Marcus Garvey, and all of that talked about this, but today we are actually actualizing this vision. Uh, and so I believe that culture is very important. We're saying that, look, let's get together, let's put together the air links, let's put together the shipping links and, and actualize this uh, major asset we have, which is the cultural links, the common heritage, and then the money would flow once we, we get the deals done. Okay. Minister, thank you very much indeed. Um, also, the, the cold, hard truth about a relationship is that it only works when either party gets what they want from the relationship. Um, so I'm going to come to Martinique. Um, your main economic sector, your main economic driver, you can correct me if I'm wrong, is agriculture. So when you look to Africa, what does Africa have on its table that you want? And what do you have to offer the 54 nations? There is a dispute over the number, but the nations of Africa. Thank you. Uh, first of all, um, I want to thank uh, the government of Barbados. Uh, Martinique is like 50 minutes from here. Okay. Is that, is that good? Good? Okay. Um, oh, I don't think so. No? Um, Martinique is uh, 50 minutes from here, but it's only my second time in Barbados. What is a, a shame, uh, because we are neighborhood and we are very close in terms of uh, culture. You, you talked about culture before. Um, Africa is um, a territory we are looking for for a long time. We are uh, a hist history between Martinique and Africa between uh, Aimé Césaire and Senghor in Senegal, between uh, uh, Algeria and Martinique with France Fanon. So it's uh, the, the motherland uh, from us, from, from Martinique. And it's also, um, th thank you. Yeah, it's also um, economic and tourism opportunity. Uh, we are working for maybe one year uh, about um, 
a plane uh, between Dakar and Fort de France because we are waiting for more African people come in Martinique and pass Martinique to go to the west of the Caribbean. Uh, Uh, we say uh, before that we, you spend uh, 28 hours uh, in New York. We don't want that before. We, we want you go to Dakar, then you came to Martinique or uh, to Bridgeton, and then you go to uh, every island of Caribbean. So uh, Africa is a very, very uh, interesting country, uh, continent for us. We have several... Um, uh, Uh, in, we initiated several um, economic uh, touch with uh, Ghana, with Senegal, etc., etc. So we are very, very, very looking for Africa more than uh, America, for example, to the development of Martinique. Martinique can offer, uh, uh, you know, uh, sea uh, tourism, Rome. Uh, people, uh, uh, when we talk about Martica, Martinique, you, you think about Rome, about Cassav, etc. But we also have a uh, strong, strong business uh, offer in terms of energy, in terms of digital. And uh, we, we will have, uh, I think, tomorrow a conference about Orange uh, business. And that is uh, art and uh, digital art graphic. And Martinique is uh, uh, very, very great in terms of uh, that uh, tip type of economy. So um, that summit is very, very interesting for us because Caribbean and Africa can be a strong place in a world who is not global anymore, who is more regional than global. And climate change, uh, geopolitics is very... Um, burning in Europe. So I think it's the right time to, to have a very, very uh, strong relationship between Africa and the uh, Caribbean. Mr. Van Tadol, thank you very much indeed for that. You brought up um, air ties, and that is another subject that we heard so much about uh, today. Um, the movement of people, visas, air bridges, transport links, basically. Um, key air links need to be established. Now, what is it going to take to, to build and create what I've heard described as a multilateral air agreement? We heard earlier that it's going to take an act of political and individual will. So, I am going to turn to His Excellency Diaz. With the context of Cuba's history, who needs to be around that table in order to establish those bridges? Well, first of all, I would like to, to thank the organizers, especially the government of Barbados for the invitation. For Cuba, it's very important to, to participate in this first ever forum, Africa Caribbean Trade and Investment Forum. Uh, the, the tradition, the history unites Africa and the Caribbean and Cuba also. And the challenge will be how are we going to work together in order to uh, reach these uh, objectives of uh, construct and, and integration and economical integration. We, we should keep in mind that uh, only in Cuba we receive over centuries 1.3 million persons from Africa. They came as slaves, something that is uh, inhuman. But they brought with them uh, their traditions, their tastes, and they uh, form our, our uh, nationality. I mean, they, they are part of our uh, father, fatherhood of, of, of Cubans. They participated, the, the, the African descent, uh, in the war for the independence of Cuba. So they, they are part of our history. And we celebrate every year the Africa Day on May 25. And the same thing, I believe, in, in, in different uh, stand that happens in, in the rest of the, of the Caribbean. And that's why Caribbean countries, we are uh, part of uh, the same uh, uh, history, culture. We share the same worries in, in the world today, like climate change uh, or COVID-19 or whatever. In 2005, Fidel Castro, the leader of the Cuban Revolution, visited Barbados during the second summit 
Cuba CARICOM, and he stressed the importance of globalize the solidarity, the cooperation. To face the neoliberal globalization is very important that we add in, in unity. It's very difficult for us to survive in this world if we are not united. So this kind of, of initiatives are very important. We support it very uh, strongly. And from Cuba, who is a particular country because we are submitted to an economic, financial, and uh, commercial uh, blockade by the U.S. for more than 60 years, something that I have to say that it has been rejected for Africa and the Caribbean strongly uh, during all these years. Um, but even so, we have the possibility to insert the Cuban economy also in this important effort we are uh, promoting today. Uh, Your Excellency Diaz, thank you very much for that. I, I turn now to um, a representative from a country that has, I think, uh, led and is a shining beacon on the African continent when it comes to technology. Um, and many people often speak of uh, Rwanda and how it'll blow people away when they arrive. Um, and that is partly because of ignorance, I think, when people travel to the continent uh, for the first time and will enter Rwanda. So my question to you, um, Professor Nshuti, is we heard about a new approach being needed. What should that new approach look like when it comes to this new deal? <clears throat> Uh, thank you very much, uh, moderator. And, uh, I would want to thank the government and the people of uh, Barbados for the reception that have given us and this beautiful island, I mean, beyond imagination, I must admit. Um, now, for the government of Rwanda, and thank you for that question, um, as part, of course, of the continent and uh, African heritage, uh, we have done many things that I think other brothers and sisters in, uh, in Africa and did in the Caribbean uh, can do. I think what we can do, everybody else can do. We have not done uh, miracles. And so, um, first of all, we need to unlock our mindset. We need to unlock our mindset. I think Africa and indeed uh, brothers in the Caribbeans, we have everything it takes. Most of us have been educated in the countries we call the best in this world. But I think our biggest uh, undoing has been our mindset. We are good at uh, designing the best programs, speaking about, about them, but implement, implementation of what we believe or what we want to do has been a big problem. And I think this is where we need to unlock uh, ourselves. And I'm saying this because I've been talking about brothers who are chained um, in different ways. Uh, the continent had colonialism, but the biggest chain now is our mindset. We need to unchain our mindset. We need to do things differently. Even on our continent, 15% of our trade is within Africa. With our brothers here, 1%. But that means a mindset thing that has to be done among ourselves as brothers and sisters. We have everything except the mindset that we need to unchain. And, and uh, uh, we need to believe that after all this period, 60 years, 70 years of independence, that colonialism, that chain cannot be kept on as being so, song, uh, mean sung. We need to, to sing another song. I think sometimes the more I repeat that we have been colonized, have been chained, we seem to be enforcing that mindset. No, we need to get out of that gear and say we are no longer chained, we are no longer colonized, but how can we do the best that we need to do for our people, for our countries? Before I, I move on to my next question, just to pick up from that, you've asked the question, so I wonder if you could give me the answer. How do you do that? Yes, uh, and of course, the first side of the same solution I said is mindset. And I'll give you a, a simple example. In Rwanda, what we did was to abolish visas. 
the first step said, no visa for Africans. So you can come to Rwanda without a visa. I mean, if you begin with what simple uh, measure, say abolish visas for every black, for example, African, to come here, to come to Rwanda, that's the first step. And I'll give an example. A visa costs $50. If I came to Caribbean just for a day, I'd spend much more than $50 I would have spent on a visa. Sometimes it's bad economics. Bad economics. You say, pay $50 to come to, to Barbados. Rwanda says no visa. But if you came for two days, you spent much more money in Rwanda than the cost of the visa. So sometimes it's bad economics. And so we begin by the simple things. Let's remove the visas. Number, number two, the communication I've been talking about. We get our airlines that are flying to New York to fly to here. Bring our brothers and sisters to, to come to these beaches. You will find our brothers in Miami and other places. Why not Barbados? But that again means we need to open up the, the, the air traffic you know, uh, routes to these beautiful islands so that our brothers can come here. And our brothers from here can also come to the continent. That way, we unlock these economies. We have the potential. We need to sing the song and walk the walk, the talk. President Shruti, thank you very much indeed. Um, and I have noticed that uh, notes are being made here on the stage. So hopefully we'll have enough time. Um, and I will come back to um, the gentleman here. Um, it would be nice to see a woman up here, wouldn't it? But <laughs> hopefully I'll come back to the gentleman for a question. And I wonder if I could also put it out to the audience. If there is a burning question that you would like asked uh, before our panel steps down and we draw the, the discussion to a close, um, please can you raise your hand and hopefully we'll be able to, to get a microphone to you. So it'd be nice to get some feedback from yourselves. You may have a question that matters to you that we can put uh, to these top leaders. So as I come to um, the Honourable Daru, we heard there about a, a mindset. Now, I recently attended an event in, in Zambia, that's the country of my birth, and it was talking about the diaspora, so this is, your, this is your area. And one of the things that came up was the fact that there was this perception, and this is what we heard earlier from one of our speakers, one of our key speakers, a perception that business could not be done, even amongst ourselves. How do you go about changing that mindset and making things happen across um, one continent and, uh, you know, four hours away, if you fly from Senegal, that is, uh, in the Caribbean. Yes, thank you very much. Mike, is that? Yeah. Yes, thank you very much. And also would like to join my colleagues in thanking the government and, and people of Barbados for inviting us here. I would also like to commend um, Prime Minister Motley um, for this bold initiative. So while this CARICOM African Unity has been spoken about for decades now. I really think it had to take a very strong will, political will, of course, women like herself, to get this. And I think this is a very great um, first step. Um, of course, I also think that the signing of the agreement between a number of the CARICOM countries, OECS, and the African Export Informatic Signals, I think the region, that is CARICOM's region, to of course, um, move forward with in this relationship. Like you said, um, a lot of the issues that have been um, spoken about in, in, in this forum, um, I don't think they should be taken in isolation. They should not be insulated. Um, tourism, trade, um, even our relationship with our diaspora, all of this should be looked at as one. And of course, um, a lot has been said about um, political will. And I think um, the attendance of many heads here today, ministers of government, I think the political will is there. And I think we now need to follow um, suit as in the footsteps of Miyamoto to convert this political will into concrete action. And I'm really confident that, um, that this will be done. Now to your question, um, the issue of the diaspora, um, Dominica, for example, we, we were in the process of creating what we call and um, formulating the diaspora policy um, because a lot of our folks who live outside the, 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 our, our borders, sometimes they feel left out. They feel that they, they, they make a serious contribution to the country's development and then that the governments, um, that we don't engage them enough. So um, what we've done um, in Dominica, um, unfortunately, um, today actually marks the anniversary of the death of my comrade, 
my fellow minister who had the the, the, the diaspora portfolio is such as importance that we give to it in Dominica. Um, so it now falls on me to continue um, the touch. So you're right that um, we think that our, our citizens will live outside our geophysical boundaries. Mm -hmm. I really don't like the term diaspora, I rather talk about citizens who live outside our geophysical um, boundaries, I think have a lot to offer in terms of expertise, and I think it's up to us and the governments of the region to now formulate policy to, to engage them in, in a meaningful way. But I think um, we see a lot happening, and, and I think that I don't think what is happening today that we necessarily have to reinvent the wheel. We've seen a lot of exchanges between our people and the, and the, and the African continent, and I think it's a Prime Minister, what's the Prime Minister Motley, who mentioned that we are fortunate to be living at a time when we have two cultural entertainment giants in the region. I think Bernard Boy from the African continent and Rihanna, who happens to be from Barbados. And while they may be, of course, the, the, the giants of the industry, we can think of the hundreds as cause of, of other entertainers, I think, who would benefit from, from bridging this gap between the, the CARICOM and Africa RAM, especially when, when, I said when, not if, when, street flights are established. I mean, I had the honor or the, the experience rather to, to, to be on a chartered flight from Morocco to Dominica, six hours, which is less than it takes from Los Angeles to New York. Mm. You, you, you with me, the same country. So, um, so you can imagine um, the possibilities. I think Microsoft was the one who, who, who I think, who had this uh, motor some time ago. The possibilities are endless when the political will translates into concrete action in establishing street flights and of course um, other initiatives. So um, again, I would like to really commend um, 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 Prime Minister Motley and I could give that Dominica's commitment that we will do what we have to do to also um, move forward with this um, Africa CARICOM um, unity. Thank you. Um, Honourable Daru, thank you very much, uh, very, very much indeed. Of course, uh, Dominica was the last Caribbean island, I think, to be colonised, wasn't it? Yes. And uh, known, for those of you who don't know, as the nature island of the Caribbean. So that ties in very nicely with um, COP27 and the environment and also tourism. Okay, I am seeing hands coming up. So I wonder if our comms team, please, can prepare and get some microphones to the hands in the audience. Just bear with me one moment, gentlemen. Um, Comms, do we have microphones that will be available? So there are a few hands there. I've got one more question that I'm going to put to our panel. So we'll get the microphones to the audience members who have their hands up. And as soon as we've had response uh, to my next question, I will come to the audience. And my next question, please put your hand up here on the stage if you'd like to take it. I'm going to open this up to you. Gender equality. Um, I didn't hear much about the role of women and girls in what was said earlier today. Um, lots about travel, lots about investments and diplomatic ties, which is fantastic because it's a nice first easy win for establishing um, whether it's trade or investment, but ties between, between nations. But what are your priorities when it comes to gender and why does it matter when it comes to economic development to include women and girls. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for the... Can we have uh, the microphone up, please? Thank uh, for... you. Yes, thank you. Yes, uh, thank you for that very important question. Um, the important thing about gender equality is uh, when you don't include women, you really don't unlock your full potential. Uh, women, I believe, is perhaps even the majority of the world's population are women. And so if you limit yourself just to males, you certainly won't be able to, to have your full talent, your full, full education, and your full skills available to you. And let me just say, it is really our culture, I would say, this is my view, my opinion, where women and our, our history where women have always stepped up to the plate in the African Caribbean story. I can just point to two examples. You have the great Yas Antiwa, who uh, certainly was a great military leader and an area most persons think about males in that particular area. And you have Nanny of the Maroons on the Caribbean side from, from Jamaica, 
who again another uh, great military leader on the other side of the Atlantic. And when we really take a look at it, uh, women have, have been really at the forefront of helping us to survive uh, over the past 500 years with what we've been able to endure through slavery, through colonialism, and through the unequal relationships between the North and the South. And I believe it'll be women, women like Prime Minister Matley, who's doing an excellent job, who's really, I'm ready to vote for her as president of the world. <laughs> <laughs> Who's really going to, to lead us where we need to go. But we all have a role to play. But very interestingly, um, if I can return to the point you mentioned before about culture. Culture is really the key for us. Um, I, I went to Sierra Leone uh, this was close to 20 years ago, and I was so surprised that I got to Sierra Leone and I saw them having what we call in my home a rise and shine tramp. And in other places, they call it juve. They were behind a truck and they were dancing and they were singing. But the interesting part was they were singing a song from somebody from who, who had resided in my island, a, a man by the name of uh, James E.P., who used to cut my hair. <laughs> and I'm in Sierra Leone, and they're playing James E.P. So really, as Prime Minister Matley reminded us this morning, the key is for us to meet each other. When we meet each other, we learn things about each other, because really we realize that we're the same people. Another interesting story, I was in um, Guinea Conakry, and there's a lady who walked up to me, and she starts speaking to me in the Fulani language. She's going da, 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 she's going 100 miles per hour, and she's confused as to why I'm not responding to her, because I can't understand a word that she's saying. It's my language. And somebody had to explain to her, you know, this is not who you think it is, you know? <laughs> this is someone who's come from, from away, but she looked at me and she could not be persuaded that I was not the person who she thought it was. Mm. Because really, ultimately, and truly, we're the same people. We dress the same, we walk the same, we listen to the same types of music, we eat the same types of food, and what we have to train our minds to do is to not allow others to exploit our talents, exploit our creativity, and exploit our, all our skills for their own benefit and use it for our own benefit. Professor Wheatley, um before I put this to the other members of the panel, I'd like to hear a response from, um, from Africa on the question of gender. So if you can just have a think and, oh, fantastic, we've got two. But when you, when you spoke there, Premier Weekly, about um, the culture, the importance of culture, your island has a very mixed culture. Yeah. Um, a third of your total population are on work permits, foreign work permits. Yes. They are expatriates. How does that work for you? We, we have perhaps over 100 different nationalities in the BVI uh, because, of course, persons have come there to live and to work. And we've been able to integrate with each other. We have persons who've come from the African continent. Uh, Mr. Cherno Jallo, who is at a very prominent position in our financial services sector, financial services being one of the two main pillars of our economy. We've had, we have many persons from St. Kitts and Nevis, we have persons from Barbados, from Antigua, and really, in places where you have lots of migration, I believe uh, really can become really central points for pushing the global and the regional agenda, both the African-Caribbean uh, relationship as well as uh, Caribbean integration. We have to be at the forefront and at the lead because, of course, we've been taught for so long that we have differences which divide us. And we focus on some of the very minute differences as opposed to focusing on the overwhelming similarities between us. So it's also about a mindset, as we've been speaking about before. People like Marcus Garvey, people like Kwame Nkrumah, Wilmot Blyden, which when I went to Sierra Leone, Wilmot Blyden, who's from the Virgin Islands. And I saw a statue of Wilmot Blyden. But these persons are heroic 
because they remind us of all our similarities. Mm -hmm. And just like with the visas and, and all of those different types of things, we have to take concrete steps and legal steps to show the unity and similarity between us. Okay, Professor Wheatley, thank you very much. And Fulani, of course, is the most widely spoken um, language on the African continent, not Swahili, as many people uh, yes. think. Um, so we're going to get an African perspective. I am coming to the audience. I'm going to get an African perspective on gender equality. And um, I'm going to go to um, Your Excellency Bawamia first, and I will, I will come to Professor as well. Well, thank you very much. I think that the, the point is made. Uh, in, in Ghana, for example, you are close to about 52% of the population as female. Uh, and so that is the majority population. In the la I mean, historically, the whole issue has been exclusion. And if you're going to get the type of development that you, you have to get, you definitely need inclusion, uh, and, th and therefore you need to create gender equality. Um, one of the vehicles that we have used in Ghana, for example, in creating gender equality is in the area of education. What, one of the things that we saw was a high level of dropout of, of females when you got to the secondary level. And usually because of the cost of secondary education, uh, many parents were uh, unwilling to get, or unable to bear the cost of that education, and usually the females tended to suffer in, in the choice uh, matrix of whether you go, f which of your children goes to school. And so when we came into office in 2017, we instituted a policy of free senior secondary education for all. And so we've done that for since 2017, and it has just been remarkable. You, you've had you know, hundreds of thousands of children who would otherwise not have had senior secondary school education now enrolled. But what is more important in this context is that you've had more girls enrolled than boys. And so whereas you had inequality or gender and parity within the, the school mix before, we now have virtual parity between boys and girls in secondary school enrollment. And, and that is very, very important uh, as you try to create a more gender, uh, I mean, um, parity, more gender parity in the society. I mean, recently, uh, that is last year, I think, one of our girls' schools won the World Robotics Competition, beating out, you know, countries such as Germany, South Korea, the United States. And, and we think that part of this is there's the opportunity because some of those girls having the free senior high school education would not have had all of that. And we expect to see that happening. Another area of, of getting inclusion is in the area of financial inclusion. Um, when you look at the data, you tended to see that most of the people who did not have access to bank accounts were female. And so what we have done is introduce, um, because most of them have mobile accounts, and we've introduced mobile money interoperability, which makes the bank account interoperable with the mobile account. Uh, and so with that interoperability, I mean, most people now, over 90, about 90% plus of the population, now have access to bank accounts. Mm -hmm. And that means more females mm -hmm. have <laughs> access to bank accounts than before. Then you have the whole area of maternal mortality and how you bring down maternal mortality by making sure that especially in the rural areas, people, mothers who are giving birth have access to critical black blood supplies during birth and, and all of that. Uh, Ghana, uh, following Rwanda, uh, has implemented a policy of drones to deliver medical supplies, vaccines, to very remote areas. And today, Ghana is the world's, the world's largest medical drone delivery. Uh, most people don't know that, but uh, that, is, that is where we are. And, and we have about six drone centers, and each day you have about 100 flights from each of the centers. And each flight is saving a life. 
and, and, and that is what, what you, you see in Ghana. Rwanda also has drones which are delivering uh, medical supplies. But this tells us, for me, that Africa can be in the lead. And the Caribbean can also, we can be in the lead when it comes to the technologies, you know, because we don't have legacy systems, and therefore we can really leapfrog uh, in many, many areas. And this is one area I think that we can all do that. But I think that the more we use technology to build an inclusive society, the more gender parity we create, and that is how we should proceed. Your Excellency Barmia, thank you very much for that. Thank you. Um, and so as I turn to Professor Nshuti to get your response, I just want to let you bring into context how this question came up for me. Um, I don't know if you were able to enjoy the festivities and celebrations of last night. Um, and I walked around the museum and I saw some of the exhibits. And one of the exhibits showed the market traders. And the wording on there was pointing out that economic development and economic financial management within families and within communities was managed by women. So, bring it forward. Why is it important for you to have women there again for, as we move forward? Uh, thank you very much. I think Can we have the microphone on, please, for, for Professor Nshuti? Can we try again? Uh, yes. I think for, for us as Africans, uh, gender mainstreaming, whatever you may call it, Sometimes we get lost in the premix. It's a right. A right of the ladies, women, to be part of us in the business, in the government. And I'll tell you what we did in Rwanda. About 20 years ago now, we made it a priority to the government. And right now, we have 60% of our women in the parliament. 67%. 50% are ministers in the cabinet. So, but this drone, the fact that, first of all, what percentage of women do we have in the population? 50%. On the continent, 50%. Why would you lock out this population in the economy, in the government? Because it's a productive force. And so we need to be in mind that locking out this force is bad economics in the first case. It's bad economics and bad politics. And it's the same, the same mindset I was talking to you shortly that we need to unlock this force to bring it in the mainstream to be productive. And of course, as my brother was talking about, this begins from the schools. I think the culture of Africa and that you promote boys was wrong. You promote both ladies, I mean girls and boys at the same time. And of course, whoever performed best later, that's something different the market will tell us. Number two, financial inclusion. Bring them on board early alone. The boy should not be given preference on the assets, financial or otherwise. Everybody should have access to those assets. It should not be gender sensitive. No, no, no. I think that's wrong. Once you do that, then we shall be at par in our economies. Locking 50% of the continent, be it Africa or Caribbean, out of the economy is bad economics. I start from there. Thank you. Professor Nishut, thank you very much indeed. Um, my final question that I will be throwing to you um, requires a one minute answer from each of you. So I will give you time to think about it before I go to the audience. My question is, we heard from the Prime Minister today saying um, it's time to start running. Um, I mean, is it a, is it a sprint? Is it, is it a marathon? That's what I want to know. And pair that with the fact that Senegal said that it's ready for a test phase. Uh, for, a, with a, for a country uh, in the Caribbean. Um, they've experienced growth trade in the country. So they basically have said, uh, Mamadou Hot said, he wants an African partner. So what would your pitch be to Senegal to say, hello, let's work together? So you've got one minute to answer that question. Um, in the meantime, could I go to the audience, please? Our first gentleman, if you could stand up, introduce yourself. And if it's to a particular um, uh, leader here on the stage, please specify that. Thank you very much. Is the microphone on? Can we just double check very quickly, please? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Shegun Ajay Kadri. I'm Director General of Manufacturers Association of Nigeria. 
and co-secretary Pan-African Manufacturers Association. It is quite refreshing uh, to see great demonstration of political will uh, by our leaders, uh, starting from September 2021, the CARICOM African uh, Business Forum that we had, and the political leaders were there, of course. So what I want to ask, what time should we start to create a platform that should allow some uniformity in terms of the incentives that are being given by different African countries? Some are saying you don't require visa to come to our country and so on and so forth. If we have differential incentives or differential policies to facilitate our interaction, we are not likely to gain depth uh, when we start implementation. And secondly, I think that platform should take on board facilitating the participation of the private sector or removing the binding constraints that in the first instance has limited our capacity to relate together, to trade amongst ourselves, and to prioritize the engagements that we have. Because we've realized we have shared destiny, and that together, going south-south is the way to fully realize our potential. So I think our political leadership ought to have a platform for maybe something like peer review, policy review, to ensure that they are not working at court purposes, but working in the same direction. I thank you. OK, thank you very much. Um, who would like to take that question? Unfortunately, I can only get uh, one answer, one response, because of time constraints. Who would like to take that question? When do we start? When should the flat platforms be ready? This question is pertinent when we think about the AFCFTA. Thank you very much. Right. Um, that's a very good question. Because if what we do today does not have any starting point or the platforms on which we can build then today will just be a ceremony that will not result in the fruits that we all hope that today's activity would result in. And I say that we have to start almost um, immediately working on it. I think a question was asked if this is a marathon or a sprint, but I think to some extent it can have components of both. Um, for example, in my country we have a citizenship by investment program. I don't think that our program has been leveled um, well enough to the African continent. It is leveled to other areas around the world, and actually there is an opportunity for that. But with respect to your question in terms of creating the platforms that can create more opportunities for us to work, I think that that needs to start almost immediately. Today, in my delegation, I brought the foreign minister, the minister of trade, my financial secretary, PS in the office of the prime minister, and my cabinet secretary, and also uh, representative or president of the Chamber of Commerce and Industry. And the reason why I brought along that delegation is that these are the main persons who can actually start to do exactly what you are speaking about, so that they can have first-hand um, knowledge, so that they can interact with the various persons. And I think that these relationships that we've been talking about, that if we can establish them on different levels, not just as the, at the hierarchy of the, the politics, but also on those functionaries are those persons who really get it done within the government, I think it can accelerate it. And this is really a demonstration of my country's commitment to make sure that we can accelerate something like this and for long-term benefits as well. Uh, Prime Minister, really thank you very much for that. Unfortunately, we, we've run out of time. I would have liked to have taken one more question, but just to come back to my final uh, question, to a strict, strict one-minute uh, pitch from you. Senegal is ready for a test phase for a country um, in the Caribbean. Amadou Hot said um, that they are ready. What would be your pitch to Senegal to say, yeah, I'm ready, let's do it. How would you sell your country? And I will start uh, from the end. Um, Honorable uh, Daru, please. Okay, thank One you. minute. Sure. Yeah, thank you once again. Um, of course, as we said earlier, that a lot has already been happening, that it's not a matter of reinventing the wheel. I think it's my Prime Minister from St. Kitts and Nevis, I think, who mentioned that um, medical schools, and I think Dominic Otto, we, we, we have a, a cadre of medical schools where I think 75-20% of the students are already African students. So, so the collaboration is there already. I think we now just have to get the the political elect um, directorate to now put things in place. Um, visa-free policy, for example. Um, a lot of these visa-frees, they do not have to go through the parliament. It's a simple cabinet decision um, that, can, that, that can be taken, an executive decision 
to, and I think we could start right here, visa free for the recipient group entertainers and, and etc. Okay. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Noted, duly noted. Uh, Professor Nshuti, one minute. <clears throat> well, thank you very much. Where do we start? I think we should start from here. I think that the fact that we have met was also very important, but I think this now should be periodic. Now, we met in Barbados, we need also to meet in Africa. So we bring our brothers from Caribbean to Africa to see the opportunities that we have in Africa. That's very important for us. And of course, once we know each other, as uh, Prime Minister Mbemis said, then we can know where to start, how to interact, trade between ourselves, uh, visit each other in terms of tourists. And I think from there, we should be able to build a block that is all uh, African. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Your Excellency Diaz, Senegal and Cuba, how sweet a relationship would that be? Well, <laughs> I, I will stress in two points. We need to put the entrepreneurs together. We need to create conditions for them to, to, to exchange views, to identify possibilities. Even in the crisis, you can identify possibilities. You have seen this with the COVID-19. Cuba developed vaccines. Cuba helped other countries with the medical uh, personnel. But I believe the entrepreneurs uh, need to be capable to identify the possibilities. Each country has its own advantages. I don't know, tourism or this or that. In, in November this year, from 14 to 18, we are going to celebrate the 38th edition of the International Trade Fair of Havana. This is a splendid possibility for entrepreneurs of all over the world, but especially from Caribbean and Africa, to be together in Cuba and uh, not only see what Cuba offers, but others offers. In those exchanges is when you uh, create the possibilities to do uh, Your, concrete things. Your Excellency, of course, yeah. Senegal is welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, uh, Your Excellency uh, Diaz, thank you for that. Um, Minister Ventador, how would you sell um, Martinique in one minute? Do you hear me? Yes. yes. We, yeah. uh, as I said before, the, the partnership. Uh, I wonder if you could use the microphone. Yeah, sorry. It's okay? Yes. yes. As I said before, the partnership uh, has already begun between Martinique and Senegal because of the culture and history with Cédar Senghor and Amy Césaire. And we are very, very interested in uh, have a strong partnership uh, because uh, our admi administration is working hard to be uh, able to welcome Senegal, but Senegal plus all the country around who want to come to Caribbean, who want to be one of the hub of Caribbean. French Caribbean is a small part of Caribbean, but <coughs> we are strong in terms of economy, politics, and culture, and Senegal could be a, a, a hub for all the uh, Middle West Africa. Okay. Minister Ventador, thank you very much indeed. And Ghana and Senegal, is, is that relationship right? Oh, very much so. I think the COVID-19 pandemic and the ensuing uh, vaccine apartheid that we saw in the world, you know, made it very clear that for us in, in developing countries, we have to build the capacity to manufacture our own vaccines uh, looking down the road. Senegal has a very uh, solid pharmaceutical industry. Uh, and like Ghana, Ghana, we are also in the process of establishing vaccine mass manufacturing capacity. And I, I believe that cooperation in this area, especially with the M mRNA technology in the area of malaria, for example, vaccines. I think this is where Ghana and, and Senegal need to cooperate. Okay, so an excellent example there of the AFCFTA yes. uh, coming into play, so another trade agreement. Uh, I turn now to Prime Minister Drew. Well, I'll, I'll wrap up by saying, one, that our country is, is well-educated, about 98%, so you have an educated workforce. Um, secondly, our country is accustomed to having um, um, persons from overseas coming to invest through our CBI program. We have the Sinkits Investment Agency, which is well poised to welcome um, new investments. And I think also because of some cultural links, which I've spoken about through the student exchange process that we have had, that of course give you some uh, familiarity 
um, with our people once you get there. So I would like to say that we have what it will take and the fertility, of course, to allow investments to um, flourish. So I want to say to you that St. Kitts Nevis is open to the world, open to investment, open to economic growth, and to establish mutual relationship that would be mutually um, um, beneficial to all. Promise to Drew, thank you very much indeed. And finally, uh, Shawanda Uhuru. I'm going to use your African name because yes. you'd like it to be used. Um, what would a relationship with Senegal mean to you? One minute. Well, uh, the relationships with Senegal and the relationships with all other types of African countries must be one of mutual benefit. And I think that um, to your question about whether it's a marathon or a sprint, the answer really is we have to move quickly and we cannot get weary and we have to keep moving. And uh, areas like tourism, I think is low hanging fruit. Um, I congratulate places like Ghana that has created Panafest, things like that, which creates, actually creates an opportunity for persons from the diaspora to come and to participate. And there are other areas uh, for tourism as well. And the multilateral organizations, okay, the African Union, the, um, the CARICOM, uh, the, those uh, statements that were made earlier about establishing closer relationships, those are really the right steps that we have to take. Um, and then we have to work out the details. And we establish relationships based on country strengths and based on the opportunities which present themselves. And whichever country has a particular strength, let's give them our support. And whichever country needs us to help to provide an opportunity, let's get together and work to provide those opportunities and all of us will benefit in the end. I think that's an actionable. Thank you very much indeed. Um, so just to uh, finally say, um, the Honourable Natalia Wheatley, Premier of the British Virgin Islands, thank you very much for your time. Also thank you to the Honourable Dr Terence Drew, Prime Minister of St Kitts and uh, Nevis. Uh, His Excellency, Dr. Mohamedou Bawamia, who is the Vice President of Ghana, thank you for your time today. Um, and also Minister Alexandre Ventador, Minister of Economic Development for Martinique. Also joining us today was His Excellency, Dr. Mr. Rodrigo Diaz, who is the Minister of Trade and Investment for the Republic of Cuba. Thank you. And Professor the Honourable Manasen Shuti, Minister of State in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs from Rwanda, and the Honourable Kenneth uh, Daru from uh, Dominica. Thank you very much for your time. I'm Lequesta Burak. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you very much for the presentation in the presidential panel. If you look at your program, you will see that the next presentation, which should have started at 12 o'clock, is now starting at 20 minutes after. It means that your lunch is going further and further away. So I'm going to ask the upcoming presenters to kindly keep a very tight timeline in making their presentations. I now invite Dr. Len Ishmael, the former ambassador of the Eastern Caribbean states to the Kingdom of Belgium and the European Union to make a presentation on Africa-Caribbean historical links and the opportunity the future offers in today's global context.
Ladies and gentlemen, good day and apologies. I know that we've had a very, very long morning, but I've been asked to take the stage and deliver the address that I was meant to deliver to you. Permit me the opportunity to congratulate the Prime Minister and Government of Barbados for hosting this remarkable conference and to thank the conference host for their generous hospitality. It is good to be back home and a special pleasure to add my voice of welcome to our African brothers and sisters. It is an honor to join you in conversation around this enormously important subject of the African-Caribbean relationship and its future particularly at this time. My view is that the relationship has been remarkably underinvested by both sides, a point which I elaborate in a report on the subject published in 2019. The conference is therefore timely, but even more so given the backdrop of global crises, first the COVID pandemic and now the untimely war in Europe against which this takes place. Ironically, this period of disorder and disruption holds the seeds for a better future for Africa and the Caribbean, provided we are ready to seize the lessons and the opportunities it provides. Global power is shifting, tilting from west to east, providing a change in geopolitical landscape and with it a wider menu of choice for countries of the global south. On both sides of the South Atlantic, Recent crises have laid quite bare our vulnerabilities, but they also provide opportunity to review and reconstruct a historically important relationship which has lost, over time, a lot of its luster and strategic focus. A change in course, of course, will require bold and courageous leadership and vision, which I strongly suspect we have started to see today. The ties between Africa and the Caribbean run deep. The concept of one people, one destiny is based on shared history, culture, and a sense of common identity. Starting in 1502, the triangular slave trade resulted in the forcible removal of more than 10 million Africans from Africa to the New World, catalyzing a new model of economic devol development and global trade based on the categorization of slaves as chattel and the application of their labor on agricultural plantations. Over the next 400 years, the slave trade contributed to creating large centers of African diaspora in the Caribbean, Latin America, the United States, and Europe. This common historical experience ins inspired formation of the Pan-African movement in the early 1900s led by the diaspora in the cities of the great colonial powers of those times. Paris, London, Manchester became natural hubs for the exchange of ideas, radical political thought, and exploration of socialist, Marxist, and communist ideology. Spanning several decades organized a common agenda of decolonization and racial equality this early period marked, perhaps, the most rich, vibrant, and dynamic period of African-Caribbean relations. A Trinidadian, Henry Williams, is credited with having coined the term Pan-African and organizing the first Pan-African Conference in London in 1900. In attendance were members of the diaspora also from, Afri also from America, including W.E.B. Du Bois, who would later become one of the founders of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People in 1909 in the United States. The group of early activists included the Caribbean's Aimé Cesar and Harold Moody, Nigeria's Ladipo Selenk and Nathaniel Fadipe. Trinidad's George Padmore and Jamaica's Marcus Garvey championed the cause of people of African descent in the United States. African leaders included Nairi Selassie, 
Nkrumah, Sankara, Mandela, Gaddafi, all championed the rights of Africans and an end to colonial rule. Caribbean leaders too played their part, the earliest of whom was Jean-Jacques Dessalines, the emperor of Haiti, who led the slave rebellion that would establish the world's first independent state of African descendants on January 1st, 1804. Much later on, Eric Williams' pioneering work, Capitalism and Slavery, which he wrote in 1944, made him the target of quite a smear campaign by American operatives when he first entered the politics of Trinidad and Tobago. In the 1970s, Jamaica, Jamaica's Michael Manley pushed the boundaries of newly won independence by seeking to loose, loosen the grip of former colonial powers and their multinational corporations on the resources of these new states to increase the revenues available for nation building, pushing a more socialist path to development. Both his leadership, as we know, and the Jamaican economy paid the price for so doing. And of course, his friendship with Fidel Castro in neighboring Cuba uh, certainly did not help. The struggle for independence and racial equality was vividly chronicled in the works of notable scholars, including Walter Rodney of Guyana. His books, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa and Grounding with My Brothers, published at the height of the Black Power Movement of the late 1960s and 70s, were witness to the mood of the times. Trinidad, CLR James, George Lamin of Barbados, Derek Walcott of St. Lucia, Franz Fanon of Martinique, were all pan-Africanists engaged in the radical political discourse of liberation and equality. This spirit of consciousness and resistance was also captured in the rich tapestries of Caribbean and African dance, music, theater, express, all expressed in the region's cultures. The Rastafarian movement established in Jamaica in the 1930s was at once an expression of resistance to imperialism and a celebration of African roots and culture. Jamaica's Bob Marley re remains the most celebrated symbol of the Rastafarian movement. His lyrics, together stand up, stand up for your rights, don't give up the fight, became an anthem of sorts, denoting black pride and resistance, as did the music of South Africa's Lucky Dope, urging newly independent states in Africa to guard against the hard-won independence being appropriated by puppeteers in his refrain of a Mickey Mouse independence. As it was, the big struggles of the day, the civil rights movement, the black power movement, the fight for independence, an end to apartheid, all sprung from the same well and were mutually reinforcing. The Pan-African Movement's Atlantic Charter unified responses to colonialism, not only in Africa and the Caribbean, but also in Asia, establishing the foundations for the non-aligned movement, the organization of African unity, and contributing to an end of apartheid in South Africa in 1994. And where are we today? Today, Caribbean and African countries engage with, with each other through multiple points of contact in multilateral fora, including the G77 and China, the non-aligned movement, the African, Caribbean, and Pacific group of countries, the World Trade Organization, and others. They cooperate regionally through the mechanisms of the African Union and the Caribbean community, through which a number of in important initiatives, especially those related to the diaspora, have been concluded, but in which concerted action is still needed. Of course, they also cooperate bilaterally through diplomatic relations and associated memoranda. Despite these multiple points of interaction and contact, or perhaps because of these, the relationship between Africa and the Caribbean has become more diffuse, less secure, less solid. The historical achievements won through joint efforts, instead of leading to greater and more significant engagement, have failed to do so. Indeed, from time to time, both sides have felt that others have breached expectations of solidarity. Within the ACP, for decades, both sides missed opportunities to expand and deepen business, commerce, trade, and investment, and cultural exchanges between them, choosing instead to focus on building the relationship with the EU, leaving the African-Caribbean relationship to mostly fend for itself. It did not help that the majority of the ACP's 
79 leaders usually fail to attend ACP summits of heads of state, though the AU and CARI forum meetings with the EU were normally fully subscribed. There were few initiatives in the making, flows across the South Atlantic of legal trade investments, people-to-people -people contact and cooperation uh, remain minuscule. And I think, of course, we've been chatting about that all morning. In a conference on security held in Miami in November 2019, hosted by the German Marshall Fund of the United States, it was illustrative that the Latin American, Caribbean, and West African security officials brought together for that meeting, for example, all in the business of stemming illegal flows across the South Atlantic, had no previous institutional knowledge or contact with each other. As we, e re as we imagine the future of this relationship, current events provide an important moment for stock taking. Like the COVID-19 pandemic before it, the war in Europe is disproportionately affecting the world's poorest and most vulnerable countries, all of whom are in the global south. Despite early calls for a swift end, now in its seventh month, the war grinds on. Instead of peace, war has been fueled as political and military objectives in Ukraine and other places expand and change. In the meantime, soaring food and energy prices, crippling sovereign debt, already high during the pandemic when developing countries were encouraged to borrow their way towards recovery, spell disasters for many. Zambia was the first country to default on its sovereign debt, followed by Lebanon, Sri Lanka, Russia, and now Suriname. The World Bank has identified 12 countries as debt distressed. All are in the global south. Over 160 million people were pushed back into poverty as a result of the pandemic. Many of them are in Africa. And UNDP has estimated that 71 million people were pushed back into poverty during the first three months of this year, of this war. Agenda 2030's sustainable development goals are unattainable for many, and vital progress already made in both of our regions is being rolled back. And after two years of rather painful economic contraction, 2022, was to be the year of global recovery. Instead, the global economic outlook has contracted, moving from 6.1% last year to 3.2% this year. And next year, the, out, the, the forecast is equally gloomy. The much-touted instruments to support our countries in servicing their debt, such as the World Bank's Debt Service Suspension Initiative, have provided just a mere fraction of what is needed. Borrowing costs have increased and capital flight from many countries has increased volatility, depressing the value of all local currencies. One needs only to look at recent events in Sri Lanka to understand how vulnerable all developing countries are. The war, the war as well has exposed duplicity in standards in several areas which should concern us, including, for example, in the welcoming laid out to refugees depending on their race and origins. The very countries which are asking the developing world to pick a side are fueling a war which is causing irreparable damage to social and economic conditions in the South. This is not to deny the horrific nature of events in Ukraine and the plight of her people. But how can continuing this war be in the interest of the global South? Examination of the way in which countries have voted at the UN General Assembly with respect to resolutions deploring Russia's invasion of Ukraine is reflective of the varying interest at stake. While many countries voted in favor, those who have not or have abstained, including US allies, interestingly, Saudi Arabia and Israel, represent more than half of the world's population and are all mostly from the global south. The war and its implications spill over to various other theaters as well. Indonesia, as chair of the G20, has resisted Western pressure to exclude the Russian president from the G20 Bali summit in November, expressing instead the view that the war is not in the interest of the world and calling for peace and conditions of political stability to rekindle global economic activity. 
Indeed, only half of the G20 countries, Australia, Japan, Canada, the USA, the UK, and the EU bloc, have imposed penalties on Russia. The other half, Argentina, Brazil, Mexico, South Africa, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, India, Indonesia, China, have not, deepening the divide between the North and the South. Turkey is using geography and South power to expand its own influence, shuttling diplomacy between the warring par parties and brokering the deal allowing Ukraine's grain safe passage through the Bosphorus to ease the food crisis affecting all of us, and yet agreeing to NATO's expansion to include Finland and Sweden on one condition, that certain persons are extradited to face terrorism charges in Istanbul. India continues to buy oil from Russia, despite significant pressure to curtail purchases. But Russia has been a longtime friend in shoring up India's defense capabilities in a rather volatile neighborhood. And India has its own interests at stake. The warm reception accorded to Russia's, for Russia's foreign minister during his recent tour of Africa was also instructive. All countries, from the north and the south, are acting in their own interest. Alliances are no longer merely based on traditional ties. Global power is changing, bringing with it a wider range of options, and these are being exercised by all. China, of course, remains the elephant in the room. The country is the first and second trading partner of more countries than the United States. The depth and reach of its global influence, including in Europe, is enormous. The objective of an impoverished, isolated Russia as a consequence of this war allows the US and allies to operationalize the so-called so strategic pivot to the Pacific and China. An isolated Russia is therefore not in China's interest. Both China and Russia speak of a strategic relationship driven by a complex set of shared interest including that of a multipolar world in which world power is shared. And the Chinese have been masterful at using crisis to incre increase their own global influence. They use the financial crisis of 2009 to purchase assets across Europe and the pandemic to engage in health diplomacy across the world. They are carefully studying the lessons of this war and the weaponization of economic policy in the deployment of sanctions to determine how they too may shore up areas of vulnerability and protect their own interest. Fear of being cut off from global financial systems is a very real one for many developing countries, certainly for this region as well as for Africa. China is no exception. The Chinese are quietly promoting the use of their own cross-border payment facility as an alternative to SWIFT. Payment of trade deals is being facilitated using local currency, bypassing the US dollar. Work is progressing towards the use of the Chinese currency as an international reserve. These initiatives are not without their challenges, but they provide important alternatives which will grow over time. And Africa and the Caribbean need to be doing the same. We can either continue to ex ac accept exposure and vulnerability, be policy takers, not policy makers, or we can put lessons from recent experiences to work in order to increase collective resilience to all future shocks. The report which I cited previously on African Caribbean relations presents several ideas with respect of deeper engagement across a wide range of theaters and issues, which do not need to be repeated here. However, as we get into the closing moments of of my address this morning. Um, allow me just a few observations. The first, the relationship between Africa and the Caribbean needs to be placed on a more secure footing. Regular summits between Caribbean and African leaders are not the norm, yet high-level summits around strategic agendas aimed at influence and policy and debate on the global stage should send a would send a powerful political signal with respect to the value of the relationship to three important constituents, African and Caribbean citizens, the diaspora, and the world. Second, the African-Caribbean relationship and its goals should be reviewed through wider strategic lens. More than 60 years ago, 
in an entirely different era, with far less resources, Caribbean and African countries joined others as members of the non-aligned movement. NAM's early successes were many. NAM also provided one of the earliest examples of South-South cooperation and a framework within which China, one of the world's poorest countries at the time, provided the financial and human resources to build Tanzania's first railroad in 1972. Tanzania had first been turned down by the United States and by the World Bank before turning to China. Fifty years later, China is a global actor. Just a few days ago, the country canceled 23 interest-free loans for 17 African countries valued at $113 million. The country had previously canceled $3.4 billion and restructured $15 billion in loans for African countries between the year 2000 and 2019. So prospects for South-South cooperation loom large but they need to be catalyzed. And again, we've been speaking about this this morning. What does the African-Caribbean relationship stand for today? What are its strategic objectives, its agenda? What interests need to be promoted, projected? In the global arena of shifting power, what new alliances are emerging? How can these be optimized? How do we balance and accommodate competing interests? What is our grand strategy as Africa and the Caribbean? We have between us fine universities and think tanks, which can and should be tasked with considering our collective future. And third, the economic assets of the global south are increasing. OECD reports indicate that developing countries are set to account for nearly 60% of all global economic activity by 2030. By 2050, Africa will have the world's largest population and youngest workforce of more than 850 million, a growing middle class of more than 600 million. The continent holds much of the world's stock of raw materials. The COVID-19 pandemic and the war have underscored vulnerabilities to supply chain disruptions, capital flight, energy and food insecurities, and more. How can the growing stock of wealth and resources be organized among and between our regions and among and between the global south to hedge against future shocks. Which strategic goods need to be produced closer to our markets? South America and Africa, for example, are both agricultural powerhouses. Morocco possesses some of the world's largest deposits of raw materials used in fertilizers. Are the seeds not there for a viable commercial endeavor across the southern Atlantic. The Global South are also energy producers. We have land, raw materials, and labor. Capital sometimes is in short supply. Might this not be the time for us to review our investment strategies and resurrect former President Lula's call for an investment bank of the South, which is why the signing which we witnessed here this morning was so much a step in the right direction for all of us. And fourth, coming to the end, the diaspora residing in the cities of great power who engage in policies at times unfavorable to African and Caribbean interests should be a political force in these centers lobbying on behalf of the regions, the interests of our regions. The issues pertaining to de-risking and compliance in tax jurisdictions come readily to mind as just one of the examples of where intervention would be helpful but capitals will need to engage their diaspora much more effectively and differently. More emphasis has been placed by Caribbean political machineries, for example, in ensuring that our diaspora return home to vote in national elections than exploiting the force of their voice in the capitals in which they live. The immense influence of the Jewish lobby in American politics is a powerful lesson in this regard. And finally, our regions are both prone to reacting to crises and events rather than moving proactively in tabling and protecting our interests and seizing opportunities. In the EU-ACP relationship, this was certainly the case, and I can speak to that because I was ambassador of the Committee of, I was president of the Committee of Ambassadors. We used to think in short rather than long term. There is a sense, perhaps, that political expediency requires this, and that might be so. 
but the lack of a proactive approach to the future results in continuous cycles of crisis management, which we can ill afford. And to conclude, the future of Caribbean African relations, we know this, is one ripe with potential and promise, but it requires the investments of time, attention, and political will, which we hear there is plenty of this morning, to transform the relationship into one fit for purpose and suitable for these modern times. The current relationship characterized by encounters and actions which are rather fragmented, rather than being part of a wider approach to systemic relationship building, makes for a relationship which is neither solid nor reliable, and we can change this. In every multilateral group and within which African and Caribbean states participate, our shared numbers render us an important bloc and influential coalition partner. This reality could be leveraged by Africa and the Caribbean in engaging on multiple fronts in shaping and influencing the theaters within which their interests are being debated, aided by a much more politicized diaspora. It is far better to secure the future rather than be captured by it. Africa, the Caribbean, and the diaspora will benefit from any such pooling of sovereignty, resolve, and purpose. The spirit of the Pan-African movement and the strength of the past relationship would suggest it. And ladies and gentlemen, surely the future demands it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ishmael, for your presentation. The next presenter is Ms. Pamela Coke Hamilton, Executive Director of the International Trade Center. Ms. Coke Hamilton. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I know you know you're like one second away from falling apart um, because <laughs> you must be starving. <laughs> but uh, let me just start with something that I think is, is will at least wake you up. Just step down, but you know, let me let me at least do what they told me to do. See, I've woken you up, right? I know you're starving, and so am I. I haven't eaten since yesterday, so uh, let's try to get this out of the way quickly. And uh, you know, all protocols observed from this morning. I think it's the longest set of protocols I've ever heard. <laughs> Um, but clearly it is such a, a historic moment. I think it was more than uh, necessary to ensure that we, we, uh, we show who was here and how important this has been. So I'm delighted really to be here this, morning, this afternoon <laughs> to deliver the opening statement to launch the first ever report on expanding African Caribbean trade at the first Afro Caribbean Trade and Investment Forum. And I'd like to thank Afrix in Bank, Invest Barbados, and Export Barbados for inviting ITC to partner on this timely and vital event. So let me give you two stories, five messages, and a way forward in only a few minutes, as I know it's been a long morning of speeches. The first story is, last year I stood at the gate of no return, looking out at the Atlantic Sea from the Cape Coast slave castle in Ghana. It's an experience that was life-changing and one that I'll never forget. 
And I remember looking at the inscriptions about those that had survived the awful slave dungeons and transatlantic crossing, my own ancestors, Nigerian as it turns out when I did my DNA testing right after my return. Yeah, I'm 48% Nigerian. That explains a lot, I'm Jamaican, so you know, <laughs> it's not a hard shift. Um, <laughs> And that visit confirmed my view, my very passionate view, that we always have to be focused on making trade a positive force for good, a force that unites countries and continents, bringing prosperity to ordinary people. The second story is about music. The first song I ever memorized completely without being forced to do so by my parents was Redemption Song by Bob Marley. And I heard in that the inspiration of Marcus Garvey and his vision of linking Africa and the Americas. It touched our souls in a way that reverberates to this day, as you just realized, because everybody was singing and aware of it. And it's a vision of not just redemption and freedom, but also redemption and freedom through international trade. How do we reverse the bad trade that was done and make it good trade? Is a vision, of course, inspired a generation of Pan-Africanists on both sides of the Atlantic. It gave the Black Star at the center of Ghana's flag and the push to create the first institutions dedicated to the integration of Africa. This is why I'm so excited to be here today and launching an ITC report on the export potential of trade between Africa and the Caribbean. As far as my research team tells me, this is the first of its kind that has been done at such a detailed level. The figures we estimated across goods and services are pretty startling. With the right actions and networks, African-Caribbean trade could reach up to one billion US dollars. Africa could boost its annual exports to the Caribbean by 171 million dollars year over year by 2026. And this is more than 50% increase over last year's export levels. The Caribbean could also expand exports to Africa by 80 million year over year, equivalent to increasing our exports by almost a third. I really encourage you to read the report in full. I believe we have available at our stand. But in the meantime, let me highlight five key messages from the report. First, something that will not surprise anyone here, goods trade between Africa and the Caribbean is currently negligible and heavily concentrated in a handful of goods and, and countries. Not even 0.1% of African exports headed to the Caribbean nations in 2020, while the continent bought less than 1% of Caribbean exports. Almost 70% of Africa's exports to the Caribbean are primary minerals, and more than 40% of Caribbean exports to Africa are chemicals. A second conclusion, again, nothing surprising for those that have been trading in both regions over the years. High market access costs continue to hinder trade integration. The absence of a free trade agreement between African and Caribbean countries means tariffs in certain sectors reach a high of 28%. Non-tariff costs are also very high. Transport infrastructure, as was alluded to earlier this morning by many speakers, between key markets just isn't there and traders struggle to comply with regulatory requirements in the partner markets because of delays, fees, testing requirements, and credit checks. It's easy to focus on the challenges, so let's move to the upside. The third message is that exports of agricultural goods, fertilizers, and health products have significant growth potential. Africa's ag agribusiness sector holds $53 million in export growth potential to the Caribbean, most of it in fish, kidney beans, and vegetables. Strengthening international agri-food value chains is one of the best ways to address the growing concerns about food security. The Caribbean has $11 million of potential to tap into across life-saving healthcare and pharmaceutical products, which many of which are hard to obtain in Africa. A fourth and equally uplifting message, the opportunities from increased goods trade are widespread. 27 African countries have an export growth potential of over 100,000 or more across products ranging from sardines to cars. 15 Caribbean countries could increase goods export to Africa on a similar scale, including for some of our flagship products like rum. Fifth, and in my view the most important, services exports offer huge opportunities. The Caribbean has the potential to export services worth a half a billion dollars to Africa, double the value of possible goods exports. 
Tourism accounts for almost half of the region's export potential in services to Africa, followed by transport and also, very importantly, the creative industries. So there's the outcome of our analytical work. It clearly shows that the potential for increased and diversified trade between Africa and the Caribbean is massive. And it's a potential that we have to exploit. The triple C crisis of COVID-19, conflict, and climate change have highlighted more than ever the need for economies to diversify their trading partners. Given the shared history of Africa and the Caribbean, as the two regions search for new suppliers of markets, it only makes sense to first focus on one another. The million dollar question then is, how can the one billion dollar export potential be realized? Both regions could unlock about half of the untapped potential by tackling trade barriers such as informational or regulatory bottlenecks and challenges involving transport and logistics. So I'm really excited to hear about the direct um, you know, flights that will take place soon. Um, and I think the CPSO is here, so they'll be helping to pay for that. <laughs> Just saying. And I think it's very important that we really solve the logistics because that will open doors that we cannot imagine. Full implementation of the landmark African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement will also go a long way to resolving these obstacles within Africa. Because once we get in, the movement within Africa will then be facilitated and make it much easier to trade. Unlocking the remainder, which is linked to economic growth, population growth, and expected tariff changes requires investment. This only strengthens the business case for the AFCFTA. So achieving the $1 billion export potential will also require more engagement, transparency, and experience sharing from both governments and the private sector. IDC has been working on South-South trade pro promotion for almost 60 years. In our experience, the first step is to create an ecosystem that can overcome initial misperceptions about risk, market size, and cost, and highlight market opportunities. This means that cross-regional business and investment linkages need to be forged. The organization of this first ever Afro-Caribbean Trade and Investment Forum is a brilliant first step. And I want to commend once again the organizers for making this happen and the visionaries for bringing it together. I hope that this forum will become a standing one and encourage traders and investors to maintain regular contact and transactions between these big meetings. The decision to establish a new Africa-Caribbean Business Council, and I see both uh, my colleagues from CPSO and the Afro-Caribbean, uh, sorry, African Business Council, I'm already talking about it as if it exists, um, and also with Afrex in Bank, and we want to be able to help in providing a framework for this through promoting increased business connections between the two regions. I do hope it leads to more trade fairs, more B2B meetings, and eventually signed contracts. So let me conclude, and this is a real conclusion, let me conclude by reassuring my African and Caribbean family that IDC is here to work with you to help you realize the $1 billion potential and more. Since taking office as executive director, I've been working hard to build linkages between ITC's programs in the African continent and the Caribbean. I'm thrilled to be signing an MOU with President Orama of Afrix in Bank today. This is only the beginning of a progressive journey to transform transatlantic, transatlantic trade forever, to heal the pain of our ancestors, to realize the vision of Marcus Garvey, and to transform trade and investment between Africa and the Caribbean. I thank you. Expanding African Caribbean trade. African Caribbean trade flows are currently less than 1% of their total trade in each direction. New partnerships are needed to tackle the economic consequences of global crises. The International Trade Center estimates over $1 billion of two-way trade potential between these regions over the next five years. We estimate that African goods exports to the Caribbean could increase by more than 50% and Caribbean goods exports by almost 30%. The Caribbean has the most export potential in travel, transport and business services. They also have potential to supply Africa with more health-related products. Africa holds more than one-third of its untapped trade potential to the Caribbean in agribusiness and fertilizers. 
its automotive sector also holds great trade potential. The key to unlocking the South-South trade? Address trade barriers, channel investments into growth sectors, and work with small businesses. This is where the International Trade Center, Afrex and Bank, and other partners are joining forces to make it happen. To learn more, see our study, Expanding African-Caribbean Trade. I now invite Ms. Kanayo Awani, Executive Vice President at Frixim Bank, His Excellency Albert Muchanga, Commissioner for Trade, Industry, Tourism and Minerals at the African Union, and Dr. Amani Asfor, President of the African Business Council, to join Ms. Coke Hamilton on stage for the presentation of the report. Patrick Antoine, can you please join the persons on stage? Thank you. Dr. Antoine is president of the Caribbean Private Sector Organization Association. Thank you. It, but it's time for lunch. Lunch? No? No lunch? Oh, there is one signing. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon. Uh, excellencies, at this stage I'd like to call uh, the Executive Vice President of FXM Bank, Madame Kanayo Awani, His Excellency Ambassador Albert Muchanga, the Commissioner from the African Union Commission, Dr. Amani Asfour, and Dr. Peter Antonet from the Caribbean Private Sector Organization onto the stage uh, to witness the signing, and the Egyptian Ambassador as well, please. Sir. If you could join us on the stage to witness the signing of an MOU which will facilitate the establishment of the Africa Caribbean Business Council. Thank you.
So now it's really time for lunch. Lunch is served in the tented area. You go through the lobby and just outside and turn left and lunch is served under the tent. And we want to have you back here at 2.30. We begin at 2.30 and you don't want to miss the next session after lunch with Alhaji Aliki Dangote. 2.30. 2.45 then, 2.45, so you have 30 minutes for lunch. Be good, thank you. Our panel is ready to begin the session on accelerating industrialization and manufacturing in Africa and the Caribbean through special economic zones and industrial parks. Please welcome the moderator, Mr. Omar Ben Yedder, publisher of IC Publications, and his invited panelists. This is ben. Thank you, good afternoon everyone. It's great to be here. Uh, the next session is gonna be on special economic zones and industrial parks. Uh, we've got a fantastic uh, esteemed panelists here with me and uh, we're gonna talk about how industrial parks and special economic zones, industrial parks and special economic zones can be an engine for growth. That's better. But uh, before the uh, start of the panel, we've got a keynote address by the Honorable Betty Miner, who's the Cabinet Secretary at the Ministry of Industrialization, Trend and Enterprise Development of the Republic of Kenya. Your Excellency. A round of applause, please. Thank you. Right, thank you very much, and good, good afternoon, everybody, and I hope you're all having a good time right here in um, Bridgetown. Uh, it's really a joy uh, to be here, and, uh, and a great conversation uh, to be having on uh, the relationship and uh, growing and deepening uh, the relationship between Africa uh, and the Caribbean. We are aware that the world has been experiencing great disruption and uh, business risks not seen in generation. We have seen very, very turbulent uh, past two years with the pandemic, as well as with the climate and uh, food security uh, crisis. And we are now having this conversation as we all recover from, uh, from COVID and to try and seek to build back a lot stronger going uh, forward. Global value chains have become a dominant feature of world trade and investment, mainly because the process of producing goods from raw materials to finished products is increasingly fragmented and carried out wherever the necessary skills and materials are available at competitive cost and quality. Africa has several multiple overlapping regional economic blocks, with Kenya belonging to the East African Community, the ESC, the Common Market for Eastern and Southern Africa, COMESA, and the more comprehensive tripartite free trade area that comprises the ESC, COMESA, and the Southern African Development Community. Regionalization has opened up and widened trade for the participating economies. Therefore, the Africa Continental Free Trade Area, which we have signed on to, was really mooted by the African heads of state and governments to deepen integration and opportunities for economic growth across the continent. 
the ESC, COMESA, and SADC member and partner states represent 53% of the African Union membership and constitute more than 1.4 trillion in uh, gross domestic product, which translates to about 60% of the continent's GDP and a combined estimated population of 800 million. The tripartite free trade area is an essential building block for implementing the Africa continental free trade area, potentially uniting all the 55 African Union member states and covers more than 1.3 uh, 0.3 billion people. The CFTA is one of the flagship projects of Agenda 2063, which is the Africa we want, aimed at realizing industrialization across the continent. This ambitious trade pact has a comprehensive scope focusing on Africa's economy, with protocols such as digital trade and investment protection to support the industrialization agenda while diversifying trade and investment across the continent. These have been given impetus by the challenges that we faced with COVID-19. And we look to build up the capacity of African continent to trade with each other. By eliminating barriers to trade in Africa, the CFTA aims to significantly boost intra-African trade, mainly trade in value-added production and across all sectors of Africa's economy. We have identified several sectors under the CFTA, which is agriculture and agro-processing, automotive, pharmaceuticals and transportation and logistics, which is really uh, based on what, uh, what are the import substitution we're starting to do uh, in Africa. Therefore, as we build up our continental trading arrangements, and as we build up and deepen trade within Africa, and as we now begin to engage with ourselves in, uh, in the Caribbean, I think it is important to begin to walk this journey with a great focus on building up the necessary industrial capacity in both our region uh, to grow. And the concept and the work around special economic zones and industrial parks gives us an opportunity for targeted uh, investment where, and, and, and spaces where small and large companies in any of our regions can participate, not just in the region of value chains, but in the global value chains, by engaging in all the many different activities in a very, very coordinated manner and working to boost capacities across different countries from the con conception stage, production stage, and even to the end. These activities could build on the activities that exist in our region, but with a focus on not just the market in the Caribbean, but also our global market. Many countries are using the special economic zones and industrial zones programs to build up and, and to be able to set up the necessary investment environment with favorable opportunities and good management to achieve their fundamental uh, goals of creating employment and increasing uh, external earnings. Our country has used the Special Economic uh, Zones Program, both driven by the public sector as well as the private sector, to build up its stock of industrial uh, infrastructure. And it is our belief that I mean, many other countries in Africa are doing the same. And together, we can work on common branding and common production where we can actually enjoy the brand made in Africa. And in this case, we could probably say made in Africa in the Caribbean, and I'm sure the marketing people will be able to assist us in language and in branding that demonstrate the shared ownership and origin of the products that we'd like to trade uh, together. In order to realize such focused industrial infrastructure, governments will have to invest in the necessary infrastructure, and they will also have to en uh, engage in the necessary market creation, both through both within the region and elsewhere, but the trade agreements and the market agreements we generate are, are going to be the necessary incentive for the investment that we require in this uh, special economic zone. So as I conclude, 
we have an opportunity working collaboratively through the continent and with the Caribbean to boost production together and to enhance and to ensure that we are consuming more of the goods that are produced in our regions rather than being net importers. Let us walk this journey, let us create the frameworks that will enable the private sector and, uh, and all our separate investors to build up and get to know each other, build up new relationships, but more importantly, produce for our continent, for these islands, and for the rest of the world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you, Minister. So uh, one thing that has not gone unnoticed as well as the SCFTA is your wonderful, uh, wonderful dress, which uh, the colours of Barbados and the colours of this summit. So uh, I don't know whether that was intentional, but it's uh, it's worked uh, marvels. Um, so yes, I'd like to call on my uh, on my panelists. We'll start with Mr. Rene Awambeng. I think you all know him from the AfriExim Bank, Global Head of Client Relations. Rene, round of applause, please. Um, then we'll go to uh, Ms. Yanis Williams, Senior Director of Legal Services at the Jamaica Special Economic Zone. Marie Camille, uh, Secretary General of the Caro Center. Dr. Amani Asford, President of the African Business Council, who you may also know. And I believe we've got, uh, is it Mr. Alain Sar Saraka? No? Ah, Dr. Patrick Antoine, sorry, Chief Executive Officer and Technical Director of the CARICOM Private Sector Organization. <clears throat> Look, I think the thesis in terms of... Alain Sarakara is here. Okay, brilliant. That's fantastic news. Excellent. So I think the thesis in terms of special economic zones, industrialization, and uh, the necessity to uh, accelerate uh, value addition on the continent, and I take it on the Caribbean. My expertise is more on the continent. Uh, we've seen the example of the uh, South, uh, Southeast Asian nations that uh, really took off with an export-led uh, development model based around uh, special economic zones. We saw that in China as well. And, uh, and really what, what I'd like to know today is I'd like to understand the utility and whether there's a... Uh, whether, they're still, whether it's still a valid model, and ultimately, if, it's, it is, if it is a valid model, and I think you all believe us because you, uh, you invest and you work in, uh, in, in these zones, if it is a valid model, how do we make them work, and how do we accelerate investment, and, uh, and how do we make them a success? And I think we've got a few success stories that we can uh, learn from today. So, um, and ultimately, there's uh, two important developments, I take it. One is what the minister has just, uh, talk to us about, which is the AFCFTA, and really it's about uh, how do we make it work and uh, how do we uh, take advantage of this opportunity. And the second uh, big shift that we're seeing globally, I take it, is uh, the geopolitical shifts and uh, the economic shifts. So I think for the past 30 or 40 years, we went to a just-in-time uh, model of uh, producing, and now it's more of a uh, just-in-case so uh, we need to make sure that uh, we own our, uh, or we control our value chains and, uh, and that uh, we're not put at the back of the queue and we know what that means. So, uh, so yeah, as well as a geopolitical shift in terms of uh, Ukraine, China, et cetera, et cetera. I think uh, one lesson that we've learned is us in Africa, and I'm sure the Caribbean as well, we're friends of everyone, enemies of no one. So uh, we don't want to get involved in those geopolitics. We're here to, uh, to support and bring solutions uh, not problems to uh, to the world. First of all, uh, Rene, please convince me about uh, the utility today of special economic zones. The reason I'm saying this actually is because what we're seeing is obviously with people talking about the fourth industrial Re revolution, we're talking about robotics, we're talking about uh, robots and automation taking over, uh, taking over uh, light manufacturing. And, uh, and we're seeing the Chinese and the, uh, and the Asians move from special economic zone to smart zones focusing on uh, the future economies. So you tell me a little bit about what the bank has done in terms of special economic zones, why you guys still believe in them, and, uh, and why they're a uh, business model for, uh, for the future. No, thank you very much, Omar. I think at the African Export Import Bank, we don't believe that anyone needs convincing. Uh, the global manufacturing output 
is estimated at about $500 billion. Africa's contribution is just under 2% uh, from Egypt, Morocco, South Africa, and Nigeria. And at the same time, <clears throat> we are exporting over 70% of all our commodities and raw materials unprocessed. So it is very natural that we need to contribute, we need to transform, we need to manufacture on the continent for our own economic development. And we can only do that by investing in the infrastructure of special economic zones and industrial parks. The bank has been doing an incredible job working with our partner governments and corporates in Africa in developing special economic zones and industrial parks. We have examples in Gabon. Uh, we've just signed agreements in Benin. We're working with the government of Cote d'Ivoire. We're working with Togo, working with Egypt, we're working with Malawi uh, to develop these special economic zones. We do believe that by improving the infrastructure, both the hard and the soft infrastructure, the logistics. And I can illustrate uh, the connection with the Caribbean. Why don't we build special economic zones around West Africa in Senegal, transport to Barbados, which is a transshipment hub, and sell to the markets of Latin America and North America. We take advantage of the Continental Free Trade Agreement. We take advantage of our brothers and sisters in the Caribbean have, that have a strategic geographic position to attack a market that is more than one billion people. Thank you very much. So I really don't need to convince you about the importance, the critical mass of developing special economic zones and industrial parts. Alain, if you don't mind, I'd like to, uh, to go to you, given that I followed the Arise story over the past, uh, well, I don't know if it's a decade, maybe a little bit less than a decade, but obviously we've seen success in Gabon that you're replicating in, uh, in certain countries. But what I'd like to look at is uh, how you're developing your economic zones and in terms of the, uh, the value chain and, uh, and what, I mean, uh, Rene has just mentioned what we could be doing with, uh, with Barbados, but uh, how do you see uh, that international cooperation as well in terms of what you guys are doing? Thank you for the, for, for the question. Like you mentioned, actually, uh, Arise has developed its first industrial zone in, in Gabon. And uh, the, the idea is to figure what, what is the industrial, industrial program of the, of the country. We collaborate with countries, actually we serve countries. And uh, we help them to you know, progress from uh, exporting the raw materials uh, to uh, a, a, an industrialized economy where the real value is. And basically, we, we learned some lessons from, from Gabon. You know that Gabon was an oil-rich country and was mostly uh, uh, the revenue from the country was coming from the export of, of crude oil. Uh, and uh, even the, the refining of the, of the crude oil was not correctly done in, in the country. And Gabon, at some point, uh, after the, cri the, cr the, the, the crisis of uh, in 2000, uh, 2008, and they decided to diverse, diversify the economy uh, away from, from, from oil only. And uh, is, so this is how we, we, we decided, we figured that there's a lot of food in Gabon, we can actually convert the economy, the Gabonese economy from a, 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 a total oil uh, exporting economy to an economy that is, you know, producing locally some, some wood. And we negotiate with the government and we, we I mean, we establish the condition to, to, to gradually progress toward a, 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 an economy in Gabon, which will lead the, the processing of wood in, uh, in, in Africa and globally. So after, it's been 10 years that we've been operating this industrial zone uh, today. And uh, I mean, Gabon is ranking 
today uh, as a, the first, the, the, the first uh, African producer of, of, of vinyl and, uh, and the second global uh, producer of, of plywood. So this is a kind of added value that you know, the industrial zone can bring. And we are, like you said, we are duplicating that across Africa now. We are today working with uh, Togo and Benin. And we are doing the same thing. We discussed with the government. We identify the commodities, you know, that can be uh, industrialized at, at large scale, and we, we structure the, the 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 I mean the the, the, the project, and we, we work with banks to to, to, to to put in place the, to put in place the financing. And like you say, the value chain is very very critical. Actually, uh, identifying the commodities, negotiating with the government to ensure that. The industrials that will settle in our industrial zone have uh, security of, of, of uh, uh, commodity supply. Okay, and uh, would you say that what would you say with the success of uh, of Gabon was, and uh, in terms of uh, what you're doing in Benin as well? So, uh, because ultimately, success, success, successful SEZs have been the results of fully integrated strategy with the necessary market linkages and obviously uh, policy, infrastructure, human capital, regulation. So uh, has it, I mean, the success, would you put it down to, uh, to the policy makers and working hand in hand with the government? What, uh... Yeah, this is exactly where the, 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 the key of the success is. You know, you, we have to, I mean, we have to work with the government, understand the needs of the government with the objective of creating value. Right, and uh, I mean, you, we cannot come and propose, for instance, to uh, in, in Cote d'Ivoire, for instance, to develop uh, to, to, to de develop an industrial zone to produce uh, a commodity that is not, uh, you know, <coughs> that is not a, a one of the largest commodities of the country. So, for instance, in Cote d'Ivoire, we will uh, have cashew because uh, Cote d'Ivoire is a large producer of cashew uh, in Togo, Benin. For instance, we have cotton, so we have to identify the commodities and negotiate with the government, put in place the, the, the framework that will attract the, the investors, and that is critical, basically. So it's a day-to-day -day work, and it's a, it's a long journey that we start and we continue together, and we are just based on the result. We have milestones that we have to achieve, and you know, when, when required, we can make some amendments to, to, to address the, 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 the needs of the, of the country where we, we are settling our industrial zones. Dr. Hasfour, I know that uh, one of your remits is to increase linkages within uh, African countries, the private sector especially. So uh, tell us in terms of uh, how do you see yourself uh, in terms of increasing linkages with, uh, with the Caribbean and creating uh, local value chains uh, between Africa and, uh, and the, Car the economies of the CARICOM countries? So, so Africa Business Council actually is established in line with the decision summit of the Azov states to promote our intra-Africa trade and to boost our uh, intra-Africa trade and fast track the Africa continental free trade area. And, but our mandate is really promoting our intra-Africa trade within Africa and with the rest of the world. So being here in Caribbean, we are very glad because I think with my brother here, we just signed the establishment of the African Caribbean Business Council, which is really based on the real business linkages what is present in the Caribbean, what is present in Africa, and how can we really add value to those with reference to how the commodities in Africa, how the transfer of technology, and how value addition, like we were talking about the fishery, we have received actually uh, some requirements from Caribbean in investment in the shrimp transfer of technology, the fishery, which already, for instance, in, uh, in Africa, in Egypt, we have very big companies which is into this domain. So that's really how we create the business linkages. The Africa Business Council actually is about the strategy of strengthening our African private sector on based on three pillars. The first is private sector strengthening, including SMEs, women and youth. The second is policy advocacy. And the third is product development. So if we're talking about policy and economic zones, how we can have policies that really promote incentives for investment to be in economic zones. Recently, we had a very a visit to, the, to Egypt in the uh, economic zones, with economic zones, which really targeting a local content, but also the technology and international requirements, like investment in green hydrogen, 
and we all know now that green hydrogen is a very, very uh, uh, trend that everybody wants to, to acquire. So the whole issue of the economic zone is to make a mapping exercise of what's existing on the ground and how we give policy uh, incentives for the investors in order to invest and to have to create jobs because it's all about creating wealth and creating jobs. So our partnership with Caribbean is really about what is present in the Caribbean that we can add can tra add transfer of technology and what is present in Africa that we can export and import with a creation of jobs with private sector strengthening and how those business linkages will really foster our relations as Africa-Caribbean. So we believe that in doing that, for instance, there is a lot of uh, minerals across the continent that we, it's, all, it's exported as such, how we add value to those minerals. Agri-processing, which is, uh, as you mentioned, my brother Kaju. Kaju is going to Vietnam to be roasted there and then again sold to all other countries. Why do we do that? Gem stones, gem stones uh, is getting it from all Africa and going to India to be cut and polished in Jaipur and big designers go there to bring African gem stones from India. So now as we are establishing our Africa Caribbean, we really need first to see how the infrastructure, the maritime, we need to have maritime uh, uh, transport, aviation transport, we need to have incentives and creating these special zones is very important to understand what is present here in the Caribbean that we can add value to it with our transfer of technology and what is present on the African continent. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Antoine, if I may come to you again in terms of linkages. So uh, prior to this panel uh, or on email, uh, Rene shared with us a, a paper on special economic zones and uh, potential areas of collaboration between, uh, between Africa and uh, the Caribbean. There's a talk, he talks of the sugar industry, he talks of coffee, he also talks of, uh, of uh, the blue economy, so uh, especially the, uh, the aquaculture. And uh, So as the uh, head of the uh, CARICOM private sector organization, where do you see, uh, where do you see um, those, uh, those linkages and uh, potential synergies in terms of uh, cross-regional value chains? Yeah, well, thank you very much for, for having us. When we were having this forum, I think many persons asked if the magnitude of CARICOM Africa trade is so small, then does that not logically suggest that it hasn't happened for a reason? And I think that's where I want to start off by saying that I think we need to look at this in three ways. One, there are some things that uh, both our regions need to do uh, and we, we, we sort of put those things at the intra-regional agenda. A lot of those things are the same things that need to be done in actually stimulating and generating successful uh, special economic zones. One of the things I want to mention, because our time is short, is that we have micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises. They haven't done well in international trade, particularly in our regions, unlike, for instance, in the Asia-Pacific region, where more than 50% of micro and small firms export, but in our region, less than 10, and in a good year, less than 15% of micro and small firms export. And that goes to the infrastructure issues that I think we need to put in place for micro and small firms, and a lot of that comes, first of all, because that's where they learn to trade within the region. I don't want to leave here without stressing that. And one of the things that we need to fix is whether we're going to make a decision that special economic zones and firms that benefit from them are eligible for originating treatment, for qualifying treatment within the integration grouping. That is a big issue. If you ask me, that's the elephant in the room. Uh, if we don't do that, what's going to happen is that the countries and the regions that do have eligibility for firms that benefit from special economic zones will continue to trade. Uh, scope, the ability to produce and to reduce costs across a number of different products, and scale, the ability to produce the same product 
but in a larger magnitude. They will continue to dominate our trading sphere until we are able to make those decisions so that our micro and small firms can learn to trade and then can trade with each other. Secondly, we miss the story if we look at what's there now and say, well, you're only trading in bituminous minerals and you're only trading in precious stones and you're only trading in vessels and ships and a couple of vehicles. There's lots of scope for inter-industry trade that we have never pursued because we've all been oriented to some metropole. We've been more oriented in the case of uh, some of the African countries to Europe and certainly for us in this part of the world towards North America. And with the uh, rare earth metals that uh, you have in Africa and with the technology and the diaspora uh, that have access to using this technology who are piloting and driving a lot of the innovation, for instance, in North America and elsewhere, especially economic zones, if we are able to put the infrastructure that you spoke about in place, I'm not going to go to that, can in fact do well. So that's a new area of growth based on the existing trading pattern. And, and then finally, in CARICOM, we've identified as a private sector 19 priority agri-food products that we want to drive the value chains for within our region. I, I want to tell you that before the heads took that decision, many of those products accounted for less than 1% of intra-CARICOM trade. I, I would have been alarmed except when I look at your data, I see that you also have massive underperformance for commodities that you have a clear, distinct competitive advantage in. And, and I think what we now need to do is for the first time to look at how we can identify some of these priorities. Fisheries, for instance, is on our list of the 19. Cassava is on our list of the 19. Um, you know, uh, pharmaceuticals is, is an emerging item on the list. And, and look at what you are doing and see how we can cause the relationship to take place. And my final point is this. How are we going to do this and where are the opportunities, my friend? This has to come from the private sector. It has to be the private sector speaking, knowing, learning, understanding each other so that they can do business, so that we can then have an integration grouping like Asia Pacific, which came from the private sector, not from states, and where intra-regional trade there is 30% of total trade, unlike the 15% in CARICOM and the 13 point something percent in many of the African countries. And, and, and they say that's the five or six points I want to focus on as we go through the discussion. Mm. So coming back to MSMEs, sorry, I'm not sure if I, if I caught you correctly or not, but I mean, if we have the big, uh, the big I mean, you, you seem to focus on the MSMEs as opposed to the big, uh, the big corporates who will be benefiting from this anyway. But if you have the big corporates and the MSMEs integrating within their value chain, then you're uh, automatically supporting that industry in any case, no? Uh, absolutely. So what I said doesn't preclude the large firms. But let me tell you about the CARICOM experience, which I also hear happens in the continent. Many large conglomerates of firms can afford the transactions cost of establishing, for instance, let's just use establishment in various jurisdictions. That's a cost. Small firms can't. So that, yes, a lot of what we're talking about is going to obviously take on board the trade by large firms, but the ones that are really uh, punitively precluded or excluded from the trade right now are the firms that really depend on us completing the integration process in the continent and completing the integration process in CARICOM. And without that, they're the perhaps greatest casualties of this lack of completing integration. And, and that's the ones I want to focus on because in discussions of this nature, they're often left behind. And for us in CARICOM, 60 to 70% of all our firms in CARICOM are micro and small firms, and that's massive. You exclude them from integration and from what's going to be happening within special economic zones. You're really precluding a large part of our civilization from the benefits of growth, from wealth, and from improving their standards of living. Massive for me, and I think it operates the same way on the continent. 
Thank you. We've got uh, two legal experts uh, who are sitting on this panel, but before I get to uh, the legal expert and the legal questions, so uh, Rene, I just wanted to, you to respond to uh, what Dr. Antoine has said, and also in terms of where you see uh, business linkages and, uh, and areas of collaboration or co-investment or uh, yeah, greater investment. Dr. Antoine, one thing that struck my attention was your focus on the small and medium-sized enterprises. But I don't know if you've considered export trading companies. And let's look at the Asian experience. How can we use export trading companies to aggregate any production done by small and medium-sized enterprises in special economic zones and industrial parks to face the global market? Would that approach not make it more competitive, more accessible? Our experience at Afrex in Bank, we put a number of products, a suite of products, and uh, solutions to look into how we can support these SEZs and IPs. So we start from an advisory perspective. We have an advisory team, our advisory and capital markets that can help you in structuring the debt and the equity for everything, for, for small companies, for construction, for land development, for roads, all the infrastructure necessary. Uh, we have a project preparation facility that can help with the feasibility studies, the business plans, the technical analysis to bring it up to speed. Uh, if you don't want to invest in the country and you're afraid of country risk or investment guarantees, we have investment guarantee programs, we have country risk programs. We also have our fund for export development, which we have created that can put seed capital and equity into some of these projects. Then the heavy lifting is done by our project financing, where we can now bring project financing to bear and support large-scale investments in capital, capital goods, capital equipment that will help to transform uh, some of these uh, commodities into finished goods. Then we can structure that now through an export trading company, which is branded globally to take advantage of economies of scale. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, I know we're running out of time, but uh, we've got enough time for, uh, for you. Don't worry. Uh, and we'll get back to everyone, so you'll have the right to respond there as well to some extent, even though I don't, I'm not sure if you, uh, if, if you tackle that question. But, uh, okay, so on, on the legal front, so I remember speaking to a businessman, and, he sa and I said, so what are the things that you look at uh, before investing? He said, uh, security and uh, rule of law is, uh, is number two. Be before those two... You know, everything else is, uh, is, is not a priority. So um, ultimately, I will start with uh, Marie Camille, if I may. So uh, I know that you're doing a lot of work in terms of uh, dispute resolution mechanism, mm -hmm. arbitration, and also international investment agreements. Mm -hmm. So maybe you tell us a little bit about your experience and uh, what we should uh, be aware of or uh, pay attention to, some special economic zones, to make yes. sure that uh, that is clear and... Uh, Absolutely. Thank you very much for uh, bringing up that topic. Can you hear me? Is the microphone working? Okay. Um, it's not always uh, the most popular subject. I'm aware of that, but it's also important. And actually, it, bring, it can bring a lot of things to the table when you know how to use conflict resolution properly. So conflict resolution is usually part of the package that a special economic zone should offer because um, it's going to help the, the, the zone run smoothly and also, of, of course, it's going to be attractive to foreign investors. The reason being that foreign investors and also companies working inside the zone um, are often unwilling to go to national courts for their, for their disputes uh, because they don't necessarily know the legal system. You have to remember that a special economic zone takes you out of the jurisdiction of a state, pretty much. It often has its own set of regulations and uh, so, so, yeah, it's a special zone. So, so, so the, the local courts are not, not necessarily a, uh, and not at all actually the appropriate forum for dispute resolution. So you will use what we call alternative techniques of dispute resolution, such as mediation. And I believe everyone pretty much uh, uh, understands what, what mediation is about, overcoming the conflict, putting, a, putting an end to it by finding a solution, or arbitration, which is actually a substitute for court adjudication. So specific uh, special economic zones are challenging from the point of view of ADR practitioners. Why? Because often they require uh, specific adjustments to the offer that arbitration centers like mine can, can make. Uh, often you need to have some hybrid mechanism to actually accommodate for the presence of SMEs, the fact that in the chain value you really want to go fast. 
uh, one dispute can actually get you off the tracks and, and, and seriously uh, disturb and, and, and undermine uh, the, the productivity of the, of the, of the industry. And, um, and so that's, that's something important that you want to think about and that you want to put in place with, uh, with you know, the right experts. Uh, and I know that the Jamaica Special Economic Zone has actually uh, one of these uh, mechanisms in place. Um, another dimension which often is, is a little bit maybe overlooked or sufficiently, insufficiently, um, that states are maybe insu insufficiently informed of is the investment uh, protection dimension. Uh, when you're a state, uh, most states around the world have entered into international investment agreements uh, whereby they grant some rights to foreign investors who come into their territory. Um, so what you have to, to know that is that if an investor considers that as a host state you have infringed upon their rights by, for instance, expropriating them of their investment or discriminating uh, against them, they can start an arbitration against you. It's a special sort of branch of arbitration which is called the investor state arbitration. And, um, and while uh, over the course of history, investor states has become subject to many criticism for, for a number of reasons. And the thing is, when you create a special economic zone, you actually grant rights to the investor. So you really have to think about what you're doing because if at a later stage you modify the framework and, uh, and, and the investor considers that you have taken away some of these rights, then you will be subject to some uh, uh, international investment arbitration proceedings. And there have been actually uh, 20 uh, investment arbitration proceedings, the latest being against Honduras, so worked against states, and the exposure can be actually pretty huge. So you have systematically to actually check your exposure uh, with the right experts before you engage into defining you know, this framework. Um, Thank you, Marie Camille. So, um, Ms. Yanis, uh, if we can uh, maybe uh, add to uh, your experience in terms of investment protection and international investment agreements from, uh, from the perspective of the Jamaica Special Economic Zones Authority. Um, so, certainly for Jamaica, one of the things that is the mandate of the Jamaica Special Economic Zone Authority is to facilitate investment. So, our approach is not a restrictive one. However, because we are a developing country um, and we are looking at it from a global perspective, we do have to bear in mind the guidance that would be coming out of the UN, for example, the OECD, and um, their requirements because of their concern with the base erosion, profit shifting, and leakage, etc. So we are actually balancing very well, if I may say so myself, um, what the global requirements are and our mandate to facilitate investment. So from our end, we actually write into our license agreements the alternative um, ways to resolve a dispute, which would be mediation and arbitration, depending on which route they want to go. And we always approach potential breaches, allegations of breaches, allegations of dispute issues arising from the perspective of we want to facilitate development um, and we want to facilitate economic growth. So I think approaching it from that perspective, as opposed to always approaching it from a revenue protection perspective, allows for us to give our investors a really good chance by coming into the SEZ regime in Jamaica. Perfect. Look, I know that uh, the organizers wanted me to finish at uh, four on the dot, but uh, I'll go with one last, uh, last round very quickly. But uh, maybe the question of finance, we mentioned it. I mean, uh, you mentioned that uh, the FX and Bank have been financing some special economic zones. But maybe we'll start with uh, Alain in terms of uh, finance. Where are you getting the finance from in terms of developing your special economic zones? And where, you know, who are the actors that you think should be paying uh, more attention or uh, investing in these uh, zones? Is it the multilateral development banks? Or is it the private, uh, private sector? Is it governments should also be part of these PPPs? Yeah, I will start with the, the financing. Like uh, you mentioned, is, uh, is critical to to, to the success of the industrial zone. And like my neighbor mentioned, you know, uh, for instance, for the SMEs, uh, we, 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 we're trying to ensure that there is a local content, at least in our industrial zone project. And this is a way to steer the, the, the SMEs and the local people who want to become entrepreneurs, you know, to get into it. 
And uh, for them, what we notice is that it's critic the financing is critical. You know, it's very expensive to settle a, 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 an industrial unit already. So ever they have, the, they, they, they get the, the capital for building the, 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 the plants. And sometimes they are stuck because they don't have the working capital to you know, run the plant, for instance, uh, or they don't have both. So what we do, uh, we have worked with Afrexim Bank a lot and other banks, uh, DFI, AFC, for instance, you know, to secure the financing for both you know, the, 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 the capital investment to build the, the, the infrastructure, so what I call the hard infrastructure, and as well for the working capital facilities to support the business when the, 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 the plants are up and running. It, it, it needs some time for them to ramp up the production and uh, to, 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 to become profitable. So we are there to support, to support them. And we work, we have partners like Afrexim, Africa Finance Corporation, and other banks. Local banks are more and more involved as well especially in the working capital uh, financing. Um, so this is how we, 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 we work. In some instances, I don't want to, 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 to name uh, state, but some states, they contribute as well to the, to the financing of, of the industrial zone. Because, I mean, they, I, I believe that they have the, 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 the thing that they have skin in the game, so it's, you know, they appropriate the, the industrial zone and for them it's important to show to the people that you know the state is not only bringing uh, uh, you know foreigners to invest in the country they participate to the development of the country the second part of the question can you come again sorry I, uh, yeah. no no it was just uh, you know wh where was the financing coming from well I think yeah, you answered yeah, so it so uh, local banks for the working capital increasingly yeah. so and the MDBs and uh, other investors for the sort of long term capital and uh, and, uh, and equity as well. So uh, I think we've got a question there, and then I'm going to have to ask for your uh, closing, uh, closing remarks. If we can give uh, just a microphone there. If you can keep it short as well, please. Thank you. Adizi, Adizi. projects and both for OPEX and CAPEX facilities using the networks of banks, commercial banks also. We've seen Republic Bank that is on both sides. We are seeing Access Bank also here. Uh, so so that's what my question. What can be done? Because it's about preparation of the projects that makes investment viable and can be fast-tracked. So maybe uh, Dr. Antoine and uh, Rene will answer uh, that question. In terms of the next steps, project preparation, how do we, you know, how do we get to the next steps? U ultimately, uh, there was, uh, excuse my French, but someone said uh, the six Ps of management. Uh, proper preparation avoids piss, uh, piss poor performance, something like that. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, so preparation. Um, the first thing, the first thing is that I think we, we need to have, as my colleague from Average and Bank indicated, uh, some institution that can help to um, sort of bring these small SMEs together into a viable economic unit, a cluster, whatever. Um, I've made the point to many of my colleagues, having spent some time early when New Zealand was actually uh, going through its transformation from being a major sheep producer to a producer of diversified products, 
that companies such as Enza, it's really a marketing cooperative. And, and, and that, that notion, we've lost a lot of, uh, let me just say, mm, appetite for in many of our regions. Whether it's a marketing cooperative or some other economic unit, someone has to bring those pieces together. So very quickly, what we're doing in CPSO is that we've treated cassava as a subsistence crop for many, many years. But actually, if you look at what's happening globally uh, with its uh, gluten-free status, it's actually now a uh, product uh, that's in demand. Mm -hmm. But there has to be someone that brings the partners together. So we've brought the major flour producer in Trinidad together with the major brewery. And we've also brought on board one of the uh, off-takers in terms of uh, cassava products. And, and we are working with uh, two institutions plus the CDB in trying to provide just what we heard about, which is in fact a consortium which can support, one, the preparation of that project so that it becomes economically viable, so that we can then pitch it to, uh, to various financing institutions, including the CDB. That piece has been missing in CARICOM. The uh, good news is that there are institutions that can play that role. These are the microfinance institutions in CARICOM, not the PD loan institutions, but the microfinance institutions that do a lot of handholding. Here's the problem. They borrow at very high rates of interest, and so they loan at very high rates of interest. Why don't we create an instrument where we can finance a number of those microfinance institutions to do precisely what we've been talking about today? Because they are filling a gap in supporting micro and small enterprises that no one else is. So I think we've uh, very much um, uh, along the same path as Afri Exim Bank, and I think I dare say the bank is ahead of CARICOM countries in putting this kind of infrastructure together. And that's one of the reasons why we have this tripartite agreement, because we are learning from them on how they've approached this in the past. And this, of course, will fulfill our aspiration that we pitched to heads and they bought it, of creating something called a SPIF, Strategic Project Investment Facility. And in that uh, pitch, we wanted to include the, uh, the development banks in CARICOM, the CDB, and also the CARICOM Development Fund. So we are thinking along the same path, and we intend to learn from Afri Exim Bank in that regard. Dr. Asfour, your, uh, your closing comments? Well, closing comments that we are here thanks to Afri Exim Bank, and uh, as private sector of Africa, we are collaborating with the uh, Caribbean private sector uh, organization. But what we really need to see is we need to make a real study, and thanks for ITC Amen. for today for uh, launching the report. We need to really know what is present in the Caribbean, what is present in Africa, how we build uh, linkages, how we uh, promote our private sector in both regions, because as I mentioned, as Africa Business Council, we have the triple P's, which is the private sector strengthening, including SMEs, women and youth, policy advocacy, and product development. So product development is very important. We need to know what are the raw materials, how we can add value it, with it by business incubators, business development centers, how we really join efforts with the Caribbean because our regions are very much linked and we have the same challenges. And so it's very important that to realize the Africa we want and to build these bridges is to use our own resources, our own expertise, our own a scientist, because also if we want transfer of technology. Absolutely. We have a lot of scientists across Africa and the Caribbean using the expertise of universities and scientific research centers to add value to our raw materials is of paramount importance. So as Africa Business Council, we're very happy we signed today. Thanks for every exam. And we are looking forward to see how we can take it step forward to start as we mentioned, in blue economy, and I believe the company here with the fishery, so we can make this a concrete action and a deliverable from this uh, fantastic gathering. Thank you. Marie-Camille, from your side. Uh, yes, yeah, thank you. Well, I've talked about dispute resolution to, to, um, from the perspective of foreign investors, also to support the functioning of these uh, specific zones, special zones. But also, I think it's important to um, uh, stress that there are also workers there, uh, in these the, zones. 
And it's important to, to incorporate some international labels, standards, some uh, generally uh, the corporate responsibility, responsibility standards, sorry, and environmental protection, and especially for the modern frameworks of uh, uh, special economic zones. So the link with dispute resolution is that you can have special mediators who are actually helping you incorporating these norms, make sure that labor disputes are handled the right way. And yes, as a closing comment, I, I would like to stress that. Yeah, absolutely. The ESG, uh, the ESG elements are quite important and are going to become increasingly important yes. Uh, yes, in yes. the future. Mm. So, uh, Yanis, uh, any uh, closing remarks, closing thoughts? Um, I think this collaboration is timely and I'm excited to see where the Caribbean and where the African countries are in another five years. I think using data in the way that African countries have done so to you know, drive their strategies has been very, very impressive and I look forward to us learning from them and thank you for having us here. Yeah, it's been a pleasure having you. So uh, Rene gave me a great paper so, uh, and he's always got uh, the last word wherever I've been with him. So uh, the last word is yours as always. No, thank you, Omar. I think from Africa Zimbang, in our role as a leading development financial institution, uh, which is set up with the mandate to promote trade, to promote South-South collaboration, we would want to leave here with credible sponsors coming with uh, real lifetime projects to develop special economic zones that will transform our uh, raw commodities in Africa, use the Caribbean, as maybe an export trading hub to attract the markets of North Africa, of North, North America and uh, Southern, uh, Southern, uh, Southern America, utilizing also the framework of the African continental free trade uh, ar arrangements. So we shouldn't just leave this as a talk shop. I don't think uh, financing is a challenge. Not one product can solve the problem of special economic zones and industrial parks. As we demonstrated, the bank has put in place a number of products from the project preparation, from our investment guarantee packages, from our fund for export development, to our project financing to support uh, the development of these industrial parks. So let's get our act together and do some business. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And uh, in your paper, there's lots of, uh, there are lots of suggestions in terms of uh, areas of potential collaboration. And uh, the numbers are there for all of us to see. I mean, we mentioned $4.5 billion of fish imports. Does it make sense that uh, we're not doing any business there? And actually, you know, we should be a, a global hub for fishing, both the Caribbean and, uh, and Africa. Uh, anyway, time has run. I see my uh, next panel is, uh, is ready to join us. Warm round of applause, and thanks very much. That was fascinating. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon. I know we are getting down and we are running late, so we are moving now on to the next panel that speaks about financing issues. 
And we're going to all try to keep our time so that we'll be all bring, up, bring back some time. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Robert LaHunt, Executive Director of the Board of the Inter-American Development Bank Group with responsibility for the Caribbean region. My disclaimer is that I'm not speaking on behalf of the Inter-American Development Bank, but in my personal capacity, having worked in the commercial banking sector for over 30 years. I have served as managing director and executive director of several commercial banks here in the region. Of specific relevance to this forum, I spent five years in Ghana over the period 2012 to 2017, where I led Republic Bank's expansion strategy into, the Af into Africa via the purchase of HFC Bank Ghana Limited, which is now rebranded Republic Bank Ghana. I also served as managing director for that institution from 2015 to 2017. And I dare say in 2015, the, bank, the government of Ghana branded that as the largest single diaspora investment made from a diaspora company back into Africa at that time. Today, we have, a, 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 we have an opening statement and we have a panel, a diverse panel, made up of both private and public sectors with a wealth of experience and knowledge who we will, who will engage and, and, in dialogue and try to break down some of the issues that we face surrounding the financing and investment opportunities. Let me start off now by introducing as the first person to make an opening statement, and then I will introduce the panelists who will then join me on stage. I'd like to bring on, introduce Mr. Ian, Ian Durant, who is the Director of Economic Development at the CDB. Mr. Durant. Thank you, Robert. Good afternoon, all. Uh, first, let me thank the organizers of uh, this pivotal forum uh, for extending an invitation to the Caribbean Development Bank to participate. As the region's development bank, this session on unlocking Africa-Caribbean trade and investment through financing is very relevant to our mission. Access to adequate affordable finance is, in fact, the theme for our next annual meeting of the Board of Governors. We recognize that the ambitious development vision we have for our region requires a substantial amount of finance, an estimated 100 billion US dollars over the next three years. And so we are redoubling our efforts to mobilize a greater quantum of resources for our region. We believe that adequate and affordable finance is the key to unlocking the potential across our region to achieve greater economic and social advancement. We therefore welcome this opportunity to discuss how we can collaborate to develop financing solutions to facilitate trade and investment that would unlock the trading opportunities between the Caribbean and Africa, which could ultimately improve lives and livelihoods across both our regions. Now, economic theory has always emphasized the importance of trade for the growth and development of an economy. Indeed, as we draw closer to the end of the 2030 agenda, the importance of this relationship holds even more relevance today. Trade plays a central role in the achievement of many of the sustainable development goals, especially as it relates to reducing poverty, enhancing food security, and bolstering economic growth. Therefore, it should go without saying that the formulation of a strong relationship between Africa and the Caribbean for trade and investment can be mutually beneficial for driving growth and development in both regions. For Africa, the Caribbean represents a market of around 19 million people, diverse investment opportunities, and close geographic proximity to North, Central, and South America. For the Caribbean, the African continent provides a potentially large market and an opportunity to diversify uh, regional exports. As it relates to the current state of trade between Africa and the Caribbean, according to the UNCTAD Stat Trade Database, 
CARICOM merchandise trade to Africa totaled around 422 million US dollars in 2021, accounting for just over 2% of total CARICOM exports. In the same year, Africa's merchandise exports to CARICOM totaled around 237 million US dollars, which accounted for less than 1% of their total exports. There's therefore much scope for us to deepen trade and investment relations between Africa and the Caribbean, and much to be gained as potential development dividends. However, we must bear in mind that while governments formulate trade agreements, businesses are the ones that ultimately participate in trade. Therefore, fundamental to the creation of trade is the facilitation of trade. Ultimately, in this specific context, facilitating trade will involve creating an environment that allows exporters to get their goods or services across the Atlantic at a competitive price in adequate amounts and in a timely manner. This ability will require an appropriate ecosystem within which exporters can operate, inclusive of good airports and seaports, storage and packing facilities, road networks, and broadband capacity. This ecosystem should also include an, appropriately, an appropriate regulatory and legislative framework that supports trade, including those related to customs and border procedures. These efforts require finance that is adequate and affordable. It is crucial for us as financial institutions, both multilateral and private, to explore how we can be more innovative in meeting these financing needs. A range of financing instruments such as SDG themed bonds, private equity, contingent debt, and derivative based instruments can be explored to build out infrastructure and support reforms. Additionally, while the investment needs are large, given the vulnerabilities of the region to natural hazard events, additional expenditure is needed to ensure that infrastructure is re resilient in the face of these events. In this regard, CDB is developing a framework that would base the availability of financial resources on an adjusted measure of gross national income that recognizes both vulnerability and resilience. At a more micro level, a 2015 CDB study estimated that in the Caribbean region, MSMEs constitute between 70% and 85% of the number of enterprises, contribute between 60% and 70% of GDP, and account for around 50% of employment. However, the study indicated that one of the several challenges that MSMEs face is inadequate access to financial resources. Consequently, if we are to take full advantage of the potential of a strengthened Africa-Caribbean trade relationship, adequate financing to MSMEs will be critical. In this regard, CDB is currently engaged in developing flexible financing solutions that cater to the needs of the private sector while addressing the challenges that they continually face, primarily in terms of access to working capital, finance, and collateral. Such financing includes supply chain finance, sometimes referred to as reverse factoring, and partial credit guarantees. Through deeper collaboration efforts such as this session today, financial instruments can be tailored to the needs of our firms. Already, CDB has begun to partner with the African Development Bank under a MOU signed earlier this year for the development of innovative financing instruments, among other initiatives. As financial institutions, we can explore avenues for financing of private sector trade venue, uh, ventures. We can also support knowledge sharing opportunities between businesses in Africa and the Caribbean through our market research and data analysis. We can also create knowledge products to assess market opportunities and support business decisions. There's much for both our regions to achieve from strong partnerships. Financing that is adequate, affordable, and timely is necessary to advance our vision for closer Afri-Caribbean relations. We at the Caribbean Development Bank therefore stand ready to partner with other financial institutions across the regions to mobilize the necessary financial resources to further develop these vital linkages. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, as you said, there's a lot. The bottom line is that there's a lot of trade opportunities that we identified. We talked about the size, and there's a lot of investments that are required on both sides of the Atlantic. 
both in the Caribbean and in the African region. So to help discuss then some of the issues surrounding this, I take the opportunity now to bring on board my distinguished group panel. I'd like to invite firstly Mr. Cleveston Haynes, who of course is the governor of the Central Bank of Barbados. Mr. Haynes. Also like Ms. 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 Kan Ayo, Awani, Executive Vice President, Intra-African Trade, Afro-Bank, Afro Bank. Mr. Simeon T. M. Tori, Chairman of the Vista Bank Group and Founder of CEO of Simba. Mr. Andrew Taki, Taki, Takira, Apia, Founder and Managing Director of ZP. <laughs> Mr. Gabriel Edgale, Managing Partner of Oakwood Green African Limited. <laughs> and Mr. Anthony Clark, Managing Director and CEO of Republic Bank Barbados and President of the Bankers Association of Barbados. So let's dive straight into this topic. It has been, um, it's one that, you know, at the end of the day, there was a song in Trinidadian by Calypsonian. He said, you know, you can't, you can't love without money. You can't make love on hungry belly. All right, so we know that money is important and ensuring that we have a free flow of it is a critical to facilitate any type of trade because we all want to get paid. So let me ask Mr. Haynes, moving straight to you, sir. How the global, we talked about, we know we're now operating in a global financial village, all right? And therefore, whatever happens, happens with us around the world. We are part of this big village. How the global regulatory landscape has impacted access to financing in Africa and the Caribbean? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, that's better. Thank you very much, Robert. Uh, delighted to be here uh, to participate in this, this panel. During uh, Ian's presentation, one of the things that he noted was the fact that access to finance is one of the difficulties which SMEs uh, face. And that is true not only in the Caribbean market, in the African market, but I think globally, SMEs obviously have more difficulty in being able to access uh, finance. And we operate, as you correctly say, in a, in a changing global landscape. But I think at the end of the day, I'm not convinced that it is the global landscape that is actually impacting access to finance uh, in, in terms of the regulatory landscape. The, a lot of the changes that have occurred in, from a regulatory perspective relate to capital, how banks are supposed to set aside capital to manage the risks that they face. And the other side of it, which is an access problem, not so much of credit, but access to banking services generally, uh, has to do with anti-money laundering procedures, which are also changing very rapidly uh, in that global landscape. So if we take a, an initial stab at capital, Mike again, ah, here it comes. Uh, if we take an initial stab at, at capital, what we would see is that within the last two decades, there have been tremendous changes in the measurement of capital, uh, Basel II and Basel III. And certainly speaking from a Caribbean perspective, uh, what has happened is that most of our regulators within the region have adopted uh, Basel II. But in adopting Basel II, they've adopted the standardized method rather than the uh, models-based method, the IRB method that is done in more advanced economies. And what is interesting about that is that within the standardized approach to regulation, 
the, the risk rate for loans to SMEs has actually fallen to 75%, whereas for larger corporates, it's, it's actually 100%. So that ought by itself to create an incentive for lending institutions to want to provide more credit to uh, SMEs. But the reality is that that has not happened. And so it's very tempting to say, well, it's the change in the, in the global landscape. But I think we also have to look at the structural factors uh, around the uh, SMEs where limited equity, lack of collateral, uh, concerns by the, the banking community about credit risks, the reluctance or the limited appetite that banking uh, entities have to extend new credit to SMEs. Uh, our staff, in doing some, some research, found one bank indicated that generally they won't want to lend to an SME until it has at least two years of experience uh, of producing the good or service that they're, they're producing. So that, to my mind, it's not so much the, the regulatory landscape. Yes, the regulators have become uh, have placed more onerous regulations on the banks. We've asked them to do more things. We make sure you have financial statements, et cetera. Uh, that is something to which obviously a lot of the SMEs are unable to comply with. And therefore, if you don't want to run afoul of your regulator, perhaps you will decide that you don't want to provide credit at that point. But I think generally, the, the bigger problem really are the structural problems which uh, MS, SMEs face rather than the regulatory landscape it, itself. Uh, as Ian points so a, a, a large segment of our community is really micro-enterprises uh, and, small and, small, and what we call small businesses. And when we talk of small businesses, it's really not the same thing that you might talk about in Africa, because a lot of our businesses have less than five employees. So, we have essentially lots of micro-businesses. I think a study that was done a few years ago suggested that almost 50% of the businesses that we have are actually micro-businesses, and almost another 40, 45% are what you would call uh, small, and by small, they were talking about 25 employees. Uh, if you look at the European definitions, you know, we're all micro-businesses, basically, rather than being uh, what you would say are, are SMEs, traditional SMEs. So it's that structural factor that I think we have to look at, how we, can we address that structural factor uh, while trying to encourage our lending institutions, nonetheless, to be more open to being able to provide credit, not so much because of the regulatory, but how can we foster growth in our economy? And it's going to have to depend on our ability to be able to finance these small businesses that are creative, that are willing to take, uh, to be innovative. And I think our financial institutions have to therefore to increase the appetite to take a little bit more risk than perhaps they have done uh, over time. And I'm speaking as a regulator, uh, but I think they, they need to take a little bit more uh, risk than they've taken over time in order to uh, ensure that there's greater access because governments will try to provide uh, other funding uh, activities through, uh, we have Fund Access and Enterprise Growth Fund, which are trying to lend to these types of, of businesses. But these businesses don't have the capacity to do the type of lending uh, which is really required uh, for these small businesses. All right, Mr. 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 Haynes. <laughs> I, I, I know some commercial bankers here might want to, to have a little bit of, of input onto that. But you know, as we started this small business, um, Lying, and I heard it here. You have started it there. Let me, let me go straight, jump across to Mr. Ed Gale. You know, and again, we talked then about small business, and we, he's mentioning that, you know, we all recognize that for this whole trade and, and, and finance, a lot of this export to work and, and, and is going to be fueled by a lot of what we call some of our small business companies. And if you are saying what you are saying, what are then some of the solutions that you think to be pursued to address from, from your perspective? So Mr. Mr. Haynes has said that oh, that's really where the problem is, not the regulators. You give me some of the answers that you think. What are some of the solutions that you think we need to be pursued? 
to, to facilitate that SM, SME financing gap. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And um, nice to see you again after you left Ghana. Well, right. um, I think when you were CEO in one of the banks, I was also a CEO in one of the banks in Ghana. Nice to see you. In your lovely country. Lovely. This is such a wonderful opportunity, and I would not miss out on, on saying. I'll draw from, from um, Her Excellency's words, um, the Prime Minister. Such a powerful speech very motivational. She says that this gathering was written in the stars and that we are meant to be here. Definitely we are meant to be here. Um, I was definitely meant to be here. This for me is a dream. That one day I will sit here and be part of history being made. Everyone in this room now is part of history being made. You know, it reminds me of one of my great, one of the greatest exports out of, um, out of the Caribbean, Robert Nesta Mali, said, how good and how wonderful it would be before God and man to see the unification of all Africans, Africans unite. Look, trade is a uniting factor. So I'll thank Afrexim Bank for this, absolutely. I'll thank Afrexim Bank, the government of Barbados, um, that we're using trade to actually unite Africa. It's amazing. Now, let's go to the question of SMEs. SMEs definitely are the bedrock of any society. Um, they are 80% of any society, and we can never leave them out. And the governor said something that the reason um, SMEs have a problem of getting finance is um, not due to regulatory reasons, but the banks don't really lend to them. Now, how would you blame these banks? I have some solutions, by the way, because you see, these SMEs are not structured. It speaks about structural problem, governance problems, and things like that, right? Um, and that's because perhaps, so, so what's happening here is the commercial banks find it very difficult to bring these SMEs up to the stage where they consider them bankable. Because obviously the models that are used to assess risk are the models that we have always just downloaded from cultures that are completely different from ours. Okay? I think we should begin to look at certain, you know, we should begin to look at homegrown solutions. Seriously. Yes, we do know that there are structural issues. Yes? Um, we also look at the fact that uh, some of these SMEs are over-reliant, over-dependent on the traditional lending, you know, uh, equity loans from banks. But there are other products. And when I got to know Afrexim, I knew that Afrexim Bank was solving a lot of these problems already. I mean, there's factoring, you know, supply chain um, um, finance. There are things like that, okay? Um, the structural issues would always be there. They are there. But there's one very fundamental thing that Africans used to do and still do in a lot of communities, which is community-based lending. You know, it's, it's this thing, I think it draws from the philosophy, Ubuntu. We call I it am. Susu. Because you are. Susu. You call it Susu? It's susu. Susu, yeah, exactly. Exactly. And you have these susu things. So this cluster-based lending would work for SMEs, okay? But obviously, infrastructure has to be there. Right. So you need, you know, um, people. You know, when I look at how you try to rate, you're using the rating models that a Fitch would use to rate the man who is, uh, uh, you know, doing business. All his business is cash. You don't have those infrastructure. You are not starting. You, you, you are, that's a non-starter. Okay? But there are peculiarities that these SMEs have. If you see those that are doing those cluster-based lending, those community-based lending, where all of these people are in clusters and they guarantee one another, those loans don't go bad. Okay. Okay? They don't go bad. So that's, that's one of the things. But the truth about it is that how do we now begin to get the SMEs to the kind of level where they become bankable, put some structure? Now, we in the private sector, we cannot leave this. And this is one of the reasons why my organization was established. 
Okay? We run a, an organization called Okud Green Africa. But Okud Green Africa has an arm called Africelerate. It's to accelerate small companies. Now, that effort that the commercial bank does not want to do on getting the SMEs to a point where he can lend to them, we do that. So we take them from stage, through five stages, training, you know, tools, structure, governance structures, and, and things like that. So today, you know, we, we have a, a banking group, uh, Opud Green has a banking group in West Africa currently, and we have about 2,000 women now that we're taking through that in the Gambia. We're doing that also, we do that in Sierra Leone, we do that in Liberia and, and things. And these are things that really should be done you know, for SMEs in Barbados. We take them through five stages of growth, okay? And those five stages of growth take them to a point where they can now become export-oriented companies. You know? So we now begin to develop them for exports. And this is one of the things that is critical for development in, in Africa and these SMEs. We have those exports. They don't even have access to markets. Okay, um, they, 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 they have these products. You, you know, when we attended, and God bless our Frexim Bank, again, I can't stop saying this, you know, um, intra-Africa trade, and, and interestingly, we have the, 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 the driver of uh, the intra-Africa trade initiative, uh, Madam Kanayo Awani here. Um, when you go there, you will see some of these products that these people produce. They just need basic finance, they need access to markets. I'm glad now we're opening up the entire Caribbean market for West African exporters and vice versa. Amazing. So because of that, we also started doing some trade forums, which we call trade roadshows, in each of these countries. So we did one in the Gambia, we did one in Syria, we did one in Ghana. Amazing. And you found these people, okay? The point was that the, 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 the kind of lending that can be done directly by an Afrexim bank is huge. So they can't touch those little ones. And then the commercial banks won't do that. So if you can come up with a structure, which is what I just said, then you can get the development organizations that do on lending to these institutions under these structures, and then you can actually get this to, to the people. Um, and, and so we're doing that now. I think we'll be doing a test run uh, hopefully, we'll be getting that online line um, from our Frexim Bank, and we can we can begin to lend to the SMEs. Right. Um, thank you so much, and, right. and I, I have so much to say about this. Okay, well, at least you have given us some food for thought with regards yes. to some some new types of ways of looking at it from a different perspective. Yes, and SMEs looking at seeing how they could deal with it themselves. Let me you you've spoken a lot about, and you've talked to, you've used the word you've heard. I, Afro Exim Bank, and you have said it over and over. I think it's about time, therefore, we, we hear from our representative, Ms. Awani here, who is from the Afro Exim Bank. And let me ask, what role do national and international development financial institutions play? And how can African and the Caribbean develop, development financial institutions collaborate to unlock trade and investment opportunities in the region? Thank you very much. Um, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here to talk about Afrex Bank. But what I'd like to do is to, I think, is to talk about what Afrex Bank is doing. In my view, Afrex Bank exemplifies a model DFI um, in terms of our interventions, in terms of you know, resolving market failures, resolving crises. Um, let me give you an instance. Um, in a few minutes, probably today, Mr. Governor will be signing the, what I call the great, what we call the Caribbean Africa Trade and Investment Promotion Program. The idea of that program today is to support trade and investments between Africa and the Caribbean. It will support. It has financing elements to it, and it has non-financing elements to it. So, so that you people here know that we are ready to do business. This is not just another gathering. Um, it is a gathering where we want to support whatever trade deals or investment deals that are concluded in this forum can be financed. Um, Professor Rama this morning talked about a $750 million package for, um, to, to, for, Afrex, for the Caribbean upon, you know, as we start our intervention following the partnership agreements that were signed. 
He also mentioned about the $250 million facility, and that $250 million is a Creative Africa, the um, Caribbean Africa Trade and Investment Promotion Program. That program will support financing deals. For instance, I, earlier on, I did hear um, one of my colleagues here talking about industrial parks, for instance, you know, that sort of the things, trade enabling infrastructure, ports, sea links, air links. Um, the discussions around air links and logistics have been so prominent in this conversation today. Uh, we will support um, the creative industry as well. It's interesting to hear Gabby talk about um, the cluster financing on that creative, creative industry, creative and cultural industry program. We actually have cooperatives financing. Um, because of the unstructured nature of some of the creatives, especially in the fashion sector, we also have um, financing those. Um, we will finance, you know, the other thing I want to talk about is we also lend to financial institutions, commercial banks, for on lending to their clients as well. To have an investment guarantee facility and investment finance facility. So, um, my friends here, Gabby and Salma Territory, are those, some of those who are looking to to um, open up shop in the Caribbean. Um, they are bankers. Um, they have also benefited from Afrexian Bank fi uh, Finance, investment finance. So we support them to go and uh, invest in other African countries, in other African countries, but of course they're looking at, looking at the Caribbean now. We're also looking at investment guarantees, and Afrexian Bank has a menu of guarantees. You know, there could be country risk, investment guarantees that help to protect um, you know, um, investments from government actions that may inhibit normal operations or repatriation of profits and what have you. We also have the non-financing instruments. Um, ITC's report suggests that 70% of, or rather that the absence of, of a free trade area between the Caribbean and Africa means that Tariffs can get as high as 28% in some sectors. So there are things to be done in that area. There are also, also non-tariff barriers. In the context of the AFCFTA, where we operate, the African Continental Free Trade Area, where we're also trying to support its implementation, we have things like we are supporting the, um, the uh, setting up of Africa Quality Assurance Centers. These are to deal with issues of quality infrastructure. Um, standards, testing, inspection, and certification, you know, um, labs to ensure that Africa and probably in this case Caribbean goods, you know, um, have acceptable, have accepted. A but to the extent, yeah, one of the things are with these institutions, uh -huh. uh, we hear all these products, but then access and bureaucracy to getting them, you know, actually moving from product to action and money on the ground. What has been your experience or your customers' experience in dealing with? For them to answer that question, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I think those who have benefited, you know, they'll have their chance to talk about how bureaucratic or unbureaucratic. But is but it easy from your perspective? Is it easy to make these to, for, to get these put these products in I think place? The, I think the best way to say it is that although we although we are a DFI, we are also commercially oriented. We work like private sector. You know, we you know in five years of the of leading the traffic and trade initiative. We have this bust $20 billion on a rolling basis, on a revolving basis, only for intra-African trade. That's not what the bank does. This is just for my group, intra-African trade, $20 billion, think about it. We have facilitated access of, um, to new markets. We enable, you know, we work with uh, what we call like intra-African trade champions to expose them to markets. To, you know, so that they, they have opportunity of getting access to contracts, twinning, you know, um, in other countries as we promote intra-African trade. So, I mean, I think they can talk about that. The issue about industrial parks is not, we're not just talking about it, we're developing industrial parks. If you've heard about the Gabon Special Economic Zone, you know, we finance out to the Gabon Special Economic Zone, we're supporting um, um, development because we also have an impact equity fund development of industrial parks ourselves, not just providing pro um, project finance, we are also developing ourselves as promoters. So we have with one in um, Abidjan, it's called PK24 that we're working, we're doing one in Benin, Republic of Benin, Togo, 
you know. Um, and then the quality infrastructure, the quality infrastructure um, products I was telling you about, which is the standards, the testing, inspection, and certification labs, we build the one ourselves as well in Nigeria, the Shag you know, um, in Ogun State in Nigeria. We're already doing one in Egypt, in um, Tanzania, and in Ethiopia. So um, the financing is there, you know, we, we, uh, the, in the creative, and by the way, as I talked about the creative economy as well, um, we have been promoting fashion designers to, you know, to part participate in fashion shows abroad. The idea is to, I talk a lot about the creative economy because I think it's impactful for, it is relevant for this, for this region. We've been supporting um, fashion designers, to take, to, to take advantage and expose them to brands abroad. So one of the shows we've been supporting them, we supported 40 from Africa and the Caribbean uh, this year in May to Portugal Fashion Show. There's another one happening in, in Paris in October, and we're talking about 20 to those two. Um, but also, if you listen to President Obama, we also, you know, I told you that we, um, DFIs are there to resolve crisis during the pandemic. We supported Africa and the Caribbean, you know, with the Africa to pull, you know, their um, to pull their procurement so that they can um, purchase medical consumables. Well, we have heard a lot about that one, and I think you need a round of applause from everyone for that particular initiative. Again, we also supported the, you know, with two billion dollars guarantee standby facility for vaccines to oh. come into Africa and the Caribbean. So this is not, this is, this are real life stuff. This, this is, is happening. This, this, this is, is easy uh, stuff. This could happen. So product this there. Is, yes. This is something that you could support. Yes. Okay. All right. But, okay. So we have, we are hearing, we spoke about the small business that is important. We have the products that we, that is there to make this thing happen. The movement of funds. We have heard a lot is happening. A lot. We know the fintech industry is growing throughout the world. It's, it's, it's coming into the commercial banking. It's taking space, products, movement of. What are some of the What are some of the innovative instruments available to ensure access to finance? Should factoring play a greater role in financing African Caribbean trade? Let me ask Andrew. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, first of all, I'm honoured to be here. Um, I think today is such a wonderful and great day. I like to coin it as the day we build the North Atlantic Bridge. This is the bridge that Africans and Caribbeans are going to go around. We're both going to climb and walk across this bridge to be able to achieve a common goal. I don't think that common goal is just trade. I think it's economic, it's politics, it's everything. Um, to go back to Prime Minister Motley's statement or speech today, we're here to unify our markets and build a single corridor. If that's the case, then why are we here? We're here so that we'll be able to make trade and make payments for it. But I think it hinges on three core things, and these core things are policy, and I'll explain all of that. It hinges on regulations, and it hinges on product and diversity. From a policy perspective, Gabby mentioned a lot about it. Madame has talked a lot about it. We actually need to make a deliberate attempt to bring the structural issues into policy and enshrine it. In then we need to have a tariff arrangement so that our markets have an equitable play in the game and are not sort of quote unquote disenfranchised by the bigger markets. We also need to make sure that in that policy arrangement, we also have quotas and the relevant things that will make trade safe for all of us. If that is in place, then we need to be able to facilitate the payment. So we need to also have a deliberate attempt on regulation. The time has come for both Africa and the Caribbean, I believe, to ask itself, the, the models we are running, are they homegrown? The banking models and licenses that we have, are they going to factor this growth that we're looking for? Remember, we're creating a three trillion market with a possible market of 1.5 billion, if you even extend it a little bit into the latter market. So if we're creating this new world, this new order that we are calling it Africa Caribbean Union or whatever sort it will be, then maybe we need payment banks, we need correspondent banks, maybe we need specialized banks that are just trade banks. If we have that from a regulatory standpoint, then I think we can start talking about products. I think from a product perspective, Afriexim Bank has, has been a wonderful thing we've been able to achieve today. They should extend that. Can we have 
specialized credit lines that counterparty banks are all pulling from the same pool. So for example, one bank in maybe Accra has $5 million for this particular project. Another bank on this side has another $5 million. But it's from a common pool. So because it's from a common pool, then you can build product to disperse out of that pool because your risk is taken care of. That fear has disappeared. Then we can build, obviously, the regular compliance issues around it as we make this transaction safe. So if we do that, then we can start talking about some receivable finance, whether it's, it's a form of factoring. But if you do it that way, then when Bank Y issues the instrument and says that I'm, I'm paying out of the key to that your Exim Bank has given me, the counterparty bank on the other says, yes, I recognize that. I know this fund. I've got the same fund. It's from the same parent. Then we can bring the technology. That's why Calvin, I, I believe that the technology comes in to disrupt the process and says that when that export is about to go onto the ship, it's being tracked. There's an instrument issued of maybe $5 million. The other counterparty on the other side is very aware that the, money, the, the product is coming. When it's on the ship, it's being tracked. When it gets to the port, it's, be, it's being tracked. It's going through a quota scheme. It's going through some tariff trade benefit scheme. So all along, technology is also making it possible. Then at that point, the local bank can say, hey, you know what? The product has come. It's gone through inspection. We'll release it so payment is made on the other side. If that's the case, then I, I, it's not necessarily for me factoring, but making sure that we have these two core, and then the third, we'll take all the different beautiful banking instruments we have and repackage them again. Because that's really what technology does. It doesn't really change it, it just repackages it and makes sure it's smooth. So I think that um, today we've achieved a great thing, we build the bridge. I think the next thing is for us to sit down and move from here into working groups and start to talk about how are we going to make that policy shift. Then in there, the, the regulations will come in. The various banks, the various central banks will start to look at lesser models with, with, with the relevant compliance that will make it work. So that people don't feel disenfranchised, the markets that will come in, the players that will come in don't feel disenfranchised. They are not exposed to all these various de-risking issues because all of a sudden we're controlling the risking it's two corridors that have decided to trade between themselves out of London, out of New York, out of Australia, out of Tokyo. It's just African Caribbean. We have the banks, we have the parents, we have the DFIs, and we do it and we make it happen. So I think it starts from that perspective into factoring. And that's well, where I sit. Well, okay, but you, you just heard again some words there. You talked about the risking and you talked about new almost carving out a space and dealing with it there. But I mean, that leads me into the other question about, about correspondent banking. Because at the end of the day, whether or not we create correspondent banks among ourselves, or whether we have special rules for correspondent banks among ourselves, that's a whole opening up a, 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 a new issue. But let's, let's ask, uh, let me ask Mr. T.M. Tori, Simeon, I mean, how restrictions of correspondent banking relationships and business services by major global banks in certain jurisdictions have impeded Afri African Caribbean trade and investments? And to the extent, I mean, to comment on the, the suggestion of, of that carving out process that was just mentioned across there uh, as, as a possible solution. Yes. First of all, thank you. I want to congratulate our Frexin Bank and the CARICOM for, for this event. This is wonderful. This is a bridge that, was, that we needed to have, and I'm so delighted to be here. When uh, the president and uh, Mrs. Awani suggested to be here, I say, I raise my hand, I say, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. We'll be here, and we need to bridge that gap and uh, bring us together, unite Africa and the Caribbean. So to, to that extent, to that question, I think Afrexim, and I think everyone is talking about today about the product that Afrexim is putting out there. Can I mention something very, very important? The bank is, as, as model, as, is now becoming the model DFI and addressing market failure. One of the critical market failure we're seeing is shifting regulation and you know, big banks living in the Caribbean, living in Africa. As they leave, we buy them out. That's what we do. And that's how we built Vista Bank. We bought BNP Bank in Burkina Faso and Guinea. 
So, and because their model, as someone mentioned here, is not the same as our model. Yeah. You know, the, the, the reason why they were there is different from the reason why we need to be there as a trade finance intermediary, working with our Frexin Bank to promote trade, to promote intra-Africa trade, financial inclusion, finance SMEs, and provide some of the innovative and critical instrument that's needed to lift Africa. So if we learn from what we have benefited from the instrument that Afrexim has put together to address those market failure as it relates to corresponding bank, there's a product that they put out called AFTRAFT, you know, the Af African Finance Trade Facilitation Program. Essentially what it does, it pull a number of banks, big banks in the market, JP Morgan, City Banks, and Chart, all the, the mom and pop big banks that's out there that will not directly deal with small banks like Vista Bank or Oakwood Bank, and, uh, and we will, ac will accede to those corresponding banks. That's an immediate, immediate solution until we get to that working group uh, that Andrew was talking about. Afrexim has, has a model that works very well today from which we're benefiting and doing all of our trade financing for either SMEs or the... Uh, uh, in, in any enterprises in Africa that is our client today. And it's working out very well. The model could be replicated here for, in the Caribbean because I do see also a shift in the market with issue of corresponding banks that is preventing Caribbean banks to do trade and promote trade and could do LC confirmation. There's a model that could be replicated. The same model also could be used to promote Africa and Caribbean trade. And in that sense, uh, I think as someone mentioned, we will be controlling our own vehicle, our own instrument to yeah. enable us to trade. Because if we were to solely rely on third parties, and that third party risk or shift or dealing with, you know, could be well handled by institutions like Afrexim Bank, institutions like uh, this, this, the CDB, the Caribbean Development Bank, together with Afrexim Bank, yeah. can come together and put an AFTRAF, a, a, a facility similar to AFTRAF to promote Caribbean and Africa trade. Yeah. Um, the other thing is also that's, that's causing all these issues with regulation and corresponding bank pulling out. It's KYCs, knowing your customer. Again, addressing market failure. Afrexim put out a platform called Mansa to address corresponding bank issue. You gotta know who you're trading with, ultimately. So if you're a Caribbean businessman, entrepreneur doing business today, I will encourage you to go on a Mansa platform and sign up and register. And we have done that for all of our bank. We sign up the bank and we systematically sign up all the customers of our bank. And we encourage them as part of our onboarding process to be part of Mansa yeah. and keep updating their financial information so that the day they want to do a trade or an LC, and then we present it to our Frexim Bank to do the onboard on of uh, confirmation, it goes smoothly. And that goes back to your question in terms of processing any, uh, any application that's being provided. It's on us as a bank, and it's also on us as business people exceeding those DFI to provide them with the information that they need to process swiftly the, uh, whatever facility or whatever request that we made to them. Our experience has been that uh, things have moved smoothly every time the bank has asked information that we need to provide. Obviously, they will give you a timeline. There are delays, like any other institution, but it's been pretty fast and pretty smooth. The key is to provide the information. But I think we do have the tools in our hands that we can learn from what they have done in terms of addressing some of the market failure. You know, Mansa is a clear tool. AFTRAF is a tool today that we can potentially use. And if our Frexim work with, with CDB, putting together a bigger AFTRAF package to, that will help promote Africa and Caribbean trade. Yeah, sure, please. Hello, thanks, um, Simon, for the good job of, uh, <laughs> of <laughs> highlighting what we do. I wanted to talk about another platform. You know, the man he mentioned, which is a KYC repository, is part of a bigger platform we call the Africa Trade Gateway. The Africa Trade Gateway has, uh, is an umbrella platform that has various assets, digital assets. Another one is the Pan-African Payment and Settlement System. Yes. It's also a product that we are talking to. Um, um, the governor, I'm sure my colleague, Michael Balu, may have been in your office today. It's, it payments, that system allows for trade to be done in local currencies. So the buyer will pay in their local currency. It's in, um, we are piloting it in the West African region right now. Um, so a buyer in Ghana 
will pay Ghanaian cities, and if it's buying from Nigeria, for instance, the Nigerian will receive Nigerian Naira. It's a way to deal with the foreign currency cost of trade. It's also a way to formalize a huge informal trade that exists um, today. I wanted to add that the other platforms, one is the trade information portal, because one of the things we've seen, and one of the, which is one of the reasons we have this platform, and exhibitors as well, is that we understand that there's lack of access to market information. And the lack of access to market information means that people in the Caribbean, for instance, do not know what Africans produce, where to source raw materials, and vice versa, or even what the rules of trade are. So the platforms, the trade information portal, and the trade regulations portal deal with those providing information, just as our trade and investment promotion forums, the Intra-African Trade Fair, for instance, which is, allows people to connect buyers and sellers to meet and exchange goods you know, and, and services, and at least to deal. So what will come out of a forum like this today is that you're bringing people together, potential buyers and sellers, you know, that will eventually get connected and begin to deal and expand trade. All right, okay, so again, we seem to be having the products, the services, the money movement, um, that local currency, that payment in the currency is going to be an important factor. And if that could happen, I see that as being one of the impediments. But we also, last but not least on the panel, we also have, you know, it was mentioned earlier that one of the banks have actually, one of the Caribbean banks, the largest Caribbean bank in the region, actually has done what we are talking about, gone across a little while now and actually made investments in, in and the African country. Um, so we have the managing director of, of Mr. Clark from Republic Bank. Now, Mr. Clark, that investment, give us a little indication of how that investment is progressing. And secondly, I know you yourself, as part of the institution in, our, in, our, in some of our discussions, between Republic Bank customers, which operates throughout the Caribbean, in Barbados and in other Eastern Caribbean countries, Trinidad and Tobago, you have taken some of your customers to Africa, Republic Bank customers, to see, listen, let's go and get this market. So you have been doing it. What we've been talking about doing, you have actually been doing it over the years, or over the past two to three years. Give us an idea of the experience that you have had. Um, give us an idea of, of that motivation to go to Africa in the first place, and how, what, what, has been the experience, what has been the feedback that you have gotten from some of those you saw, to the impediments to, to preventing the trade from happening. Great. Thanks a lot, Robert. I, too, am very pleased to be part of this potentially game-changing forum. And as you said, Republic Bank is already playing that new game. So we have changed the game already for ourselves. So Republic Bank, uh, we're looking for investments. We had, uh, I wouldn't say we exhausted the region because we have done regional in investments since then. But the opportunities were few. So we hired a consultant uh, to view the, the landscape globally and see where would be a good fit for Republic Bank in Trinidad. And they came up with Africa, they came up with Ghana, and there was an opportunity there. So our laws were similar coming out of the British system, so that was good. And as we said here, many people have said our cultures are very similar, so that was good too. So we felt it was a good fit. But we didn't just go in and buy a bank. You know, there was a lot of research being done, so that is what I would recommend for anyone who is going across in the Ghana continent. Please do your research. We spent a couple of years researching the opportunity, going over to Ghana, right, physically, because you can't go to a continent, you can't go and invest in a continent you're unfamiliar with virtually. We went there, we took several trips, senior executives, to look at the opportunity to discuss with the bank, with the regulators, and so on. So a lot of research was done. And then in 2012, we made an initial investment of about 10% with the intention to increase it in short order. And then things got kind of complicated. We ended up in courts. Um, part of the reason is there were some entities, stakeholders, that didn't want us LSC Bank. They didn't want the Trinidadians coming in there. And we had to deal with that. And that took a couple of years. And then we made a further investment in 2013 
which took us up to, I think, about 30 or 40 percent. And then in 2015, we got a majority stake, and we have a, we have a stake of about 60, 66, 67 percent now. So it was a process. And although the bank is doing well, there were challenges. Because during that time, in fact, in 2017, there was a banking crisis. And about 10 banks failed. And if it was not for the Re Republic Financial Holdings Group, the parent company, ability to put further capital into it, we would have been in trouble too. And management experience and expertise. So we were lucky that we had a big, if, if, a big brother or father right, in Trinidad that had the management experience and had the capital to inject. Otherwise, we too may have found ourselves in a little bit of difficulty. Then, of course, there will have been currency devaluations. I would say over the last five years, I think the currency has probably devaluated about 30 or 40 percent. I'm subject to correction if, any, if anybody wants to correct me. So there was that to deal with too. So over that last five year period, the bank has doubled in size, doubled in terms of assets and doubled in profitability, but then there was devaluation. The so when you convert the US dollars, it wasn't, um, it wasn't a one for one sort of thing. But we have grown and we have done good. The bank we bought was basically a mortgage bank. It was HFC Bank Ghana and the HFC was Home Financing Corporation. So it was, it was a mortgage bank with about 40 branches. We still have about 40 branches, and very, very small branches. And we added value. We turned the mortgage bank into a full-fledged commercial bank. So for instance, they didn't do corporate loans or commercial loans, business loans. That is now the largest part of the assets in, in the bank in Ghana. So that has grown leaps and bounds. In terms of the payment space, because they were mortgage banks, so I'm not, not saying this because the bank was a good bank, but their focus was different. So we added value in terms of the payments. We introduced the credit cards, debit cards. We have a mobile money wallet as well. So we added value, turned the bank from a mortgage bank to a full-fledged commercial bank. Out of 23 banks in Ghana, we are number 16. So we're still relatively small. but. Um, there's opportunities. We have heard here a billion dollars in, 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 in trade is, is on offer, so there are opportunities there. But you have to research it well. You have to ensure that you are comfortable going in there. It may be best to go in with a partner, depending on what you're doing, so you get the local knowledge. That is invaluable for when you go into a territory that is so far flung, and perhaps, although we say similar, still different. So that's another piece of advice there. So the bank has done well, but there are a lot of challenges. There could have been potential pitfalls if we didn't have the backing of a strong group. So that was important as well. So Robert, I think it's a good opportunity for whoever wants to research it well, ensure that you know what you're getting into, have a fallback position, don't put all your eggs in, into, one bar, into one basket, have some kind of fallback if things do not work out as planned. You have to think about things like devaluations and currency, and currency fluctuations. That can wipe you out in one fell swoop if you're not careful. Okay, all right, Anthony. Well, you got to you hear it from a man who, or a group that has actually done. Now we just, I know we are running out of time, but I'll put the opportunity for the floor to just ask one or two questions of the floor. Um, I see one question and I see one question. So we'll take these two questions. We're closing up time, and we will then say, give the panel the opportunity to make some closing remarks. And in the closing remarks, the panel, I will put them on notice. We let's, let's try to think about when you're closing some of the innovations that you would like to see in the value chain in the, for, in the, to improve the value chain of the financial solutions. So just as you close off, if you will then just address that in the meantime also. Or anyone, any more remarks that you see necessary. Sure. Yes. Th thank you for the opportunity. My question be, will be quite uh, short. It's about investment, foreign investment into our regions. When I say our regions, the Caribbean and Africa. It's also about raising local money, raising local capital. So my question, and I would like to, to put this question to the moderator, 
why to the moderator we see that he has been banker in Ghana. He has been in very high level politics in the Caribbean and also banker in the Caribbean. So I think that you have a pretty good idea. And then after what the presentation that Mr. Clark has been given on the, 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 the long journey, I would say, of Republic Bank in Ghana and being a global bank, Boafo, microfinance, Republic Trust, Republic Investment, so having a quite, quite full view. So I think this is, you, you probably have spared it. So my question is, uh, how, uh, how do you, would you see, and the question to the moderator, what would be the right inst vehicles to be able to, to push that agenda locally? What are the regulation mechanisms instead of financial institution in order to be able to push the agenda so that you can truly partner with development institutions such as our African African Bank? Okay, all right. Well, I will, let me, I will, I will probably in closing up answer that or try to, to answer that if I understand the question. What are some of, let me also ask the other question. Thank you very much. Um, very good afternoon to everyone. My name is Dr. Ebekure Jasper Radiri, uh, the Secretary General of All Africa Association for Small and Medium Enterprises, ASME, and also the Economic Advisor to the Governor of Bayelsa State of Nigeria. Um, I have a question and then a comment. The simple question is this. Africa has 18 million SMEs, and it has an SME finance gap of about $330 billion. And we're working in Africa to close that gap. But within the Caribbean, what is the SME finance gap you have in the Caribbean? And how are you working towards closing the gap? And then my comment will be, is as, it, as I mean, it arises because Simon, Andrew, and Gabriel made very interesting statements as it concerns SMEs. Now, for SMEs, especially those in Africa, we are talking about an Afrocentric model, an alternative model of finance for SME development. And I'm happy that you are thinking as well in that direction. SMEs in Africa are peculiar. The model we have been using or we've been operating with, with the regular banking systems, are colonial templates. They have existed and they are still existing. We are not saying they should throw away those colonial templates, but we must have an alternative to finance or else we can't access the finance. Year in, year out, you hear that so much money is allocated for SME development, yeah, either in Africa or perhaps in the Caribbean. But they are unable to draw down from that finance or financial fund. And this is because the template is not friendly enough for them to access. And then the other point is that it is very easy for the people in the financial sector to say SMEs are largely informal, they are high risk, we need to de-risk, we need to de-risk. That's a regular statement. Why won't we begin to think about the alternative and approaches to de-risk? If we begin to sincerely look at an alternative, I'm sure that the SMEs will begin to draw down on finance. And if they draw down on finance, it means economic prosperity for all. And if we are able to hold hands with 27.5 million SMEs in the Caribbean, add it to 80 million SMEs in Africa, that's over 100 million SMEs that can pull their resources together for trade. I think we should begin to think about this. And I thank you all. I thank Africa in Bank for this opportunity. So the, the question spoke about the Caribbean, Mr. Clark. You want to make an attempt to answer the... Yeah, I'll make an attempt. <laughs> <laughs> but my brother here gave a very, said, apparently has a very good model that we probably have to speak with him after. And you're right, um, we're probably using colonial, colonial models still. Um, I, I too am um, in favor of SMEs, obviously. Um, because they represent a large part. I think Governor Ian said about, about 70, or was Ian said about 70% of the businesses. Um, 
But the reality is, and I should say that by the definition that Governor Haynes um, described, being micro being less than five employees and small being less than 25, a large percentage of the customers that we have at Republic Bank Barbados are in fact SMEs because these are, these are small economies and large businesses are far and few between. I mean, for instance, Republic Bank Bar Barbados, we employ about 500 people, but I mean, we are probably one or five entities that em employ that level of um, staff. I mean, even the other banks have half the staff that we have. So um, by that definition, we do in fact bank SMEs. But I know what I know what you're referring to there. You're, you're, you're speaking more of the of the people who have difficulty in getting access to bank okay. finance and so on. And that is an issue for us because financial inclusion there is definitely a gap in Barbados, and we want to try to bridge that gap. But the reality is, it didn't come out in the statistics here. But I think the real, reality we know is is more than 50 percent of small businesses fail within the first three years. They are highly risky to bank. And I will go back to the old saying, some people don't like to hear it, but the reality is we do not lend our own money. We lend depositors money. We lend your money. Do you want us taking excessive risk with your deposits? Because we know what happened. There are examples, there are full of examples in the Caribbean, I'm sure in Africa too, where you put your money in the bank expecting to get it back, you didn't get, get, it, get it back. So it's not return on capital, it is return of capital. You want to get it back. So if I go and take excessive risk, then I put your money in jeopardy. So I cannot do that. And that is not a cop, a cop out, that is the reality. Well, now, uh, coming, coming back specifically to financing small businesses, the problem with some small businesses is that they have a good idea. They have a good idea, they know how to do a particular skill. So they're strong in that area but they are not strong in the breadth of skills required to run a business. And one of the key skills that very often they are not strong in is financial and accounting literacy. They don't understand numbers properly. They may know to buy and sell, they may know how to make something, they may know how to fix a car, whatever it might be. But the financial literary skills are not there very often, they are absent. And that is where the issue becomes. So it's not just as, as, as the governor said, that they don't have financial information, but even if and they don't have access to it, they may not have the money for it, but even when they get the financial information, they really don't understand it. it's for the bank. You know, here you want it, that, look at it. They can't explain it, they don't understand it. And that come, come home to roofs very early in the game. Because you have to manage the cash cycle, you have to manage the working capital cycle, you have to manage the receivables, stock inventory, creditors, you have to manage all these things to be able to show, show that you are coming around in the cash cycle and very often they don't understand it. And what is required is a lot of, lot of hand holding from the financial institutions, okay. a lot. So it becomes very costly because you have management time, supervisor time, clerk time, because every morning when you open the report or you look at your computer, the account is overdrawn or they're over the overdraft limit. So, That's a conversation so, so there. Mr. Clark, or you have to return checks. Or the loan is in a rent because they can't pay. We so it's a lot. So what you have done there is- Rob, Rob, give me one second. So it's a lot, a lot of man. The time is very costly. Now, it, it, in a sense, it's enjoyable work. When, when they, they succeed, you feel great. But it is nearly, as if it is corporate social responsibility sometimes and not banking. Because you ask yourself, am I making any money on this account? And the answer is clearly no. You can't be speaking to a customer every single day, right? right? And having to do reports for excesses and so on. Mr. And Mr. then, Mr. so that Mr. is the reality from a commercial have to, banking have to point of view. But yes, yourself, you, know. you are right. It is, it is <laughs> colonial style perhaps. So we need to look beyond that. To be honest, at Republic Bank, we have not found the kind of solution we want yet. One of, one of the ways we have done it in Trinidad and to a less extent right. in Barbados, okay. or in Barbados, is we have guarantee systems mm -hmm. that the, the uh, All right, I, the I think, bank I think, I think we, we get the idea, we got a clear idea of the issues associated with it. Um, and I hear you, and I, I consider you very brave to say what you have just said, but that's fine. <laughs> I, um, but, but that being said, let me just get, I know you want, but, but very short and then we just wrap up, all right? Because I mean, we really are close, I mean, yes, go ahead.
First of all, thanks Mr. Clark in response to both of them. My, my thing is the latter part of Mr. Clark's description is an advanced corporate institution. I want to go back to the SME. Eight years ago, the company I worked for used to be an SME. Today, we're $1.5 billion turnover business, regulated by multiple central banks in Africa and the FCA. Let me tell you something. I've been a banker for 20 years. I hear bankers, we say this all the time, risk, risk, risk. The models we're running are significantly a cake. We need to look at homegrown models and look at things again. Hang on, hang on. Let me land. Hang on one minute. But, but, but Just one minute. One minute, Robert. One moment. One, one second. Moment. Because, uh... Three years ago, to be able to sustain our growth as a business, we went to friends and families and said, give us monies and we'll share our return with you. Then we went to SEC regulators companies and said, create an instrument for us. In banking, we call it commercial paper. That's what banks are forgetting to do. Banks are forgetting that the instruments exist but we're very one-track modeled in the way we approach the instruments. And so we hurt the SMEs and they don't grow because the SMEs on their own are not risky. The SMEs have overnight need. They don't have long-term need. And if we did that, then we help them to look like the way he described in the latter part of his presentation. But I mean well, and I'm happy to be here. <laughs> okay. The only, the, the only point I will add, and, and before I, and my sum up, and, the only, and to this point, and, is that when we talk about SME finance, SMEs issues, financing is one element in the whole ecosystem when you want to develop SMEs. And I want to make that point. So a lot of times we focus on the financing element and the issues associated there. But you need to finance in both Africa, or you need to, to develop in both Africa, where I've seen, and also in the Caribbean, the ecosystem to support SME financing. So it's more than just financing. And in that regard, I mean, if I could, anyone could, I think they're all public documents, but I mean, we, for example, the, and if this is the only plug, or I'm not supposed to represent them, but we are doing a particular plug as part of the Inter-American Development Bank, a, a very interesting project in Jamaica, where that's exactly what we are using as a model with IDB Lab, to look at the whole ecosystem all right, and then try to determine from each aspect of the ecosystem, what are the type of institutions to help deal so that when the problem, when the project reaches for financing, all right, it is in a state of readiness and in a position to go. So, so that's kind of what you need to do. And hopefully, if we get it right in Jamaica, we intend to then be able to roll it out in some of the other Caribbean countries to help facilitate the development of that ecosystem. That's my only plug and advertisement of what we are doing at the IDB. All right, um, let me close now. Let me go back to members of the panel and ask basically to make some wrap-up statements and closing remarks on any, any issue that they think that will be required to help improve the whole ecosystem of the value chain with regard to finance and investments flows in the Caribbean region. Let me ask Clevinson to kick us off and then please, let's go down the line. Sure. Thank you very much, uh, Robert. This has been a very interesting uh, discussion and I think the for me, the, the, the key takeaway from this is that if we want to achieve our objective of facilitating trade and investment, it cannot be business as usual. Absolutely. Uh, we, we have to be able to modify our systems in, the, in the order to be able to deliver on what is the key objective. So once we, once we define that objective, you know, my, my dad once said to me, you, you have to know what you're prepared to lose. And once you're, you know what you're prepared to lose, then everything becomes easier. And, and, and therefore, I think we have to be able to define our objective. And if trade and investment is the objective that we have, then we have to look at the systems that we put in place to be able to, to achieve that. And, and you know, I think the point which Mr. Clark made uh, indirectly is that a key aspect of this is that we have to be able to provide uh, financial and advisory services to the small business sector because there are gaps and they're not going to be able to overcome those gaps on their own. So they're going to need support. 
whether it is coming directly from the banks or it's coming from institutions established uh, by the public sector, by uh, NGOs that just want to help, somebody has to be able to provide that assistance to enable uh, small businesses to be able to thrive. Because at the end of the day, you know, as Andrew points out, he starts from, a, from a very on the ground and he grows to be in the large. A few will grow to be large, not all will grow to be large. Uh, Mr. Clark makes the point that quite a few may fall along the way. And, you know, when we deal with big business, we often look at syndicated loans as a way of diversifying our risks. And maybe we might need also for to be able to pool small loans and to, diver and to diversify by having a package of these small loans by X and a package up by Y so that you don't suffer all of the loss. Because I've looked at development banks over time and you see that development banks, and, and this is not the your development bank, but the, the national development banks often have a bad track record and because there's no diversification, all of their projects within the, diverse, within the development bank are really risky projects and you know, not all of them are going to succeed and then you find that the development bank fails. But I think the model is really set up to fail in, in, in some cases because you, know, you, you have all risky projects and maybe uh, as it relates to small business, this is something that we also need to look at uh, going forward. Okay, thank you, please. So, I, the statistics that came out this morning from, I think it was IT, says that 0.1% of Africa's exports, 0.1% goes to the Caribbean. And only less, and less than 1% of Caribbean exports to Africa. That in itself, what it said it has a potential of a $1 billion potential. You know, it also says that 70% of African exports to the Caribbean are in their primary form. That's about $700 million. Another 50% of Caribbean exports to, the, to, to Africa is chemicals, 200, about $200 million. What it tells us is that for Africa to trade with the Caribbean as, as much as we wish it, we have to start begin becoming industrialized and expanding our value chains across the, across the regions. What this means is that we have a huge opportunity here to industrialize, to be a bit more industrial oriented as economies, um, um, especially, you know, so, that we can trade with e so that we can trade with each other, talking about value chains. There are so many sectors where the value chains can be expected, even in the sector where the working with the EU and African, uh, the African free, uh, free Trade Area, we are a secretariat, Continental Free Trade Secretariat, we are working on you know, an automotive strategy. We are working on a textile strategy. There are so many areas where we can diversify, where we can expand the value chains into the Caribbean and vice versa. The only thing I have to say here is that this is another conference, but I, I think we should take advantage of the opportunities that this presents such that we can grow, trade, indeed grow it. It doesn't become another opportunity. It doesn't become another conference where we talk and then, you know, and then disperse. It's actually take advantage of this opportunity to network, you know, to take advantage of the opportunity of the products that we have talked about, approach Invest Barbados, for instance, to seek out or the um, Caribbean private sector organization to seek out opportunities that that's for those who are coming from Africa in the Caribbean or seek out African Business Council, or even Africa Exim Bank for that matter, for opportunities that exist in Africa. We should not waste this opportunity. They often say that opportunity has a shelf life. Thank you very much. Okay, Simon. Thank you, thank you. Uh, and then I, think I will piggyback on what uh, Canario was saying in terms of opportunities. We, through our local banks, do see a lot of opportunities uh, that we can present to you businesses in, in, from the Caribbean. So if you were around, my team is around, uh, Mr. Abdullahi and uh, Diallo and Bangura Mohammed are here, I'm here. And so if you all want to know what's going on in our countries of this, this specific sector of interest, we're happy to link you with potential players on the ground so you can do business. And again, as part of the ecosystem, Obviously, to promote Caribbean Africa trade, you need players. You need, as Kenazo mentioned, everybody needs to play his role in the ecosystem. We, as an investor in financial services, are interested in being in the Caribbean. We will be here, and we will provide that linkage between Africa and the Caribbean 
to finance people that want to do business in the Caribbean or Caribbean doing business in Africa and vice versa. And by being present here on both sides of the aisle, we will also alleviate that issue of corresponding bank and payment. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Andrew? Thank you, Robert. Thank you, everybody, again. So I think I, I just want to take us back to why we came here. We came here to open up new corridors. We didn't come for talk shop. We came to create the new, that new order that is the Africans and the Caribbean people coming together to do this. The SME will represent the largest pool, 70% of that. I told you the new market we're creating has a potential of $3 trillion. If the SME will represent that, then I need us to remember that the tree that is going to move will be predominantly $30,000 and $50,000 in value. The large players are only going to be 5 to 10% of that. Those are the ones Afri Exit Bank will finance. The rest of them are local banks will finance, or they use their own funds to move money across the borders. If that stands to be correct, then the point I'm making is we need to go back to policy, we need to have a shift in policy, we need to go back to regulation, and we need to take the products we have and recalibrate those products to make this possible. And in the UK, we had something called the Khalifa Report. The Khalifa project was that, look, when all of that was done for us, the fintechs, what do we do? We build a hand-holding program for them. Let's build hand-holding programs for them also so that this will work. And the first move under this hand-holding program, I would encourage Afri Exim Bank, is Kenya Airways does this very well, and that's how they grew. In fact, Kenya Airways and Ethiopian Airlines, what you do is you take SMEs, you take the banks in the top Caribbean countries, pick five, and you take the banks in five big countries in Africa, and you carry the bankers, ideally the risk managers, the compliance managers, and their managing directors, and you carry them into these markets and spend two weeks on a working visit to understand the market, to understand it from a banking perspective and how the trade activities are happening. That will remove the bias and the perceptions that you are going to meet as barriers as we move the trade program. So that's my encouragement to us. Otherwise, I'm happy to be here. Thank you very much. All right. Gabriel? Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Very well spoken, and everyone very well spoken. I think for us, there has to be a deliberate attempt. Um, my colleague spoke like a true banker. You know, I was a banker also for very many years. Now I'm investing, and I understand the pains of the SMEs. Now I'm financing SMEs uh, and trying to structure them. I understand the pains. But it must be deliberate. This must be deliberate because without that bedrock, you can't do very much. Okay? And that's why I gave the model that we use today to do that. And it's something that we're very willing to discuss you know, uh, and see whether it's something that we can operate here, uh, where we call the AfriCelerate program to get this whole lending thing done. It's working. It is working, and SMEs are getting the benefits of that, you know. Um, and just to add to a couple of things that um, uh, Afrexim said, Afrexim Bank, you know, um, they can't do it all, okay? They've come up with all of the beautiful products. They have the financing available. There has to be companies and people willing to do the last mile. So those of you who are here, I would encourage you, take one of those issues. Take one of those products. Do it. Set up export development companies. Set up these Africelerate kind of companies. Set up, you know, things that can facilitate and you can act as the last mile. For instance, Oakwood acts as the last mile for them. We have an advisory company set up purposely to be <laughs> Oakwood Green Capital purposely to be able to speak the language of Afrexim and explain it to you so that you can have access to their products. There are some other advisory companies here like Pan-Africa Capital, and that's what they do, okay? The other thing, there are logistic companies. I know that there are a couple of logistic companies that came here today because I wonder why don't we have, you know, water transports across, you know, all of the islands? Why should I fly to Grenada? Why can't I use a nice boat? I know there's a, there's a logistics company here that can move bananas, you know, from uh, uh, St. Kitts down here. Magdan shipping is here. I think Magdan should begin to explore the possibility of coming to set up that transport within and also, you know, bridging it uh, um, across um, the divide. I want to see and, and the, the fact that, you know, uh, 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 this powerful product that Afrexim 
Bank is doing currently in West Africa, Pan Africa Payment Settlements, you know, where I can I can send you know sugarcane from here to Ghana, and I get paid, you know, in in Barbadian dollar, and Ghana can send cocoa from their markets and they get paid in you know Ghana CD, and there's no need for the dollar. I think that is a concept that definitely we have to adopt in, in CARICOM as well. You know? So there are opportunities and I see them already. For instance, because I also own uh, a banking chain across West Africa, definitely, you know, um, if the banks here, the first thing is to partner with the banks here to see how we can work together. So I deliver West Africa you know, to the CARICOM and CARICOM delivers, you know, and the banks here deliver CARICOM to West Africa. Otherwise, we would establish here as well. And I think the government, uh, the governor is here, so perhaps an application will be coming soon to establish because if you don't have banks talking to each other okay who can ens ensure facilitation of payments and settlements then then this is not going to work so we're, we're coming governor <laughs> okay finally okay. Yeah. Definitely, definitely I agree that the, we need to think outside the box and come up with creative solutions um, I know these guys have a lot of ideas they are in the technology space and we we willing to speak to you all and, and try to, to understand and facilitate and develop some of these things ourselves perhaps with your help and uh, one, one thing, not in terms of innovation, but one, one idea that, that crossed my mind is that to facilitate the, the development of trade and investment between the Caribbean and Africa, one of the things we maybe need to look at is taxation yes. and having a double taxation agreement so that when you are taxed in, in, in Ghana, you don't, your profits that are repat repatriated don't have to be taxed, te taxed back in the Caribbean and vice versa. So that's one of the areas for the policymakers to think about, um, and we could put that forward. A quick plug for Republic Bank. I, I didn't get a chance to say that we are a regional group. We have, en we have entities in 13 territories in the Caribbean, from Guyana and Suriname in, in the south, in mainland territories, right up to Cayman Islands and BVI. I know BVI was represented here, and then we have Ghana. So we are well integrated, full financial services industry. In Barbados, the banking system is very well capitalized. We are very liquid, and the interest rates are at all time lows in Barbados and in the other areas of the Caribbean. So now is the time to actually make the plunge. You can borrow cheaply, and the banks have a lot of money to lend. So let's now is a good time in terms, of, in terms of the financial decision, let, let, the financial decision part of it. Let us make this happen. Right. Yeah. So in wrapping up, we clearly have political will. We clearly have a market. We clearly have financial products as for Acroex and Bank, all right? Um, what is clearly coming out, again, is the whole ecosystem and the need for local financing for our SMEs to develop the institutions to be able to push the products. But it has happened before. Investments have been made by Republic Bank. They give us an idea of what are some of the things that we need to look at. This is possible. This is the dawn of a new day. Let's just not talk about the negatives. Let's talk about looking at the market, staying forward, and putting the different things in place. These things are not impossible. It just requires the time, the energy, and the will to make it happen. And in the words of Nike, let's just do it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. LeHunt and panel. I'm going to ask two members of the panel to remain on stage, Mr. Claveston Haynes, Governor of the Central Bank of Barbados, and Mrs. Kanayo Awani, Executive Vice President, Intra-African Trade Bank, ex Afrexim Bank, and uh, they will be signing an agreement for the Caribbean African Trade and Investments Promotion Program Framework.
Ladies and gentlemen, we are running very late. I would appreciate it if the stage could be cleared for the signing ceremony. Thank you for your cooperation. We're now proceeding with the signing ceremony for the Caribbean African Trade and Investments Promotion Program Framework.
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We are about to start the next panel, so if you don't mind taking your seat so we can get going. I know it's been a long day for everyone. We'd like to keep it moving. So once you're all seated, we will begin the next panel, promoting the orange economy. Africa and Caribbean and cultural, Caribbean cultural and creative industries. Thank you. That's mine, yeah. Okay, so that's what you say. All right, they don't, they're not operating here, so just call them. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I know you have a lot to discuss. It's been a stimulating day. There is more stimulation to come, so if you don't mind taking your seats so that the next panel may begin. Thank you very much. I see some people moving. All right, I'd like to begin this afternoon's session, which is entitled Promoting the Orange Economy, Africa and Caribbean Cultural and Creative Industries. My name is Adrian Green, representing the National Transformation Initiative. This session will begin with remarks from Senator Dr. The Honorable Chantal Monroe Knight, Minister in the Office of the Prime Minister, of the government of Barbados. Senator Dr. Monroe Knight, please. Round of applause, please, for the Senator. Good evening to everyone. And thank you for participating in this session. Thank you very much um, to Adrian for his introduction. Um, I'm very, very pleased, of course, to have the opportunity to speak at this very first edition of the Afro-Caribbean Trade and Investment Forum on the topic, Promoting the Orange Economy, Africa and Caribbean Cultural and Creative Industries. Somebody just asked me if I could demonstrate the dance of Barbados, given that this is um, a session on culture and creative industries. And I, and I had to refuse, unfortunately, um, but I will make sure that the organizers on the next occasion have persons perhaps who are better than I um, to be able to do that full demonstration. But let me first congratulate the foresight of the organizers for placing this discussion on the agenda in the midst of what has been termed a trade and investment forum. It underscores a recognition that culture and creative industries, including frontier technologies, are transformative forces that undergird social and economic development. The resolution of the 74th session of the United Nations General Assembly, establishing 2021 as the International Year of Creative Economy for Sustainable Development, is an acknowledgement of the increased role of creative economy on the global stage. As a new republic that has been forged in the midst of what is perhaps the most existential crises facing the world, the crisis of climate, the crisis of health, including the COVID-19 pandemic and the crisis of debt. There is perhaps in this moment 
a more acute appreciation that culture and the creative industries are key channels through which we can forge our way in a world that is somewhat hostile to small states and where global inequalities are entrenched. The use of the creative industries can allow us to tell our own stories in our own way, to reframe our own narrative and create new and vibrant economies that are fueled by the unleashing of the innate potential within our people. Furthermore, because the cultural and creative industries have relatively low barriers to entry, the creative economy is a sector that is generally inclusive and agile. It therefore can play a significant role in forging of an economic model which is truly grounded and people-centered. We know that the global economy has traditionally been dominated by trade in goods, spurred by the far-reaching hand of the Bretton Woods and the international financial institutions. As we have moved to engage in trade and services, our economies are still primarily tied to sectors that are highly dependent on the international fortunes. The COVID-19 pandemic and its devastation of tourism-dependent economies, as well as the crippling of our financial services industries by extra-regional over-regulation, suggests the need to look critically at how our economies are in Injected into the global architecture. We have the opportunity, the Caribbean and Africa, to rewrite the script if we can propel the expansion of the creative economy between ourselves. While we note that within the context of the COVID-19 pandemic and the attendant policies, the creative se sector suffered some setbacks, it is also one of the sectors that has the best potential to be resilient and nimble. The industry was estimated at US $2.25 billion and contributed to more than 29.5 million jobs worldwide in 2015. By 2017, it had grown to more than 9 trillion of the world economy and of 18 trillion according to the McKinsey Global Institute. It is therefore one of the fastest growing sectors. Who better than the Caribbean and Africa with our rich history, talent, ingenuity, energy, passion, and may I add style to be leaders of this orange economy. If we acknowledge that we have a past that was based on theft, our people were stolen, our wealth was stolen, our history erased, reframed, rewritten, and our place in the world marked by terms such as small, underdeveloped, failed, on tap. Is it not about time that we claim our space in the world economy? I could use this opportunity to speak specifically to the deepening ties between Barbados and various countries in Africa. I do want to add that Barbados has taken a deliberate and strategic policy to engage our brothers and sisters on the continent because there is an ancestral pull in the naval string, in our naval string, but also because in the rewriting of the script, we recognize the innate potential to create a new center of global commerce and activity that is more resonant of who we are. I do want to note that this government is intent on maximizing the potential of the orange economy and in the manifesto of the government, there was a specific section dedicated to the orange economy as one of the strategic growth pillars of this country. The government's position is spurred by the understanding that the creation of an enabling environment for the promotion of creative economy can spur growth, specifically new jobs for a wider pool of persons in previously undervalued areas, and the intent, therefore, is to energize the industry by encouraging creativity, innovation, and entrepreneurship. One of the clear areas that we must pay attention to to ensure that we are able to maximize the benefits for this sector, and importantly, to safeguard against further theft, is that of intellectual property. And secondly, redressing the ownership imbalance in the high value areas of the industry. 
This forum, therefore, provides an excellent opportunity to expand, to network, to collaborate, to give impetus to an area whose potential is immense. This interaction that we have here today must jumpstart the process of infusing in our collective societies bound by history and circumstance. The desire, actually not just the desire, but the imperative to collaborate in expanding our cultural links and interaction. I do want to challenge you that in your deliberations that you are both bold and concrete. We are in a particular moment when there is a clear consensus that we must go together. There is therefore no time to waste. There is, my friends, an opportunity to be seized. I thank you. Thank you, Senator Dr. Chantal Monroe Knight. I'd like to introduce now the discussants on the panel. First, I'd like to invite to the stage Senator Ben Murray Bruce, founder of the Silverbird Group and co-chair co of Creative Africa Advisory. I'd like to invite Senator John King, Special Advisor to the Division of Heritage and Culture, Barbados. And last, but certainly not least, we have Mr. Uzodinma Iwala, Chief Executive Officer of the Africa Center. So gentlemen, we are here to discuss promoting the orange economy, the cultural and creative industries of Africa and the Caribbean. And as was mentioned earlier, it is notable that the cultural and creative industries are, have a seat at the table in these discussions on trade, business, and profit. And the Prime Minister of Barbados noted this morning in her opening speech that in order for us to work together, Africa, the continent, and the region, we must know each other. And one of the major ways that we get to know each other is through an interchange and an exchange of, of culture. Recently, Barbados had its national festival, Kwapova, and one of the premier events at the national festival was spearheaded by Nigerian superstar Burna Boy, it was promoted by a company out of Trinidad, and it was held here in Barbados in the midst of our national festival. So if this is not cultural in exchange and interchange, I don't know what is. However, I am an artist, I'm a spoken word artist, and a columnist. <laughs> respect, respect to the Beijing and the house who know what I'm talking about. And I have found that when discussing the cultural and creative industries, and the importance of these sectors to the region, to the nation, to the diaspora, the African diaspora, Africa and the diaspora, we rush quickly to the question of, all right, how do we make money? But I would like to stay, take a step back, or a few, step back, few steps back, and ask, do we have the necessary pillars, elements of industry in place to efficiently profit from the cultural and creative industries. And if not, what will it take to put those in place? I'd like to start with you, Senator King. Thank you. I think the two fundamental things that you need to look at very early are distribution and information. And I'll tell you why. If you know what is happening in Africa, you know what is happening in Barbados. So I know what's happening in fashion. I know what's happening in film. I know what's happening in whatever, whatever the undertaking is, and vice versa within, within the region. Then you have uh, something to start with. Where I think one of the problems that we've faced for a very long time is the, the ability to distribute whatever it is that is, that, that is being done. So for instance, you mentioned Bernard Boy coming to Barbados. One of the things that was the equalizing that is that we had the information of who Burner Boy was. 
and this comes from the internet having been opened up. So you got TikTok, you got all of these other things that makes the flow of information now a lot easier than it was in the past, let's say when people like myself and other generations were performing. No one had the opportunity to see what was happening in other parts of the world. And you were fed only the information that came for you, came to you either via North American media or you didn't know about it at all. So we've got that aspect covered. What we need to do now is to provide the other avenue for ownership and distribution of the things that we create between ourselves. And so I think we have the basic things in place um, to do that, but governments have to take a leading role in facilitating um, the creatives being able to collaborate, to do business, to do all of those things. So I think that there is a room or scope, um, just as what we're doing now, these types of forums uh, are the first steps in us being able to ha put those synergies together that both sides of the, the water can, can benefit from what is happening. There are skills, um, there are stories, there are other things that we can collaborate and, and share and, and exchange. So I think, again, um, this is a good starting point but there's, there are things that need to be done at a governmental le level, which would entail, again, facilitation of business, the ease of doing it, the information of what does it take to do business in the Caribbean or in Nigeria or, or any other part of the African continent. These are crucial things so that in the decision-making of creati creatives as to how do I get my, my, what it is I have to offer into this market, what are the barriers that I'm going to be facing, these are the type of things that you, do, you need to do on the information end, but then on the actual being able to move commodities, shipping, air travel, these are going to be significant things, and that, that's, that's how I see it. Thank you, Senator King. Senator Bruce, Senator Murray Bruce, yeah. you began in the entertainment industry, I believe, in the 80s as a promoter. So you've seen the changes in the industry in Nigeria. What are some of these changes that you have seen? What have you not seen? What would you like to see? Has it, has it developed as fast and as, as efficiently as it should have? I, I'll, I'll give you a big background. We got our independence in 1960. I was a kid, I was born in 56. At that time, the music in Nigeria was all British. Rolling Stones, the Beatles, stuff like that, maybe a little bit of Elvis. Then we had the Civil War, then music, was from the Congo, play a lot of Congo music, Ghanaian music, high life music. And that changed and it became American music. The Nigerian artists were not fully developed. We had some, Sonny Kusum, Fela Nicola Kokuti, he developed, and so on and so forth. And then they invented the cassette. When they invented the cassette, as opposed to buying a record, where people could not really afford from the gramophone to the record, then people started listening to more music because then there was only one radio station, one TV station. So with the cassette, more people listened to music. And as time went by, they invented what they called the VHS. When they invented the VHS, Nigerians started producing movies, maybe $300 a movie, $500 a movie, $5,000 a movie. People started watching movies, right? And so if you look at technology, as technology developed and improved, Nigerian music was taking over the world and we progressed. But while the entertainment industry was developing in leaps and bounds until we got to the digital age where we could dominate the world without getting paid, Nigerian governments were going through one military coup to another military coup to another military coup. Then in, then in uh, 79, we had democracy. And we've had that since 1980. But in the course of that, leaders were more concerned about staying in power than promoting the artist. When I come here, I listen to your speakers. You talk about culture, you talk about trade, you talk about slavery, you talk about things that have nothing to do with power and abusing each other, whether you're Christians, you're, you're Muslim, and that kind of stuff. So when I, listen, when I come here and I listen to your leaders across the island, I listen to another mindset. You're different, totally different. When you're in Africa, we have Idi Amin, we have all kinds of leaders who want to be in power forever. There are some presidents who have been in office for 30, 40 years. 
right? When a man is in power for so long, entertainment or culture is not his priority. And if you look at Africa, which countries promote culture? Egypt, Ghana, South Africa, a couple of countries. A lot of countries don't. You, you, you're not going to go to Congo and you're talking of culture. They're talking of killing each other, right? So, so if you look at Africa and you break it down to what we have, monetizing the success of an artist is not a priority of the government. But the success of Africans is in spite of government. Poverty in Africa has allowed Africans become successful. Our success has nothing to do with government. You look at the French national team, all black people. This kid could have been in jail or dead if they didn't have an outlet to become immigrants in France to play soccer or to become a musician. The entertainment industry, sports industry, which is what trillions of dollars as the Minister of Culture just talked about, is dominated by black people. They're either from Africa or they're from South America. The heavyweight champion of the world is not going to be a white kid who went to Harvard, Yale, Oxford, or Cambridge University. The heavyweight champion of the world in boxing is going to be a black person or a South American. Poverty breeds hunger. Hunger creates opportunity. Opportunity gives you a chance to be successful and create wealth. Now, the question is, do we create wealth? The answer is yes. Do we generate the money for ourselves? The answer is no. Now, why don't we generate the income for ourselves? And that's because of bad government. If we had good government, all the money being generated by sports or music and the movie industry in Africa will come back to the Africans and we can create a very successful society. Now, when we come here through Africa Bank, you have the Caribbeans. Your thought process is different. I'm listening to you. You remind me of the civil rights struggle with Martin Luther King, Jesse Jackson, and all those guys, Harry Belafonte, who was a friend of mine, and Andy Young, and all those guys. You remind me of conversations I had with those guys in that generation. But you're different. In Africa, they don't think like that. Ghana does because they have right of return. But when I was in the Senate, I proposed a bill that anybody taken out as a slave from Nigeria who can prove by DNA they are Nigerians who have a Nigerian passport, 108 senators voted against me. I presented another bill, and I said, we must, this is the bill for electric cars. I said, by 2035, we must ban all combustion engine cars in Nigeria. 108 senators voted against me, okay? So we're talking about a revolution of the mind. And if you don't have the revolution of the mind, you cannot run a country where 75% of the kids are under the age of 35. That generation is what you call an MTV generation. They're not interested in going to Harvard or Yale or going to university. They wake up in the morning, they want to sing, they want to dance, they want to jump, they want to run, they want to be famous. You give that kid a chance to be under the bright light so they can be famous and rich, or being in prison, in poverty, they will choose the bright light. But the government must give them that choice. So if they have that choice in France so they can play for the French national team, change their nationality and become Americans, change their nationality and become British and run for the British national team, they will take those options because the government and the leaders of Africa do not give them those options. The government and the leaders of Africa are more concerned about staying in power for 20, 30, 40 years than worrying about the entertainment industry. That has to be resolved. Then you will see wealth and success for African kids. So what I'm hearing you articulate sounds like a particularly difficult cycle to break because you're talking about a revolution of the mind yes. that is necessary. Yeah. One, of the, one of the major ingredients to bringing about a revolution of the mind are the arts, creativity, mm -hmm. and culture. But if you are saying that we have governments who are not necessarily as interested as they should be in developing the arts, the creative industries, and the culture as is needed, then it makes it difficult for that revolution to ever occur. And if, on the other hand, you have young people who are hungry and starved for this in their own countries and do not have it, the incentive for them to, to embark on a career in the cultural and creative industries is not there. We have a younger person, if not a young person, on the Very panel young. in uh, Mr. Iwala. 
Mr. Iwala, can you speak to this need for a revolution of the mind that is necessary for us to develop creative and cultural industries and how you think it can come about? Sure, I can totally do that. Um, first of all, it's great to be here and it's good to be here with all of you and also with my two distinguished senators. Um, look, I think one of the things I really sort of like about the way you started was in a sense decoupling from the get-go the creative industries from, or creativity from the economic aspect of things. They are very much related, but they are also very much separate and exist in different spheres. And I think when you, you and I think you know, what was said, right, is when you put the two of them together too, too closely or too easily, then you move away, you move right into the, like, the rote money-making situation and away from the revolution of the mind that Senator Murray Bruce is talking about and that Senator John King was also talking about. And so what does it mean? It means, for me, you're talking about what are the fundamental stories that help shape the way that we think and how do those stories then impact everything from the way we structure our politics to the way that we structure our economies to the way that we relate to each other to what the, the Prime Minister said earlier, you know, this idea of getting to know each other as a way of then moving into the transactions that we need to do. To be more concrete, if you're speaking about revolution of the mind, what is more revolutionary than, say, Things Fall Apart, written by Chino Achebe in terms of a critique not only of colonialism, but a critique of our own societies and the way that we govern ourselves? You know, and then the later books from that tr trilogy, which were a critique of post-independence Nigeria. What's more revolutionary in terms of reshaping the way that we think than some of the books or movies that are being produced by younger Africans, say, or Caribbean uh, filmmakers? I'm thinking of Atlantique by um, Mati Diop, which really talks about crime, it talks about immigration, it talks about the opportunities or lack of opportunities for young people in Senegal. Like, these are all stories and narratives that are so essential to helping us think through, realize, embody who we are as people. And those are narratives that I think are also crucial that we are sending across, that are not just limited to the, to the countries where they are, but that are sent across so that we can get to know each other, right? So that we should be making sure that African films are being watched over here in the Caribbean. We should be making sure that we are speaking or taking Caribbean literature and helping that allow us to shape an idea of who we are to each other, who we are to ourselves as African diaspora people, as black people, because that's where that revolution starts. That's where that shifting of understanding starts, and that's where the power base grows, right? That's where we're then able to say, no, we should realize all the gains and the profits from our creativity and from our, from our activities. No, we should you know, be in positions of political power, both in our countries and, and globally. Um, it's about that thought process that comes from the creative space, that comes from people having the time, the ability, the energy to create and think differently from the systems and structures that we have found ourselves embodying. You, you know, the idea of thinking differently from the systems and structures that we embody, which we have inherited, resonates with me. And I read a quote um, from you where you said that we have made the mistake in, in African countries, and I include the countries of the Caribbean and the diasporans in that, in that framework, we have made the mistake, or we should not make the mistake, of replicating the problematic and flawed economic systems from Europe and America. And I think that this comment extends also to the systems and structures of the creative and the cultural industries. These are terms that were created well after those industries were mature in Europe and, and America. Gentlemen, what do we need to do differently as we reimagine the future of the cultural and creative industries of Africa and the diaspora? What do we need to do differently today? I'll start with you, Senator Bruce. It's very, very simple. It's not complex at all. When Kennedy asked NASA to put a man in the moon, did he ask NASA if they were ready if they could do it? When Trump asked NASA to put a man in Mars, did he go to NASA, hey, NASA, uh, you think you can put a man in Mars? When they're going to send a rocket right now around the moon, did he get permission to see if they could do it? You just do it. If we had good leadership, there's nothing we're talking about. Well, to get people to sing and dance is the most basic request you can make to a human being. To get somebody to run 100 meters, you're telling him to run from this point to that point and come first. You're telling the guy to swim. Is, is 
that, is that difficult to get somebody to swim across this little piece of water and come first? You tell somebody to act. Africa is the new frontier. They like our stories. Every story that can be told from Europe has been told. This is boring. Every story from America is being told is boring. Now they go to South America and it's getting boring. African stories have not been told. So what, what you, you, with an IQ of minus five, with a good leader, with some brains in Africa, you can fix this problem. I, I, I don't understand. We're having an elementary primary school conversation. I am, I am going to. I mean, I don't know how, I don't I, know how, I, how, to, how, how do you explain to a leader with a machine gun trying to kill the other guy, trying to accuse this of being a Muslim or a Christian, and, and trying to find his perceived enemies, and then telling him, uh, by the way, we have to build a museum so we can see some dinosaurs. He's not interested in any dinosaur. He's not interested in your history. He's not going to talk like you and say, hey, um, you know, slaves were taken from here 400 years. Say, so what? I, I, get, I get you, Senator Bruce, but I want, yeah. to, I want to problematize so it. So that's why I, I, I don't know what complex. you want me to do. I want to make it a little bit more complex because there is no, there's no question that complex. we have the talent. How do, you, how do you make it complex? There, there is no question that we have the talent. Yes. One of the Caribbean's leading experts on the cultural and creative industries, Professor Keith Nurse, mm -hmm made the statement to me a few months back that Jamaica, which is arguably the most culturally and creative fertile nation in the Caribbean today, yeah. spends more money importing books than it makes in reggae music. So while the talent is there, and there's no question about that, developing the infrastructure around the talent may not be as simple and may not be as straightforward. Even here in Barbados, we have several talented people. Can I ask, can I, can I ask you a question real quick yes, so, so we can be very quick around this? Go in ahead. Nigeria, they have built a stadium in almost every city, except that they don't have football teams. But we have the stadiums. We have the stadiums. Go around, there are beautiful stadiums across Nigeria, but there's no football team to play in the stadium. What do you, what do you think, Mr. Iwala? So I mean, maybe the, <laughs> the risk. He, he's going to be politically correct. No, listen, because his mother listen, was to be the Minister no, of Finance. Senator, let me, and let me, she's a powerful me, woman, so he may not be, let me I don't say, know. No, let me say this, but I think it goes back to what you were talking about at the beginning, which is what are the structures, like the structures in place. Do we need to recreate the same thing that folks have created outside in terms of the infrastructure that's necessary for us is the first thing. And then two, how do you incentivize people to use it and to be creative with it, right? So, you know, we're talking about sports teams. Yeah. Do we need to build, you know, is it that we need to build the Premier League in Nigeria? Do we need to say that it's not, it's not valid unless we're realizing the same profits that Man United or Manchester City is, is realizing? Mm -hmm. Or are we going for something different? Like, what is, it, what is the actual profit? What is the actual benefit? Is the benefit the billions of dollars, or is the benefit the cohesiveness of community that culture, art, sports, and whatnot bring? And if, if we're saying it's only dollars, then we're going to create a system that's fundamentally exploitative. If we're saying that it's about the benefit, the cohesiveness, the getting to know each other as a society that these things bring, that a football match brings, that a, a, you know, a literary reading brings, that you know, a museum brings, right? that in terms of teaching us who we are about ourselves, teaching us you know, how we want to be as a society, that's a very different thing. And what I would say to that then, and, and what becomes essential, right, is one, who's in the room, right, who, who is talking about it, right, is, is most important. I mean, I think, for example, on this panel, like, you know, we're all guys up here. Is it a thing where we should have a different sort of makeup in terms of who is actually responsible for the creation of culture in a society? That's one. Two, I think it is, how do you convince people who are behind the money, right, and you know, we have to say that money does create exploitative systems, right? How do you convince those folks that the return on a cultural or a creative investment is very different from, say, the return on an investment in an oil field, right? That's a crucial thing. If you're able to convince people of that, then the way that culture works in your society, the way that the creative economy is built will be fundamentally different in our own societies in the Caribbean and across the continent of Africa than it will be, say, in the West, which is just about extracting the talent from black bodies, right? And I think this is what you're getting at when you talk about anyone can do it, but who can monetize it? Do we need to monetize it in the same way as the question that I ask? Well, that is an extremely, um, it is a, that is not a politically 
correct uh, <laughs> statement and a controversial statement to make at a trade and investment forum. <laughs> You're saying that the profit, the benefit of the creative and cultural industries should not necessarily be measured in dollars and cents. And even in countries where that are relatively stable, uh, we have political entities which are under pressure to, to make money quickly in the short term. Right, so I guess what I'm saying is that it's not about the immediate dollars and cents that you get if you on a, on a movie or whatever. It's about the cultural capital. It's about the transformative power. And I think what I'm urging those who are interested in investing in it from a dollar perspective to understand is that your return is actually much, much higher if you're thinking about the power of that sort of cultural asset and the power of that creativity. You might make, you know, I don't know, I'm, I'm thinking of a book, right? Let's talk about many forms of literature. You might invest in, in say, Chimamanda Adichie, right? She writes a book. That book, in dollar terms, is not going to return you that much, but the power that she has as a global cultural figure to shape the way that the world thinks about Africans, about black people, about diaspora people, you cannot, you can't put a price on that. And what she has then been able to do for all of you guys who have cash, right, is she's been able to make it that much easier for people to, to then take your deals seriously. That's something that you have to recognize in the, in the sort of the understanding of what creative economy does and what the creative economy actually is. It's not just dollar for dollar, like dollars in, multiples out. The multiples, if you're really thinking about it, and again, I think this is what you're saying in terms of why our leaders are stupid to not actually think about investing in these, in these areas. What someone like that can do for you in terms of your real economic terms, if you invest in that, is so far beyond what you're actually considering um, and so far beyond the, the just the, the say, 5% or the 10% profit you make off of that actual product. It's so much more. But you have to have the vision to actually see that. Senator King, um, I've been asked that we keep our comments brief yeah. to two minutes because we're running out of time. But as someone who represents a, a government in power and someone who has been charged with leading the cultural industries and the creative industries in the nation, you know, what do you have to say in, in your defense? And I would say I am very <laughs> glad that the audience clapped at that point about the cultural industries and creative industries being uh, the value being more than just in dollars and cents. But how do you, with these governments which are sometimes cash strapped, how do we find the money to invest? And how do you, how do you motivate investors in the private sector to see the point that Mr. Iwala and Senator, Senator Murray are making. All right, so in, so in Barbados' cultural industries bill, there are a number of incentives that have been placed there um, to, let's say, entice investment in the creative industry, so to speak. So for persons who are, let's say, you were building a museum or whatever you, you wanted to do, the incentives in terms of you being able to get back uh, taxes, you get duty-free status on, on different things. So there's, there are a number of, of incentives in there for that. But I think one of the crucial things that we continue to miss all the time when we have these particular conversations is what, what, what is one of the, the similarities between Nigeria, let's say for instance, and Barbados? Both being victims of colonialism. And in that experience, we would have been taught at that time that there is really no value on our own creativity. We've carried this, this sort of, and when you talk about a revolution in mindsets, this is part and parcel of the kind of mindsets that we've established or carried with us for a number of years. And so therefore, we find it easy to, let's say, buy American films, pay for American fashion, and do all of these. So we spend money and we expect American artists to be successful, or European artists to be successful. But when it comes to being able, and this is on the people's part, not just government, in terms of how we support those things, those creatives within our own environments, that in itself is also a part and parcel of the problem. So there's so much that governments can do but I think it goes beyond governments. And I'm not trying, like you said earlier, to defend anything. 
But when we think about our own mindsets, do we appreciate the art that our artists produce? Are we prepared to pay for it? Are we prepared to create a Hollywood? Or you, so you guys have a not have a Nollywood, well, Senator right? Mary Bruce okay, is one of right. the champions. And you have been you have been able to have your films go outside of Nigeria, across the continent, and even work their way into the Caribbean. So people begin to know who these persons are. And you've created that. And all I'm saying is that we need now, as people of African descent, to do the same thing, to be able to control the narratives, to be able to be the ones who said, OK, as I mentioned earlier, who's going to deal with the things like distribution? Because I, I, I heard you earlier, and I agree with you that it's more than dollars and cents. But we cannot run our economies on the basic things that were left to us by our colonizers. We have to be able to begin to look at what are the other talents, what are the other skills that we have, and also monetize them. So I'm not in the, in the, in the framework where it says that the money doesn't matter. Because in a small territory like this, how many people can be doctors? How many people can be lawyers? How many people can be just that same thing? You have to have scope we are creative people, singers, painters, whatever, whatever it is, even your technology people must be able to feel that there is an outlet for them that they can actually do this for a living. And I think we've got to start thinking in terms of, thank you, we've got to start thinking in terms of how do we support ourselves? Mr. How, how do we support ourselves? So I just, I want to say that I agree with you. It's not that I'm saying that the money doesn't matter. I'm more saying how does it matter, right? And so does it matter in that someone gets to own the rights to your, to own the copyright to your work or own your masters and extract all the value from that and not give it to you? Or does it matter in the sense that we create fundamentally, or systems that are fundamentally anti-exploitative where the artist themselves gets to benefit and the people who are investing in those artists also recognize that it's both about supporting it, as you said, from a, a sort of like a societal level, right? And, and then also it's about th what that person's creative output can do then for the society. So it's exactly. a symbiotic relationship. So exactly. Right. Exactly. So we're basically saying the same. So, so, so to jump off of that point, I love Fest up in here. So to jump off of that point, uh, there are some scholars who have put forward the idea of digital colonialism. And uh, Senator Murray talked about the advent of technology being important to the growth of the Nigerian entertainment industry, the indigenous Niger Nigerian entertainment industry. But there's a school of thought that the way digital and electronic infrastructure has been laid out in the contemporary moment mirrors, and, and more than mirrors, mimics the way um, physical infrastructure was laid out in the colonial era. And one scholar, Mr. Michael Quick, actually draws the parallel between the, the railroads in Africa and the internet in Africa, and how the, the infrastructure is laid down precisely to be extractive and exploitative and does not benefit the persons who are using it in the way that it should or could. Now, how do we balance the optimism of the potential of technology with the very real, real situation of not a historical exploitation, but contemporary exploitation? Anyone? I mean, I, I'll go. I think there are two things. And one is, you know, an example, I think, from Senator Murray Bruce himself, right, which is one, what infrastructure do you own? So, for example, when you build Silverbird and you created a, an internal infrastructure for people to actually be able to see movies, you know, at home in Nigeria, what happens? More movies are produced, more people right. own that actual content, mm -hmm. more money is kept in the economy, right? So it's not extractive. It's, it's, it ends up being circulating within our economy, right, right and building us up. So it's about building the infrastructure. And so, you know, to go back to the fact that we're at a, a banking trade and investment forum, you know, creativity is one thing, but also it's, you know, it is what are you paying for to support that creativity? So if we're talking about the digital economy, one of the things that makes um, it so exploitative and extractive is the extraction of data, right? What is the extraction of data? It's who controls the data centers, right? So where are the data centers for all the things that we do located 
they're not on the continent. I can tell you that for sure, because I have friends who are desperately trying to raise money to build these data centers so that you can actually have a streaming African company, right? Because if you're talking about Amazon, if you're talking about Netflix, if you're talking about Apple, what are those people doing? They actually, they own data centers, right? Where all of that stuff is stored and where all of your information goes. If we wanna make sure that we're able to support a digital creative economy, then we need folks like Afrexim Bank, we need all of the rest of you who are bankers and whatnot to be investing in things like building data centers, in actually supporting indigenous streaming services so that you know, our content has a place to live that is within our ecosystems and not Netflix and not necessarily Amazon so that that is taken out and then used to further entrap us. That's what I would say. So, yes, go ahead, sir. What he's talked about is music, the arts, the sports, is like having a poor people's convention. That's all he's talking about. And the rich man is in America or Europe, and the poor people are in Africa. If the government was to spend 1%, 2% of the national budget in the entertainment industry, and if he, for instance, was to set up a data center, and he needs $500 million or a billion dollars, and we support him so he can have that data center, you solve the problem. But as long as only poor people, the thing about it, the entertainment industry is for poor people. Rich people's kids are going to go to Harvard. They're not going to become a boxer. You know, your child is not going to be a boxer. Your child is probably not going to do the 100 meters dash. Your child is not going to be dancing on the street. Your child will be in school. The kids who do this are poor kids. And these poor kids don't have collateral. The collateral they have is in their legs, their arms, or in their head. So if you go to the bank and say, I want to raise $100 million, where's your collateral? Well, I, got, I, got, I wrote a song, I have a script for a movie, it's in my head. Which bank is going to finance your dreams? You're selling dreams. And that dream equates to cash. You have no cash, you have no collateral, you can't make any money. The white man has a structure in place. He says, OK, slavery is out of date. We can't do slavery anymore. So we enslave you intellectually. That's all. You just switch. They don't have to slave you like they did in those days. This is how they slave you. But let me tell you the biggest problem we have. I'll tell you a quick story, and then I'll get out of here. In 1984, I was executive director for Black Music Association, Quincy Jones, Stevie Wonder, and all those guys. They told me to put together a concert in Nigeria to raise money like Stevie Wonder and Michael Jackson did for We in the World. I got ready to raise money. And we're going to fly the Jacksons and everybody to Nigeria in 1984. I was executive director of a black music association. My job was to promote black music across Africa. And guess what? Everything was laid out. We're ready to go. Then the federal government of Nigeria arrested Fela and Nicola Pokuti. They put him in jail because he had 1,600 pounds in his pocket as he went through the airport. We had foreign, foreign currency control problems. When that happened, I got a call from my boss. They said to me, Mr. Bruce, how on earth do you jail the most famous musician to come out of Africa? And there I was. I couldn't answer the question. They jailed the most famous musician. He didn't kill anybody. He had 1,600 pounds in his pocket going through the airport. And we lost the chance to have the greatest musical event in Africa. Who does that? He wasn't on drugs. Well, he could have been, but he wasn't carrying drugs. <laughs> he didn't kill anybody, but he was sent to prison. He served two years, and released him. And I'm not going to mention the name of the president that put him in prison. Now, these are the type of problems I have. I've been in this business for a long time. I've done it for years. Now, how do you explain that? Would you jail Bob Marley because he had 1,600 pounds? Would you, would you put, uh, would you put who, who would you put in prison in the West? The mindset is different. And as long as we don't get the mindset right, everything you talk about is the economics. You're talking about the economics of the business. You're talking about, you're talking about the, the business of the show. In Nigeria, in Africa, they do the show. They don't do the business. But we need to do the show business. And unless that happens, nothing is going to change. Lastly, these African governments, they can kill the revolutionary, but they will never kill the revolution. They can kill the messenger, but they will never kill the message. One day, we will have great leaders, and we will change Africa.
Gentlemen, we are, we are running out of time, so I'm going to have to ask you. I'll take that as your wrap-up statement, yes, that's Senator it. Murray. I'm done uh, now. I ask you no more questions. Sen <laughs> Senator King, <laughs> your, your closing statement. I, I, th I think what it really boils down to, though, um, is us having the confidence in ourselves to invest in these things. And I listened very carefully when you, when you spoke about the lack of investment. Um, and now we're not talking about government now, but we're talking about financial institutions. And I go back to my earlier point, is that all of us in this room have at some point in time watched an American movie. We've supported it by going to the cinemas. We've bought them on DVDs. We bought them on v VCRs when, when they were that, that. And we have to have the confidence in our own creatives to support them. That means governments have to put frameworks in place for things like research and development, that sort of thing, uh, financial things at a point. But the banks and the other institutions have to be able, as persons in financing, to look at this trillion dollar industry and work out how much of it can we generate for ourselves by ourselves. And I think once we get past the, the notion that these things can only be done by other people, uh, we'll be on the right track. Because we, we said it earlier, we have the talent, we, we, we know that, we, we have the capabilities. And I think, as you mentioned earlier, ha making sure that we have the digital capacity uh, to deal with, 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 with all the digitization and all the things, that is something that we also need to look at. But I think our problem more than anything else lies with our lack of confidence that we can actually do these things and make money from them. Mr. Iwala. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll say that first and foremost, I think it's about daring. So letting creativity be creative across all sectors, looking to our creative arts for inspiration in so many of the other issues or so many of the other problems that we have to solve. That's what they're there for. We tell ourselves these stories so that we can learn how to live in a world and in a changing world it's even more important that we tell or distribute or produce as many different kinds of stories as possible. That's point one. Point two is that our creativity comes from this idea of diaspora. It's about the connections. It's about the fact that there are African people in the Caribbean. There are African people in America. There are Africans in Africa, all with stories that are so important and need to be told because those stories are going to help us build the world that we want to live in as opposed to the world that we have now. And so I would say I'm very excited about both the connections that we can make across the Atlantic Ocean and also the, the, the sort of the new output coming from younger voices, younger minds, and new ideas that if we foster the right kind of creative environment, we'll be able to realize. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for listening. Do we, do we have time for questions? No, we do not. No, we do not have time for questions. I'm so, 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 so sorry. Uh, but the, the gentleman will be here. You can. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Adrian Green and panel. Yes. Let's get the last panel for the evening onto the stage. Ms. Fifi Peters of CNBC Africa, please come on stage with your panelists. This is the final one for the night. So what a long day, hey? I feel like the session that's about to uh, take place right now is the one, 
is the one that's standing in between yourselves and your rum punch. <laughs> that we were told as travelers into your country was the thing to have at the end of what has been a long day. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I see a lot of excitement in the middle area of the room. Could I just kindly ask that we settle down? So that I don't keep too many people away from their poison of choice to unwind after what has been a really insightful and fruitful day, day one of the Afro-Caribbean Trade and Investment Forum. All right, I think we're pretty settled now. I see that the room has just gotten a little bit more intimate than was previously the case, that's fine. Uh, my name is Fifi Peters. I uh, come from South Africa, a company called CNBC Africa. I heard uh, at the beginning of the session, in fact, a lot of people sharing their testimonies about how long it took for them to get here. Uh, mine is about a day. Um, it was quite a, a lengthy and eventful trip, I suppose, from Johannesburg to Addis, Addis to Lagos, Lagos to Bridgetown, including a couple of hours of waiting uh, to reconnect to the plane. So when there was an announcement that was made a little earlier about reimagining direct flights from the continent to, to the Caribbean, I was really excited about that prospect. And so we are at the end of the day's program, as it were. This is the final lap, and uh, this last session will really be bringing home everything that has been shared with us uh, so far about this reimagined future that we have been discussing between Africa and the Caribbean, about this unification, what this looks like, how it can practically happen. And I use practically with emphasis because the next session will actually draw on a, pr a practical example of a company from Africa that came to the Caribbean and set up shop. And uh, we're going to get a sort of on the ground experience of what that looks like for many African companies who came here to attend this uh, forum to find out what kind of opportunity that would bring for them if they, if they were to act on the the many ideas that had been placed on, on the table today. We'll also be hearing from the government of uh, Barbados. They've got a plan, a plan that's centered around the future and making, making the future a lot brighter. And we're going to be unpacking the nuggets of that plan, which will require the participation of the private sector, private sector from the region and the private sector from, from the continent. And then I suppose you can't speak about the future without speaking about technology, right? Right. Um, and so we'll be drawing on some of the digital skills that will be required to impact on that future. So let me introduce you to the panel. Can I just ask for them to come, come up to the stage one by one for this final mile? Ms. Tamesha Etel, the Director of Future Barbados. She did say she has her, her squad, her cheerleading squad here. I believe her. We also have Mark Scott, the CEO of Joe de Carabé. My wonderful attempt at French. <laughs> uh, it is a subsidiary of the Aura developers who developed the luxury uh, Silver Sands Resort in uh, Granada. And uh, last but not least, Mr. Chika Nobi, founder of Decagon, Woo! <laughs> a company that trains software uh, engineers in Nigeria and also plugs them to international uh, opportunities. And ladies and gentlemen, just given that this is an intimate crowd, let's engage. <laughs> 
I did notice that uh, there wasn't sufficient time in the other sessions to ask questions. Hopefully, if there are any questions that went unasked that you feel any of my expert panel up here can can help you answer, please feel free to do so. There will be an opportunity. So, Tamesha, beginning with you, ladies first. Or always, always. All right. At last. Okay, okay, okay. First and last word. First word, though, a future Barbados. I mean, for the non Bayesian audience that is here who wants to know what that's all about, can you tell them what future Barbados is all about? In a nutshell, we were tasked by the Prime Minister, the rock star that you all heard from earlier, to find the talent on the 35 and to activate them to solve our problems. Essentially, we created this innovation think tank, which doesn't look like your typical incubators or accelerators, but brought together really smart people who wanted to make change in, in the country. What we've evolved into is we found very smart people who have very creative thinking and want to solve problems, but also want to help facilitate change rapidly. We are tasked to do in six months what will typically, typically take a government 15 years, several administrations to do. We, want to, we, want, we, we are tasked to make that happen now. Sure. And what that means is people and engaging with our talent. And we want the story that we want to create is that Barbados has talent. The Caribbean has talent. And not just your typical doctors, lawyers, uh, med uh, engineers, but creative thinkers in whatever field they're from. So whether you, whatever the field is you're working, we are trying to create that mindset that if we can do things differently and bring people together who are like-minded, that's, that's what sustainable change can look like. So, 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 so why the focus on uh, individuals who are under 35 specifically? Because young people are the future. We are the sustainable way of making things happen and longevity of it. The Prime Minister speaks a lot about intergenerational cooperation because if you don't bring young people into the fold and not in tokenistic ways where you're the youth person on the committee or you're the youth representative, but actively act engaging their professional experience that many youth under 35 have in, in ways, in current, current things happening on the ground, you're not going to have your next generation of, of politicians and ministers and CEOs. So that's why the focus to continuously change the mindset of how to integrate young people into everyday processes. Just lastly, what were some of the ideas, the innovative ideas so that many come ideas. out. Sure. Uh, so we had five thematic areas initially. So it started with future health, where we tried to tackle reducing childhood obesity, future safety, which tackled at crime and reducing recidivism rates for youth. We looked at future speak by making a more actively bilingual population. As I see my colleagues here with their translators on, we want some more people able to function in the global economy that we're creating. We had future, future work, which is what are the fundamentals for making Barbados the best place to live, work, and play. We had future well-being, which looked at mental health. We had future sports, eventually, which looked at cricket, and how can we make cricket and invest better in that global economy of cricket. And as you can imagine, future everything started coming out of that. Right. Uh, the ideas themselves. So we looked at um, creating apps for digitization and autom automation of of herbal medicine and trying to automate the processes, the chemical processes. We had crazy ideas of, of digital sports academies. We had crazy ideas of even bringing innovations here that are already happening elsewhere in the world, whether it's an underwater tuna scope to look at the health of tuna fish uh, globally. Those are the ideas that came out. Not all new. It's never about the new idea. It's about how can we do things that have been created in this moment and in this time. Right. So Mark, yours is a business that does make the Caribbean a little bit more pleasant and hospitable, one would, one would say, with just the Silver Sands luxury, luxury resort that, that you operate. So, so how long have you been there? Uh, why the decision of a company that is a subsidiary of an Egyptian-based company that does quite a lot of other things. They're in the, um, no, you recently sold your telecommunications asset, but you're in the media business, and uh, you're also in asset management. So, so, so help us understand what, was, what the thinking was to build this luxury resort in, in Granada, and, and how, how things are going. Sure. 
Um, so, yeah, well, I've been in Grenada personally for about 16 years, but I've been with this company, um, Joao de Grib, for the last three. Um, we're a wholly owned subsidiary of Aura Developers. It's the Egyptian company who are responsible for this event today. And Mr. Sawiris, who's the chairman of that company, asked me to represent him here. Um, and as you said, we're a little bit of a bridge in a way that we, um, as an African-owned company, we have already successfully developed one hotel in the Caribbean. And we're in the process of developing several more, uh, initially in Grenada, but also looking wider afield in the Caribbean. So um, what we've done is created a truly five-star luxury hotel that will be recognized anywhere in the world as you know, one of the best at what it does. And now we're sort of having for the African investment here to develop that. We're now exporting from the Caribbean what we've created there by developing this Silver Sands brand in other countries. So we're building in Egypt, we're building in um, Cyprus, in Greece, in other African countries now. And we're you know, actually actively in the world looking for other destinations where we can take that to. So it's, it's an interesting mix of you know, the African investment coming, bringing the business knowledge to Grenada, which is a very small, sleepy, but beautiful country. Um, creating something special there and then re-exporting it back out, if you like, um, to other countries. Because uh, what came out quite strongly throughout the conversations this morning was the fact that tourism, the tourism sector was, was part of a shared future that definitely needed a lot of investments from both parts. And your company went in at a time whereby the conversation between strengthening or reuniting Africa and the Caribbean wasn't as loud as we have heard it today. So I'm interested in just some of the short, the thoughts that have been shared so far throughout, throughout the session around your space as well, tourism. There was a lot of stuff. There was, there was talk about the direct flights from the, yeah. the, the continent to, to the Caribbean. There was talks about all kinds of visa, visa waivers. And so I'm just interested, just given what is being said right now, yeah. what opportunity do you, do you see that presenting right now for companies like yourselves and others like you? Sure. So I've, I've been in the hotel business for about 40 years, in the hotel business in the Caribbean for 20 of those, uh, in the Bahamas initially and then later in Grenada. And so speaking just generally in hotel development in the Caribbean, I think everything that you need to have a very successful tourism product is here already. You know, the beaches, the beautiful water, the history, the culture, the food. There are so many things here already. But the one missing element always for developers here is the financing. There seems to be a particular challenge in this part of the world to find the financing. Our company has been very fortunate to have the Suarez family from Egypt come and provide that financing in this one case. But there are dozens of other cases around the Caribbean that haven't been quite so lucky. So there's this huge opportunity here. You know, lots of, lots of different countries, different islands, all looking to expand their hotel product, their tourism product. And the one missing element time and time again has been the financing. Airlift is, a, airlift is always a conversation, but I do believe that the, the, um, the investment brings development, the development brings the airlift. If, you know, if people want to fly, the airlines fly here. So right. it, um, people use that excuse, I think, too often. I think the, the, the airlift will come as, as the development comes. Uh, and then one of the other things we talked about earlier on was just also about the, um, the human resources, developing the people that are here. We have lots of very friendly, intelligent people in this part of the world who haven't yet had the chance to develop. And I think what's being done here in Barbados, what's being done in other islands to really develop the homegrown talent so that they will stay in their countries of origin um, right. is very important. And I want to touch on the human resources element in just a bit with you, Chica, but circling back to the comment around financing, I mean, the uh, panel before the one that just took place had, had a whole lot of bankers on. Yeah. And I recall a comment that was made by one of the, uh, the CEOs of the bank saying that, I mean, interest rates in your part of the world are pretty low and offering soft loans or cheap loans to come do business. So, 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 so what about the access to finance? has been difficult. I think, yeah, talk, talk to the people that are here today and listening to them was very encouraging. But I think what we really needed was the people from their credit committees to be here, because that's where you seem to hit the wall. The, you know, the, the CEOs of the banks, the, the, the creative people that you talk to are very supportive. But when it gets to, gets to the credit checking people, they want to see your history, your track record, your accounts, where you've been successful before. And that's where we seem to hit All a, right. hit a bank, you know. It's a chicken and egg thing. We, we need to be successful first before the banks want to lend. So, so remodeling how, how risk is assessed, I suppose, in, model, in the modern world and retailoring it uh, for, for our 
climates in our societies. Chika, uh, Mark mentioning the human resource aspect and you're in the business of developing a whole lot of young people for the world of work today and tomorrow as is the case because of the requirement of the the digital competency. Tell us a bit more about your business. Yeah, thanks. Um, so uh, Decagon, I started uh, four years ago um, after spending two decades building uh, the first decade, I was the founder of a tech company. I started, I was very young, 22 years old. Um, it was a company that first made mo internet available on mobile phones in Nigeria um, and also like pioneered like um, uh, monetization of music from ringtones and content and so on with telcos in Nigeria and really across Africa. Uh, so having done that as a young person, I spent another decade investing in other uh, startups helping other young people to build our companies. And we built the largest job board in Africa and sold it, uh, built the largest ca online cars marketplace and sold it. So I was involved in about 20 companies. Um, and about six years ago, just looking at the scale of impact, I realized that um, there was a problem of almost putting the cart before the horse by investing, going straight to invest in companies um, that's great and we're having success, but to build tech companies, you need tech talent. You really, and when, when I looked at the ecosystems that I was really modeling all my activities after, Silicon Valley, Tel Aviv, you saw that they were really built on a foundation of a surplus of tech talent. And when I looked at the companies I was investing, I found that some, I was investing in some companies that were taking like money that we invested or that we got American investors to provide and turning around and sending that money to software engineers in Eastern Europe or uh, Asia. So I thought, but there's like very high unemployment, sure. um, very extremely youthful population. Um, and so I, th I decided to like uh, spend, co commit the next decade of my life, that's the name Decagon, to help my original mission was to help Nigeria uh, become a top 10 software engineering uh, nation. Um, now I'm four years in and um, by, um, we've trained now this year, um, getting to about a thousand people, help them uh, launch careers as software engineers um, and then connecting them to opportunities for local companies, um, but also for international companies. And as I started to internationalize the business, set up in, in the US and um, having engineers in Nigeria work for Fortune 100 companies um, in America, I discovered that the, um, uh, the global black uh, population, the African diaspora generally is missing out on the future of value creation. Because tech is really future value creation. Um, if it's all the stock markets all over the world are now effectively dominated from a growth standpoint um, by tech, by software companies. Um, and so um, I thought, well, we'll expand our vision and really see, like, address the underrepresentation of black people in tech globally. So that if we do it now and do it aggressively, um, uh, we can have a fair share of the future. Uh, one thing that is um, special about tech now is that it is, number one, important in of itself as a source of value creation, meaning that a brilliant young person who has spent five years building software, a brilliant young person in Nigeria who has spent five years building software for an American company will understand enough about that business that he and two or three of his friends with only five, ten thousand dollars of investment, can build a hundred million dollar company sure. without having to. So it's it's um, you know super empowering uh, in of itself, but it's also a facilitator of every other industry, whether that's finance, banking, uh, um, uh, tourism, uh, leisure. Like every industry um, is really uh, enabled by having high quality tech talent. And so um, this is what we hope to be able to do by making sure we have the talent. So what's quite interesting is that if you look at uh, where the money has been flowing when you talk about in building tech talent. So if you look at where the money has actually flowed in the uh, first 
three months of 2022. What was interesting was the fact that uh, for some reason there's a change in the, in the global mindset about where the opportunity is at. And there was so much uh, money flowing towards funding African tech startups. Still a drop in the ocean in terms of the bigger pot that usually does go in that direction. But the trend was that money flowing towards African startups was on the rise, money towards startups in other regions. The US, strangely enough, uh, even Latin America was on the decline. And so just in keeping to the tune of the trends and where the money's going, where there's not, and keeping to the subject around building human capacity and skills in this critical area. What opportunities then do you see for some of the software engineers that you're training to come to the Caribbean? No, for sure. Well, that's, that's why I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here because I think, um, uh, you know, the power, like software engineering is not just about being good technically. Um, it's really about having a, um, uh, you know, software is to solve problems. To solve problems, you have to have a, like a service mindset. The Caribbeans, coming from a sort of like tourism being the dominant in the, or a big industry, have a very, very service-oriented mindset already. So if, you, if you add to a culture of service, um, so if you add now on the digital capability, I think that um, you know, the, 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 the DNA of a young Caribbean person, if then like, equipped with technical skills, is precisely the type of um, worker, software engineer, or, or tech talent that the whole world is looking for. So it's, a, it's really a unique opportunity. And I'll explain. You know, software engineering is in of itself a new field. If you think about all these sort of movies, when you see a software engineer, he's a nerd in the basement who's like, you know, awkward, right? And wears glasses. And wears glasses. So that's, that's, that's because that's how it, it started, right? <laughs> but now, um, the world needs, the, 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 the business world needs the software engineer to speak, to engage, to be the source of creativity. Because it's a software engineer that knows what's possible. But the people who went, who are already software engineers in, develop, in, the, in, the, in the West, are not that person, are the, the, the nerd, right? So it's an opportunity to um, really bring in a new type of, of tech talent, right. the kind of the world is looking for. And I think that Africa, with its creativity, the Caribbeans, with the combination of creativity and adding the culture of service, um, are uniquely positioned. And I think a big part of what we would like to do is to accelerate that by um, mixing by bringing people back and forth, having them work together, and then uniting. having this place be a hub for, for the rest of the world. Yeah, uniting, just speaking uniting. to one of the themes that are, that are the bedrock of this uh, uh, forum. So, so just, uh, Tamesha, uh, the, the Future Barbados, I think you, you've given us a bit of the skeleton of what it's about and everything. So where's the need to make some of those ideas turn into reality? Where's the, where's, is, is, it, is it from the government? Is that sufficient? Are you inviting also private sector players to come, to come through and help make that reality? Just give us a bit more detail there. And I'll, I'll go back to, to kind of our ethos around it and why it came about. There have been so many accelerators and incubators that focus on entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs, and the business, and the business, and never the people as much. So we, there, there is a need and an appetite to bridge it. It's not a private sector only initiative. Or you hear about these incubators and accelerators, and yes, you then get sent to the wolves. You shark tank it. The private sector will pick you if you're very good after. What we've decided is that this is not a private sector issue. This is all of it. It's a collective issue, first of all. And that the problem is being solved within the Future Barbados Initiative, and that young people are trying to solve in general, 
are a public service. So our government has decided to not just invest in the idea generation, but let's try and implement the ideas. And what that means is let's fail every day to see where it lands eventually. So working with people like Decagon, which want to build that skill set of people. So we're working on the technical skills. We're also working on the design thinking and the mindset and innovation. We're also working on the entrepreneurs. So regardless of the area you're in, whether it, you are an underwater deep sea diver or whether you're a hotelier and an architect, you have, you have, you can work in any in any factor. You can work within the private sector, within the public sector. But as you see moving forward, uh, this is all of our business: the future and developing sustainable solutions. It's not just a private sector thing alone. It's not just a public sector thing alone. It needs to be that cooperation across the board. Mm -hmm. uh, so, 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 so sometimes we uh, speak quite uh, strongly about the digital offering and the digital skills to the neglect of softer skills. And I'm just wondering, Mark, uh, what you think about that and uh, where the need for a softer skills in your business, your kind of business is right now, is, 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 is it still there? And, and do you have a big enough pool in the Caribbean to plug that gap. It would be nice. To, it would be nice to have a lot more of that in the Caribbean. Uh, you know, unfortunately, we do still have to look outside for a lot of the software solutions that we use. We, we use software extensively in the industry. Um, you know, from the simple reservation systems to marketing to our clients, tracking people's trends, knowing what our clients do, where they go all the time. Uh, and communicating with them, with travel agents, with tour operators, etc. So there's constant need for data mining and different types of solutions to keep us up to speed with what's going on in the market. And I'm afraid for all of those solutions, we have to look outside of the region. We have to look north for all of those solutions at the moment. Yeah. Why? Why does he have to look north? Commission? Because the ecosystem is still young. Yeah. We, we have been trying, and there are small scale versions of everything, but the, for the scale and the level of, of sophistication that Mark would need to get ready to go, we haven't built, the, we're still scrambling to build that infrastructure. So with, with, with Chica and Decacon's help, we want to fast track that. We want to do, the, we, in three months, train them, get them jobs, building the solutions right away, so that in six months, Mark is going to be like, hey, we need this solution. Can one of your people build it? Can they build it for us? Because you can now have a bespoke Caribbean-made solution by some of our best tech talent built for exactly what you need versus plugging and playing one thing from this country, one thing from this country. So that's what we want to do. It is solutions by the people for our needs specifically because nobody knows the culture. It is our tech talent. It is our creative talent. It is our branding. It is our marketing that's already part of that ecosystem that's built. Chica, the in regulatory environment, the operational environment, just what's on the table right now, is it conducive for you to assist to make that fast tracking? Yeah, absolutely. I think, well, I mean, I'm, I mean, I'm new, um, but from what I can see um, in this country, there's like real seriousness, um, which is all we need. Um, serious entrepreneurs just, um, they don't want government to be in the way. Um, and if the government is the opposite of being in the way, is actually like facilitating, then um, then we go. All right, all right. So, 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 just want to get a sense in the room if there are any questions at the stage. Yes, no, no, no. So, so we're kind of standing, literally standing in the way of people and their <laughs> their rum punch right now. So, I'd like to bring this home. I'd like to bring this home. Um, one of the questions that. Uh, was outlined to ask. It's just about information and lesson and experiential sharing. Uh, and I don't know if you've got a thought on what you think the Caribbean can learn from Africa and what you think Africa can learn from the Caribbean, just based on your interactions in this space. Um. There, there's so many unicorns that have come out of the continent. Mm -hmm. and, and we can learn that speed and that hunger, literal, we need to get things done now. Uh, some of the, in the Caribbean, as we were talking about earlier, the pace is a little slower sometimes. But what we're learning too, it is, it is the political will and it is the people will combined that we need, to, we, need to, we need to do. And right now here in the region, we have a lot of political will, which sometimes is unheard of. And it's, match, it's matching those two right now, I think, it's, it's, it's the shared lesson. And it's trust. It is trust. The, we are trusting the young people to be involved 
in everyday processes. We are trusting young people to find the solutions and be engaged. We're trusting young people to see behind the curtain of how the government operates and to see our reality because every, as citizens we see it every day on the ground. But the processes, the bureaucratic processes that we're learning Let's figure out how to make them more efficient. Let's create the pathway. Chica is now coming here now. Mark has been here. That company has been here for a while now. Mark's lived here for 15 years. We know how slow these processes can be. But what we have now is the political will to make things faster. Yeah. Let's figure out how we can do it. And it, will, it, it won't be the perfect solution by tomorrow, but we have that drive to get it done now because we have no option. Yeah, yeah. Mark, your, your, your learnings. But also, as, as, as you... Um, answer that just dovetail for literally for a few of the entrepreneurs that are still left in this room or a few of the businesses the business owners on the continent that are still here in this room who want to know what they need to know before making a decision to come set up shop in the caribbean what w what would you say that is you know, I think there are, I can't speak for all the countries in the Caribbean, but for the ones that I know of, particularly Barbados, particularly Grenada, you know, they're very open to having new investment coming in, new ideas, new business coming in. Grenada, I can speak for sort of firsthand being my home. We have a, a new prime minister there in his early 40s, um, very proactive, very sort of aggressive out there looking to find foreign investment, bring things in to develop the country and develop the people there. Um, we have something called the GIDC, the um, Greater Investment Development Council. There's a, a body set up just to welcome new people into the country, to help them get established, introduce them around the community, um, facilitate that. So I think everything's there ready for... <laughs> this is rum punch going warm. <laughs> it's that rum punch. Rum punch he he warm, wants yeah. his rum punch. So a, yeah, I think you know, everything's there already, as I said before. It, it, Things are set up, things are ready. We're ready to welcome investors into the country. They'll find there's lots of incentives there for them, lots of reasons for them to be there um, in the country. And, and, and lots of the Caribbean countries, I'm not just speaking for one, but in lots of the Caribbean countries, they're, they're hungry for investment, hungry to meet new people and, and to get on with things, get right. developing. Right. Uh, Chika, I'll give you the last word, just in terms of knowledge sharing, experiential sharing, that you think the two regions can leverage off each other. Yeah, no, for sure. I think um, it's interesting what um, Mark said they are doing. They're an Egyptian group, African group, who ha are, have chosen the Caribbean to launch, to create a, a brand, um, and then they're going to take that to the world. So they're using the Caribbeans for what the Caribbeans are very strong for, and then they're going to export that. I think that's an opportunity. That's a way that we can think about um, exploring new opportunities. So if I think about, for example, relatedly, like the, the, the software for the um, hotel industry um, and the tourism industry, maybe what we should be doing is building a, um, a venture studio or an accelerator or something that focuses, that partners with Mark and partners with people um, in different parts of that industry and build up the solutions and pilot it with them. And even if, it even if it doesn't make any money from them, it doesn't matter because you're building it for the world, but then you'll have piloted it with, uh, with them. So I think um, uh, small countries or small regions uh, can, you know, by, f by force or whatever, by, to survive, get very good at particular things. And we can, um, in our collaboration, try to be very clear about what those things are and then design our uh, partnerships to leverage that. All right, I think collaboration was probably one of the most important things that you said there. It's a, it's a joint uh, effort. Ladies and gentlemen, please give me a, a warm welcome. Give the panel a warm welcome. And a warm round of applause, rather. Not the easiest shift to take on, the very last one. But thank you so much for bringing on all your energy. And thank you so much for bringing the insights and uh, dropping a whole lot of pearls of wisdom, uh, adding to the broader theme of this of this, con of this conference. And thanks to you for being the last troopers and the last soldiers to, to, to walk the mile with us today. Thanks. That brings us to the end of day one. <laughs> um, of the program. Look forward to seeing you tomorrow as we continue with day two. Thanks and have a great evening further. Goodbye. Thank you, Fifi, Peters, and panel. As you said, we've come to the end of day one. The shuttle buses are waiting outside. The names of the hotels are displayed on the buses. Go safely. See you tomorrow.